Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. The Black Museum. Affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. Inner Sanctum Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Here I have the privilege of bringing you some of the best dark, creepy, and macabre old-time radio shows ever created. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, sign up for my free newsletter, connect with me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, visit other podcasts that I produce. You can also visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. We're about to embark on a dark journey. A journey through the terrifying passages of a distorted mind. Man's mind is filled with dark passages that lead through a labyrinth of horror, from which at times there is no return. Come with me as we probe the darkness for ghostly images. Come to the house of Cain. Here we will search out the secret as kept the old house shrouded in a mantle of fear. Who is Cain, you ask? He appears to be an ordinary man like most of us. But here at the old house, isolated from the 20th century, a strange turbulence swirls around him. Cain! Cain! Where are you? Here, Agatha. I'm here. I told you to stay in the house. You're not needed here. Where have you been? In the south house. Horrible odor in the dungeon. One of the prisoners went mad, set fire to a cell. Ludwig and I dragged him out. We had to calm the others. We knew. You kill me. I don't want to know what you do with them. Please. I don't want to know what you do. mystery drama, Them, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ralph Goodman and stars Alan Hewitt and Jordan Charney. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule, and imported Vigna Rosé wine. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Here is an important message from Buick. Buick wants you to know that a cash rebate of $500 will be given to everyone who takes delivery of a new Buick Skyhawk by February 28, 1975. And a rebate of $200 will be given to everyone who takes delivery of a Buick Skylark or Apollo by February 28. Buick's cash rebate program is just one of many reasons for buying a free-spirited 1975 Buick Skyhawk, Skylark, or Apollo. So see your Buick dealer. Inflation. It hits us daily. And if you're in business, you face another kind of flation. Adflation. Spiraling ad costs just when the need to advertise is greater than ever. 
What can you do when print costs escalate? When producing a TV commercial cut sharply into your budget for time? You can do what you do every day. Turn to radio. Radio is effective, inexpensive. Call this station. We'll suggest ways radio can help you fight inflation. Furnished by Radio Advertising Bureau. Save a little and save a lot more at the Northwest Federal General Store. That's where you'll find a giant cracker barrel of gifts. Gifts for savers by famous makers we all know. The Sunbeam hand mixer, the Schick style dryer, a Presto pressure cooker and wearing blender. And they're all free or priced for special savings when you save $250 or more. See them all in our newspaper ads. And now you can save at three centers of interest in the great Northwest Territory, on Irving Park Road, on Dempster Street in Des Plaines, and now in Norwich in the Harlem Irving Plaza. So save where you get the highest interest rates allowed by law. And get free gifts, too, from the Cracker Barrel of Gifts, now at Northwest Federal Savings. But come in soon. Some styles and colors are limited. One gift per family, please. Offer good for a limited time only. Remember... It's Northwest Federal Savings Time, 63 hours a week. See the Chicago Sportsman's Vacation and Boat Show opening February 28th, Amphitheater. Our story begins in a small, crowded courtroom. The jury is filing in. They have reached a decision on the charge of manslaughter. The defendant, Charles Schiller, darts a quick, apprehensive look at his frail wife, Karen, who has stood steadfastly by him during his ordeal. He then stands to face the 12 men and women who have been chosen to decide his fate. The murder, if it is to be called that, was accidental. Charles Schiller testified to this. The evidence seemed conclusive. Let's move in a little closer. The foreman of the jury has just risen. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, have you reached a verdict? We have, sir. How say you? Do you find the defendant guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. (laughs) Come, Agatha. Once again, a mockery has been made of justice. Let's get out of here. Yes, King. As with the others, I find this man guilty. But if a jury found him innocent... I am not influenced by emotion, as are these incompetents chosen to serve on juries. Remember, Agatha, I have been both lawyer and judge. Who is better qualified to decide a man's guilt or innocence? Come. We must inform Ludwig. That man must pay for his crime, as did the others. But, Kay, I said, come, Agatha. We have listened to every bit of evidence presented in this trial. A murder has been committed. I have found the defendant guilty on all counts. It is up to us to see to it that justice will be served. Two, this is last call. Breakfast is served. We're coming, Mom. Dad's giving me a piggy right on the track. <laughs> oh, more like a ride around the throat. <laughs> Easy, Jimmy, you're strangling. Oh, let's be careful with Daddy now that he's back from that awful courtroom. Home with us again. Well, now you two sit down. We've got toast and boiled eggs and... Boiled eggs? Mm-hmm. Ah, oh. I'll just take a piece of toast. In any ways, I'm not hungry, okay? (laughs) All right, then take a piece of toast. (gasps) Maybe you'd better take two. Okay, Dad. I gotta run anyway. I'm supposed to meet the guys at the schoolyard. Toast is perfect for (laughs) eating and running. (laughs) Oh, it's so good to have you home. And to have that nightmare behind us. Oh, let's not think about that. Or talk about it again. All I'm interested in now is... Is having that phone taken out so I can spend a quiet Saturday with my wife. Hello? No, 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 you didn't. Yes, yes, I'd like very much to be included. 12.15? Fine. Uh, where is it to be held? Oh, no, 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 that, that's not necessary. I have my own car. I can just... Well, all right, if you want to. I'll be ready at noon, Yes. Goodbye. Who is that? Well, I don't know, really. I neglected to ask. A friend of Warren's. Another lawyer. Some of his associates are giving Warren a surprise luncheon today to celebrate his winning my case. 
I wish I had thought of it. Well, you did call him to thank him, dear, twice last night. Oh, I know, I know, but a luncheon. What a wonderful idea. Mm, and they've asked you to come. It's almost the same as if you'd thought of it. Well, not quite. But I'm glad someone did. It must be a really fancy party. They're sending a limousine for me. Oh, how posh. <laughs> uh, look, I, I know we we planned the day together, darling, but well, after all the work Warren did for me, I'd like very much to go. Darling, of course you have to go. Where's it to be? Well, the man didn't say. Well, actually, it doesn't matter. They're sending the car. <laughs> I'll let the driver worry. I'd better shave. I thought you just did. True. But I've never been picked up by a limousine before. Oh, John. Oh, it's good to have you home again. Agatha, almost 12. Yes, Payne. Oh, please stop pacing. They'll be here. Ludwig has always brought them. He has never failed you. The uh, transcripts, the murder trials we've judged thus far, where are the transcripts? Here, Kane, on the desk. There is no need to show the poor man the transcript. Ludwig will bring him in if he has the other. I know you have told me over and over what we do is right. Ah, but in my heart... Sentimental claptrap. That's what got him off of the trial. One does not judge a case with a heart, but with a mind. Here, look at these transcripts. I've gone over them word by word, and in each case the jury has been wrong, I have been right. The limousine. You are right in one thing, Agatha. Ludwig does what he has to do and does it well. Yes, yes, he's brought us our honored guest. Let them in. I will join you presently. I have work. Yes, Kane. One moment, Ludwig. I am coming. young man. I am sorry to have kept you waiting. Uh, take your hat, Ludwig. And if you will please follow me, sir, to the study. I appreciate your hospitality. My name is Charles, Charles Schiller. Yes. Yes, I know. Now, if you will come this way. The halls are rather dark and dreary. What is this place? I mean, your chauffeur was not very talkative. I still don't know the gentleman's name who sent the car for me. Oh, it's Mr. Kane. This is his estate. Kane. Kane, I see. Is he a lawyer? He is a judge. Oh, Mr. Schiller. I see you've arrived safely. Allow me to welcome you. I'm Matthew Kane. So how do you do? I must admit, when a luncheon was mentioned, uh, well, I was expecting... To be taken to a small restaurant or a banquet room? Oh, no, no, no. This is too important a moment to be held in mundane surroundings. Uh, you met my sister, Miss Agatha Kane? Well, no, no, not, not formally. How do you do, ma'am? If uh, you'll both excuse me... As I've me, told I... you, Agatha, this is Mr. Schiller. He's come to visit with us and have a bite of lunch. Would you do the honors, my dear? Ludwig will help. But give Mr. Schiller and me a chance to get acquainted first. Yes, Kane. I will go and find Ludwig. Ah, oh, unfortunately, she's a little addled, I'm afraid. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, no, since you're the first to arrive, may I suggest a little brandy to warm you from the dampness of the weather? Oh, yes, 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 that'll be fine. I took the liberty of pouring as you arrived. Your drink is here. On the side table. Oh, I see you're admiring that magnificent old portrait over the mantel. My grandfather, sir. A man who gloried in our judicial system. Spent his life exacting justice. A godly man who believed in the holy words, an eye for an eye. He has a magnificent face. Yes. He's been dead for over 50 years now. But his presence is still felt in this house. Well, here's to you, sir. Thank you. Ah, sit down, Mr. Schiller. The others will be here shortly. Sit down and tell me about your day in court. You had an able lawyer. Oh, one of the best. I can't speak highly enough of Warren Douglas. Clever. Yes, very clever. But then... Criminal lawyers must be exceptionally clever. 
most of the time they're paid to defend the guilty. <laughs> but I, I meant no inference in your case. It's just a generalization. That's all right. I'm not sensitive. I was exonerated. Yes, yes, I heard. It was a murder case, was it not? Accidental manslaughter. Oh, oh yes, yes, yes. Forgive me. I, I'm sorry to say I don't follow all the cases I should. Uh, this was something about a fight in a bar room, wasn't it? Mm, the Carlton Lounge. Now, I was waiting for my wife. We were to have lunch that afternoon. And there was this man, a complete stranger. He was annoying a woman at the bar I intervened. One word led to another... I hardly remember the struggle that followed, but somehow he fell over backwards against a glass door and shattered it. One of the glass livers pierced his throat. And he died almost instantly. Oh, how dreadful. Yes. Yes, it, it was. One minute, sitting quietly, worrying about how much my wife spent on a shopping spree, and, well, the next... We are at the mercy of circumstances, are we not, Mr. Schiller? Oh, let me fill your glass again. I was just wondering about the others. I mean, it's getting rather late. The judicial system and its failings have become quite a passion with me. Several years ago, my sister and I had occasion to attend a criminal court's trial. I'll never forget the sight of the man's face as he stood to receive the jury's verdict. He stood there, quivering with fear, awaiting the foreman's voice to pronounce him guilty. And suddenly... Well, I suppose the strain was too much for him. The poor fellow pitched forward on his face, fell dead where he stood. Dead? Good Lord. Yes. Imagine that. And what do you suppose the jury's verdict was? Not guilty. The man lying dead at their feet there. Yeah. Well, retributive justice has a strange way of finding its mark sometimes. Well, I'd hardly call it justice if they found the man innocent, as you said. I found him guilty. Well, he was dead at any rate. You found him guilty? Yes, Mr. Schiller. We all judge our fellow man. You pick up a newspaper, read of a trial, decide a man's guilt or innocence over your morning coffee or toast. Don't deny it. Yeah, well, well, to some extent, I suppose we do. To some extent? Did you hear that, Agatha? Well, now, there is some reasonableness to you, certainly, if you can admit that. Now, then, let me ask you this, Mr. Schiller. Do you think, with all the legions of lawyers, clever lawyers with silver tongues, that certain inequities of justice are sometimes meted out by juries? Do some innocent men hang? Unquestionably, sir. Then you would also admit that some of the guilty go free. Is that not so, Mr. Schiller? Oh. Oh, uh, uh, I, I don't, I don't, I don't feel well. My, 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 my head. I, I was hoping the others would be here by now. Do you think we should give Mr. Douglas a call? Perhaps there's been a misunderstanding. There's been no misunderstanding, Mr. Schiller. Mr. Douglas was never notified. There's no one else coming. And the misunderstanding was mine. I, I I thought you said there was to be a surprise luncheon for Mr. Douglas to celebrate. Uh, did, did you put something in my drink? Yes, Mr. Schiller. Why? I, I, I don't understand. Why did you do it? Oh, Mr. Kane, please, please, I... Sleep well, Mr. Schiller. Ludwig and I will attend to everything. Ludwig! Ludwig! Come! We have work to do! Ken! Ken! Here, Agatha. I'm here. Mr. Schiller. Where is Mr. Schiller? Justice has been served. It is finished. Oh, Ken. Ken. Your coat. Your new coat. What have you stained it with? I think it's blood. I was attempting... Don't tell me. I don't want to know what you do with them. Please, Kane. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. Well, there is no 
doubt that justice in the minds of men can take many forms. Who is to say what is true justice? The charge against the defendant was manslaughter. Well, I guess each man has his own rationalization for justice as he sees it. But just as no man may place himself above the law, so no man may appoint himself the oracle of judgment and truth. It seems, however, that Matthew Kane has done so. I'll return shortly with Act Two. This mystery is really thrilling me. The suspense is really killing me. Just sitting here by the radio with Vina Reservoir. Vina Reservoir? Say this Vina Reservoir. Delicious. It goes for so many years. Or all alone by the radio. Vigna Rose wine, Vigna Rose wine. Come, let me pour you some more Vigna. At the price it's a value. If you know what I mean. Now let's go back to our mystery show. But I have one question before I go. What's light and refreshing imported to? Vigna Rose wine. For over 18 years, Arco American has been telling it like it is. More often as not, you may have paid far too much for quality automobile insurance. A recent survey published in the Chicago Tribune dramatically substantiates this claim by Arco American. The article states that you could save up to 75% in auto insurance premiums if you shopped for it. Arco American has the time and knowledge to do that, and they're good at it. They're professionals with expertise to offer fantastic savings to the qualified buyer. Call ES 94677 for your phone quotation. There's no obligation. And the savings could amount to hundreds of dollars for you. Remember the number, ES94677. At Arco American, all insurance plans are available with a low down payment and easy monthly installments. Arco, that's double A-R-C-O American, is open weekdays till 8 p.m. Let Arco American save you money on your insurance needs. Call ES94677. Before we rejoin the CBS Radio Mystery Theater, this traffic bulletin just into our newsroom. The bridge over the Chicago River on Ohio Street which is the feeder to and from the Kennedy Expressway, is stuck in the up position, a most embarrassing situation for the city workers who are trying to get it down. So please avoid the entrance and exit to the Kennedy on Ohio Street. The bridge is stuck in the up position. Forty-eight hours have passed since the disappearance of Charles Schiller. His wife, Karen, has been summoned to headquarters to discuss the incident with the police. The request is rather unusual, considering that over 3,000 cases of missing persons are reported in an average-sized metropolitan city each month. Police files bulge with triplicates of these reports. But the case of Charles Schiller has caught the eye of Detective Sergeant Steiner. Something about this case has activated the trail dog instinct. Steiner is sure he is on to something. I appreciate your checking into this, Sergeant. Of course I don't want to raise your hopes too high, Mrs. Schiller. I I mean, around here, lots of times one and one comes out three. Yes, I understand, Sergeant. How can I help? Well, as I understand it, according to our records, Mr. Schiller's lawyer was never informed of any testimonial luncheon in his honor or... Any meeting that day of yes, any I, kind? I spoke to one, Mr. Douglas, and, and well, he knew nothing about it, but I'm sure he told you that, too. Yes, uh, yes, he did. I have his statement right here. I'm sorry to put you through all this again, Mrs. Schiller, but you see, after your husband's disappearance, the facts related to it were run to our computer. Our statistical department on a hunch of mine came through with something rather interesting. Something I'd like to pursue with you, if I may. Certainly. What is it? Well, Mr. Schiller, it, it seems that the circumstances that surround your husband's disappearance have been repeated three other times, all within the last seven months. I'm afraid I don't, I don't follow What I'm trying to say is, three men, three other men have vanished over the past seven months. And the one thing these three men had in common 
was they disappeared immediately after having stood trial for murder. Well, what does that have to do oh, wait with... Wait a minute. Now, just a moment. More of a coincidence yet. Each of these men was found not guilty at his trial. Look here. David Swan, charge of first-degree murder seven months ago, October, not guilty. Man named Bates, manslaughter, not guilty. Collins, manslaughter, not guilty. You see the pattern? Mm. Trial, exoneration, disappearance. Unusual, isn't it? And you think that my husband's disappearance has, has something to do with these other men? For now, let's just say he fits the pattern. You know, I've looked all through his file, this file here, dozens of times. Now, there's just one little piece missing. Did someone, anyone, see the man who picked your husband up that day on the limousine? No. I told the man who took the report. I was out shopping. Oh, yes, yes, here it is. And Jimmy was out. Jimmy? Well, it's my son. He's eight. Oh. He was at the schoolyard playing with his friends. Didn't I mention that? No. No, there's uh, no mention here of your son. Oh? Hmm. This uh, boy of yours, Jimmy, uh, could he have come home while you were out? I suppose I... I never thought to ask. Uh, we have a treehouse in the backyard. He and his friends often play there. This uh, treehouse? Does it face the street? You mean the front driveway? Yes, but... Mrs. Schiller, where is your son now? He's in school. He'll be home at three. Uh. Do you think there's something that Jimmy might know that... Possible. Possible, Mrs. Schiller. You know, all we need is one lead. Mr. Schiller. Wake up, Mr. Schiller. It's time to rise and shine. Uh, what? Kane? Exactly, Mr. Schiller. Kane. Matthew Kane. Where am I? What is this place? Your room is high above the ground on the far side of the estate. Room? This isn't a room. It's a cage. So it is, Mr. Schiller. What is this? Barred window, steel door? It's like a prison cell. It is a prison cell, Mr. Schiller. But why? Why am I here? To serve your sentence. I've judged your case and found you guilty. No. Well, it's all very well and good to say no. But here you are, aren't you? Here they all are. And here they'll stay until their brains rot and their bodies decay. They? You mean there are others? Yes, Mr. Schiller. There are others. Others who have broken God's law and must pay for it. Here, Mr. Schiller, here are your rations for the day. You can't keep me here, Kane. My wife will go to the police. She's probably notified them already. Oh, I'm sure she has. I'm sure the others have wives and loved ones who have reported these unfortunate incidents to the police. You have disappeared, sir. Vanished into thin air. It's as simple as that. Not in this day and age. They'll find me. They have ways. Give it a year. Collins thought that way once. So did Swan. And the others. Give it time. We'll see. And now, if you'll excuse me, I must take these trays down the corridor. It's getting rather late. I'm due in court in an hour. There's an interesting case I must keep up with. When one is given the responsibility to judge his fellow man, one must be thorough. In order to be fair. Kane! Come back! Kane! Someone, someone will come. They'll find me. They'll find me. Well, I'm glad you could bring Jimmy to see me, Mrs. Schiller. Well, when he said that he was in the treehouse and saw his daddy leave in a big black car... It could be the lead we've been looking for. Now, are you uh, comfortable in that chair, Jimmy? Yes, sir. Ah, good. Now, you keep looking through this picture book. I don't understand how a children's book of cartoons are... Pipes, Mrs. Schiller. Tall, oh. thin, wiry, heavy, muscular. And the clothes they wear, all geared to pinpoint a suspect. Now, 
Jimmy, do you see anyone in there who looks like the man you saw from the treehouse? Um, not exactly, but he looks something like this one. Huh? Only he's wearing kind of a uniform, like a soldier. Tall, thin, in uniform. Now, let's see. Hmm. Uniforms, uniforms. Ah, here we are. Now, Jimmy, was he a soldier like this one? Uh, no. Or, uh, wait a minute. Uh, how about this one? That's it. That's it. And he had a hat on. Like this one, right? Yeah, that's the one. But it, it wasn't black. It was gray, like Bobby's cat. Now, anything else you noticed about him, Jimmy? No, sir. Mr. Schiller, we've got ourselves a suspect. Does that mean you can find my daddy? It means we have a better chance. At least we know one of the men we're looking for is a chauffeur. And we have some idea of what he looks like. Now, excuse me, Mrs. Schiller. Rodriguez, I want a composite made up of uh, the Schiller case. Get the artist in here. Oh, and I'll need two men from Homicide. We're going to stake out that courthouse. I want a careful surveillance on limousines that pull up. I'll be going along. I'm bringing Schiller's wife and boy with me. Oh, you uh, will allow Jimmy to come along, won't you? We'll see that he's kept out of danger. Of course, Lieutenant. Oh, I don't mind danger. If I can help find my daddy. Oh, Jimmy. Oh, good morning, Agatha. Good morning. There was hammering and pounding near my room this morning, Kane. Yes, we're building a new cell. A new cell? There's another court case today. Murder one. I don't want to hear about it. You can't shut out the world, Agatha. And please get that dog of yours off the chair. I've told him over and over. I'll get him, Kane. You hurt him when you pick him up. He's so tiny. I hate small things. Small minds, small people. Take him out. And come right back. We'll be leaving for the courthouse as soon as Ludwig brings the limousine out front. Oh, I can't go today. There's a flower show at the Civic Auditorium. Mrs. Eustace is picking me up this afternoon. You've asked her to come here? Oh, I, I won't invite her in. I'll be ready when she arrives. Oh, Kane, when is all this going to stop? You loved Grandfather Agatha. You know what he stood for. You know how I've worked and planned and dedicated my life. We won't stop. We'll never stop as long as there's breath left in me. <sighs> Why do you do this to me? I don't like losing my temper. You know I don't. Ah, Ludwig's ready. Since you are going to be home, feed the prisoners. Prisoners? Oh, I, I, I don't know where they are. You know where they are, Agatha. I've seen you sneaking around. Watching Ludwig and me go up the narrow stone steps of a gatehouse. But the keys, I, I don't know where you keep... You don't need keys. You'll find the trays in the kitchen. Fill them. Slide one under each cell. I'll expect it to be done when I return. <laughs> yes, Kane. Well, I must hurry off to the courthouse. When a man's life is at stake, one must be fair. <laughs> That's the courthouse, Jimmy. Over there, across the street. Oh, here's a big place. And there's so many people. We're just looking for one, Jimmy, the chauffeur, the man who took your daddy away. You think you can recognize him from here? Well, try, Mom. Good, Jimmy. Now, we'll just sit here in the car and wait. This is a special murder trial. I think our suspect will be here. Now, you understand, Mrs. Schiller, I'm... I'm not making any predictions. We understand, Sergeant. The way things have been going, this may be our only chance. Mr. Schiller? Mr. Schiller? Uh, yes? Yeah? Yeah, who, who is that? I brought you some food, Mr. Schiller. Miss Agatha, what, mm. are, what are you doing Kane here? He left the house. He asked me to feed the uh, prisoners. I'll just slip your tray under the cell door. There. Can you reach it? Yes, but... Good. Then I'll just move on and... No, 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 wait. Wait, I must talk. No, I can't. I have the others to feed. I left my little dog downstairs. I told him, stay. But he never listened. 
Oh, <laughs> there he comes. Oh, he's so naughty. Chin, chin, I told you not to follow me up here. He would be so angry if he knew. Oh, dear. He's crawled under your cell door, Mr. Schiller. He's going after your food. Oh, do grab him quickly, Mr. Schiller. Please. <laughs> Ah, that's it. Ah, thank you. I'll take him now. Oh, no. Oh, no, you can't do that, Miss Sackett. Huh? What? Now, we're both prisoners here. Your dog and I. Both prisoners? Until you get the keys. Oh, Mr. Schiller, there's no need to do that. You see, you can just pass Chin Chin through the bars. He's all stuff. He'll pass through easily. <laughs> Oh, Mrs. Schiller, you're hurting him. May I have my little dog, please? Yes, yes, Miss Agatha. Ah, thank you. As soon as you get the keys. Well, I can't do that. You're Kane's prisoner. And your dog is my prisoner. Oh, please, give me my dog. He never did anything to you. Well, that's unfortunate. But look around you. Look what your brother did to me and the others. Locked us in these spanking cells to satisfy his insanity. Mr. Schiller, you must understand. My brother is not insane. The reason he does what he does and There's no is... time for that. No, either you get those keys, or I'll snap the <gasps> little dog's neck. No, no, you, you wouldn't do that. I swear to you, no. I'll no. kill him this no, instant Mr. unless you do as I, I say. I don't know anything about the keys. Find oh, please, Mr. Schiller. Give me my sword. The keys, Miss Agatha. I'm running out of patience. Get the keys. Yes, the mind of man is a fragile thing. There is little doubt that Charles Schiller has reached the breaking point. It has been said that desperate men are capable of desperate deeds. Will the frightened Miss Agatha find the courage to release her brother's prisoner in exchange for the life of her dog? I'll return shortly with Act Three. That's the question when you catch the common cold. Then, take 12-hour contact. You need six cold tablets, two every four hours, or three cold pills, one every four hours, or just one contact capsule. For up to 12 hours, continuous relief from sneezing, congestion, drips. The tiny time pills do it. For aches and fever, the others contain aspirin. Contact doesn't. Your cold, your choice. Six or three or one. Give your cold. To contact the number one cold medicine in the whole world. Six or three or one. Take contact only as directed. Friends, when you have a Culligan water conditioner, you've got more than a quality product. More? You've got local Culligan loving care and reliable service. Oh, yes, the Culligan man. Your Culligan man is a full-time, factory-authorized water specialist, and his satisfied customers are his greatest asset. That's why we invite you to ask your neighbors about Culligan. Tell him to ask me. Your Culligan man does business like business used to be done. He's old-fashioned? No, he's not old-fashioned. He's just, uh, uh... He's Mr. Reliable. Yes, he is reliable. And to prove it, all you have to do is call him. All right. Hey, Culligan man! Right. And if they still aren't convinced, they should call his mother. Well, why in the world would they want to call his mother? To get another unbiased opinion. You don't have to buy a Culligan water softener to enjoy all of its many benefits. Now you can rent a Culligan for as little as $5.50 a month. For complete information, pick up the phone and say... Hey, Culligan man! This is WBBM Chicago, News Radio 78. The time is 11.10 again. The bridge over the Chicago River on Ohio Street stuck in the opposition. That's the feeder to and from the Kennedy avoided, if at all possible. An hour has gone by since the arrival of the police stakeout at the courthouse entrance. Sergeant Steiner has been in constant touch with the unmarked cars he has strategically placed around the building. Sitting with him are Karen and Jimmy, 
who has been keeping a close watch on various limousines that have come and gone. So far, nothing. Steiner's face is grim. He has little hope to hold out to the anxious wife and child, whose world has been darkened by the strange disappearance of Charles Schiller. I've just checked with units two and four. They've got the rear entrance under surveillance. No sign of a limousine or chauffeur back there. Well, we're doing what we can, but... I understand, Sergeant. Our real hope is Jimmy here. He saw the man before. He's the only one who can make a positive identification. Well... Anything new, Jimmy? He did see someone a little while ago that he thought could be the man. One of one of the chauffeurs waiting there across the street. Yeah, you were busy talking on the radio. Well, you should have cut in. Where? Which one? Well, he's gone now. No, wait. Huh? There he is over there at that big black car. A limousine? Yeah, he's helping that big fat man get into the back seat. Are you sure that's the man you saw from the treehouse? Well, I wasn't before, but but I am now. You see how he bends over kind of stiff when he opens the door? Uh-huh. Well, that's how the man bent over when he helped Dad into the car at our house. Well, that's good enough for me. The car's starting up. They're going to leave. Let's hurry up and capture him. No, no, Jimmy. We're not going to capture him. Why not? We're going to follow him. He's the only link we have to your dad. Control one. To all stakeout units. Limousine. License number GNC. 918. Pulling away from curb in front of courthouse. Suspected wheel. Heading east on third. Caleb. He's turning, sir. Heading for your grid, unit four. Pick up as he passes. Units two and five. Follow on parallel course. Move it. Ten four. <laughs> Miss Agatha? Miss Agatha! Uh, I'm here, Mr. Schiller. I'm looking for the key. Uh, well, keep looking. <laughs> Oh, you, you, you shut up. I'm not going to hurt you. I just want to get out of this madhouse. <laughs> Miss Agatha! Oh, wait, wait. Here I are. I found them. See, I found the keys. They were back there in this small storage room. You can have them, all of them. Oh, just give me my dog. No, oh, no, not so fast. Try them in the lock first. Uh, all right, all right. Please, be careful. Chin Chin is so delicate. The lock, Miss Agatha. I'm trying, Mr. Schiller. But there are so many. They're all rusty. And most of them are too big. Oh, God. Try try that one. I... There's no rust on it at all. Oh, it's... Oh, it's this. Hurry. Oh. Now, you're sure it's right for me to do this? My brother will be back any minute. Damn and... your brother. Do you want your dog handed to you in one piece or don't you? Oh, oh, oh yes, yes. No, please. Don't hurt him. I, I'll be just as you say. There. You're free, Mr. Schiller. Thank the Lord. Now, release my dog. Here, take him. Careful. Don't drop him, Mr. Schiller. Oh, now look what you've done. He's getting away. Chin Chin, you come back here this instant. This very oh, instant. Forget about him. I've got to get out of here. Which way do I go? Oh, here, Chin Chin. Good little Chin Chin. Miss Agatha, wait. I can't. I'd better find poor Chin Chin right away. Oh, it's so easy to get lost in this endless maze of horror. Oh, damn you, Miss Agatha. Come back. Come back. <laughs> I don't think we lost them. No, Mrs. Schiller, they're up ahead. Unit 4 is keeping them in sight. Uh, control to Unit 4. Control to Unit 4. I've got him. Suspect turning off onto the old Belmont Road, heading for private driveway. All units, all units, converge on driveway. Do not use sirens. We'll wait for you there. 10 4. Why are we stopping? I don't want to get too close. For the love them. They just turned into the driveway. Can't we follow them? I'm afraid not, Jimmy. The driveway on that old estate back there is private property. Private property? But my husband may be there. We can't go any farther without a warrant. What's that? Permission, Jimmy, oh. to search the place. The other car should be along any minute. You flag them down, son. I'll take care of the red tape. Control one to central. Control one to central. Request the search warrant. Private residence. 
1143 Belmont Road. Residence name unknown. Try through vehicle registration. License number GMC 918. Repeat. GMC 918. Agatha, will you please stop blubbering like a child and tell me what's happened? Well, it was just a few minutes ago, Kate. I'm sure you and Ludwig can find him and bring him back. Find who? Bring who back? Mr. Schiller. Schiller? <laughs> well, he, he forced me to let him out of his cell. He what? Well, you see, he had chin chin. He said he would break the poor little dog's neck if I didn't get the key. You so, gave him the key? Well, I, I opened his door... Then left them in the lock. I had to go at the chin. Ludwig, and... quickly. The cells. I'll get the rifle. You. Oh, I have you. Oh, sorry, Kane. I know I shouldn't have. The cells, I got them. Where does Ludwig keep the shotgun shells? Uh, no, no, Kane. Put away the gun. Disobedience must be met with force. Justice, I got her. Justice. Justice? I have seen your prison cells, Kane. Those poor, unfortunate men living like caged animals. You call that just... Oh, get out of my way. Those men must not escape. Too late, Kane. Shilla, I've already released them. Do you realize what you've done? Those men are half crazed. I suggest we all stay here. It's a lot safer than out there. I warned you, brother. Stop before it is too late. I must stop them. I must. Oh! All right, everybody. Bill, oh, prisoners are here. Are. Run, Miss Anna. Run. Stop. Oh, all of you. Stop breaking the law. I'll not stand for a breach of justice. Those noises we heard, Sergeant, I'm sure they're coming from the house. Sounds like a Mrs. Schmidt. Shut that blast. There's trouble up ahead. It sounds like it's moving this way. No need to wait for that warning now. All right, move up, men. That gunfire is coming from the left. Rodriguez, Gordon, cover me. I'm going in. Mr. Schiller, you'd better wait back here with Jimmy. And keep down out of range. We will, Sergeant. This way. Uh, uh, Keep running. Uh, I can see the road uh, from here. I'm trying, Mr. Schiller. I don't know what got into my brother. He's never been a violent man. Oh, he's still out there uh, somewhere. Firing uh, wildly at anything. Uh, Who? Oh, those men. Do, do you think he, he killed them? There's no time uh, to think about anything uh, now. Just, just keep running. I, I can't. I I just can't go on any farther. It's all right, Miss Hatton. Uh, look. Uh, look up ahead. Uh, Uniformed men. Uh, it's the police. Uh, Hold your fire, man. There's someone up ahead. It looks like... Yeah, it is. It's Charles Schiller. Oh, thank God you found We couldn't have gone much further. You are Charles Schiller? Oh, yes, yes, yes. And this is Miss Agatha Kane. Yes. Her brother Matthew is back there, armed with a shotgun. You know, you better come with me. You'll both be safer back there on the road. Get away from that man. Kane! He's an escaped prisoner. I'll shoot the first man who touches him. Careful. He's deranged. He's been holding chained men captive at the house. Put down that shotgun, Mr. Kane. I am in charge here. Tell your men to back off. I'm warning you, sir, for the last time. Shut up. Hands on your head. We're returning to the south. It's no use, Kane. It's all over. If you pull that trigger, you'll be murdering an innocent man. I was innocent, Kane. They were all innocent. That's a lie. I judged you all fairly. I see now I was too lenient with my sentence. Now that you dare defy me, I change my verdict. Your sentence is no longer life. It's death. Shut up, look out! Kane. Oh! Kane. Oh! 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 My, my poor brother. Oh! You shot him. Oh! Sorry, ma'am. I, I had no choice. Oh! Uh, uh... Oh! Yes, Kane. I'm here. I, I was only trying. I know, Kane. I tried to warn you to stop before it was too late. Oh, you're too easy on them. Okay. Too quick to forgive. The people, the jurors, they're all like you. <coughs> Someone has to 
uphold the rightness of things. He's... He's gone. Cain. Oh, Cain. He put me through hell, Sergeant. (laughs) But you know something? I can't help feeling what he did was partly our fault. Our fault? Yes. Crazy as it may sound, there is some logic to his madness. Well, Matthew Kane is no longer with us. I, for one, am saddened by his untimely death. I was beginning to like him. I always did admire a man who is dedicated to his work. And talking about a man who is dedicated to his work, listen. You're driving a car you knew you were going to buy the minute you saw it. Skyhawk. Buick Skyhawk. You just knew a car this streamlined would be easy on gas, and you were right. In published EPA mileage test results, Skyhawk got 25 miles per gallon on the open road and 16 in the city. Skyhawk. It's rakish, it's low slung, it looks European, but it's a Buick. Living free. Last year, this kid came close to being just a name on a tombstone. What saved him was Ellen Costigan. She knew what to do because we taught her life-saving. That's the whole business of the American Red Cross. Sometimes we do big life-saving jobs like sheltering half a million people. Sometimes they're little, like helping an old lady get to the supermarket. Life, it's worth saving. What a shot! Give us a hand. We didn't frighten you with our story tonight. It's true, Matthew Kane was a psychopath. And he did have quite a successful prison franchise operating on his dark and dismal estate. But fortunately, Sergeant Steiner arrived on the scene in time to stop him from opening branch offices all over the country. So, dear listeners, you all will be safe in your beds until I return. Our cast included Alan Hewitt, Jordan Sharney, Augusta Dabney, Evie Juster, and Jim Dukas. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Never we have to forget the summit and start back down, huh? No, let's give it a try, Harry. Go and take a look at the travers. Oh, okay. Watch yourself. Jimmy! You hang on to my rope. All right. I'll call out again when I return. Hey, that wind's really rising. You okay, Jack? Fine, Ben. How about you? Well, I'd like it better if we were a little closer together. Uh, can you come up a few steps? Why not? Hang on to the rope. Right. Uh, hey, hey, Ben. Don't let the rope go slack. I'm having trouble. I, I'm flipping. What? What's that? I can't hear you. Ben, Ben, I can't get a foot on him. I'm flipping. The rope, Ben. Help! Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
to you with compliments of importance. Senor Rose. Imported by Hugh Line, Hartford, Connecticut. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there's the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. Adventures in the Supernatural The XYZ Company brings you a new series of programs, a series which we believe is just a bit different from anything you have ever heard over your radio. A scientific investigation of supernatural phenomena, adventures into that shadowy realm which lies beyond the horizon of proven knowledge. Conducting this series of investigations and acting as commentator is the eminent psychologist, Dr. Lionel Hirsch. I present him now, Dr. Hirsch. Ladies and gentlemen, May I begin by explaining the position of the sponsor and my own position as regards this series of broadcasts. We are not out to prove or disprove anything. Our attitude is simply of scientific inquiry. The question, are there such things as mental telepathy, spirits, premonitions? Our answer is, we do not know. However, events do occur, or are reported to have occurred, weird, mysterious happenings difficult to explain through the operation of known natural laws. In this series of programs... We plan to give you in dramatic form the story of some of these happenings, instances which have been reported to and investiga uh, investigated by established scientific organizations. In dramatizing these actual cases for radio presentation, it is sometimes necessary to make occasional trifling changes, for example, to fit into a half-hour's broadcast events which occurred over a longer period of time. But the basic facts are presented just as they were originally reported. At the close of the dramatization, we will bring to the microphone the person or persons to whom the events occurred and will introduce such testimony as has a bearing on the case. The final decision, however, as to whether the case is or is not an example of the supernatural will be left to you. Thank you. And so, based upon an original report, we present our first adventure in the supernatural. Our story begins in the library of an English country house. It is a pleasant room which looks out through a glass-paneled door onto the garden and a green velvety expanse of lawn, invisible now in the blackness of a hot, sultry August night. A night so black that the darkness seems to press like a tangible thing against the window panes. At a bridge table are the Major, his wife, his daughter and son. Somewhere in the house... A clock strikes eleven. Um, uh, one spade. Two hearts. Well, Mildred? Oh, oh, is it my turn? Uh, it certainly is. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I... Well, well, what's the matter? Well, nothing. I, I was just listening. How quiet everything is. Not even the sound of the frogs in the creek. It's as if the whole world had suddenly... Suddenly stopped and was waiting for something. Are you going to finish this rubber? Oh, yes, of course. Uh, I uh, I said a spade. I wish you'd keep your mind on the game. And I said two hearts. 
You know, that is queer. Uh, what's queer? About the frogs. Ordinarily, they'd be croaking like good fellows. Have you noticed uh, there aren't any beetles this evening, are there? Beetles? Fumbling against the windows. When the lights are on in here, there are usually dozens of them. No doubt the heat has killed them. I've never seen it so close and stifling. I'm sure it's been hot enough to be the death of everything. Yes, that's it. That's the feeling. The presence of death. Eh? It came over me as I was returning from the tennis courts. It had been glorious all afternoon until the sun went down. And then darkness came on so swiftly. and Everything was quiet and hushed. Not the drowsy quiet of evening, but a deadly stillness. It, it, it was like leaving a bright sunlit street and suddenly stepping into a darkened room where someone lay dead. Oh, don't be morbid, Mildred. <laughs> that feeling, I can't shake it off. Oh, rot. It is oppressive, Charles. We're going to have a storm, that's all. It's always this way before a storm. Now, I bid a spade and Ronnie here bid two halves. Three dimes. I pass, as usual. Haven't had a bit of luck all evening. Well, I hope you know what you're doing, Mildred. Here's a nice run of clubs for you, too. Oh, hold on. That's Mother's trick. Oh, hmm? sorry. Oh, yes. Do watch the game, Mildred. The uh, roses in that bowl on the piano are quite wilted. You'd better tell Ellen to cut some fresh ones in the morning. She's getting careless. Why, those were fresh this afternoon. I saw Ellen picking them in the garden. Oh, they don't look it. If you ask me, the whole garden looks a bit seedy. As if everything were dying. Oh, Mally. Where is Ellen this evening, anyway? I let her have the evening off. She has some cousins living near here. She wanted to call on them. Yes, but it's after 11 o'clock. She should be back by this time. I say, Mildred, would you please? Millie. Mildred, what's the matter? She's fainted. Mildred, darling. Here, here, take a swallow of water. Oh, that's all right. Oh, she'll be all right. Well, you feel better? A little. Awfully stupid of me. But, darling, what happened? I, I, I don't know. Everything got dark, and then... And then I heard the sound of hoofbeats and the rumble of a carriage. It kept coming closer and closer. And finally it swept past me. And through the carriage window, I, I saw a face chalk white with staring eyes. Oh, it was horrible. There, there, darling. Uh, too much tennis this afternoon in the hot sun. In India, I've seen things like this happen lots of times. Had a little touch of the sun myself once. Fancied I saw all sorts of weird things. One gets over it quickly now. There's nothing to worry about. You feel better now, don't you? Yes, quite all right. Only it did seem so real. You'd better run along to your room and get some rest anyway. And tomorrow we'll call, and we'll call in Dr. Thornton. Oh, I'll be all right by tomorrow. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. And uh, no more tennis for a few days, eh? I do hope there's nothing really wrong. Oh, I don't see that there's anything to be alarmed about. Mildred's always been a normal, healthy girl. Maybe we'd better go back to town. But let's wait and see what Dr. Thornton says, eh? It's odd, though, it should happen tonight. What with all the other queer things? The frogs and beetles, the flowers suddenly wilting. Oh, I say, don't be a blithering idiot. Listen, hmm? uh, is that you, Ellen? Ellen? Oh, I just wanted to make sure it was you. Yes, ma'am, it's me. I, I'm sorry I'm so late getting back. I, we had an accident almost. An accident? Yes, sir. Uh, Jerry, that's my cousin, was driving me back in the motor. He chauffeurs for the Colbert, you know. And we was going along, taking it easy like, and talking over old times, and, and then he hears the sound of horses and a coach coming up behind us. A coach? Yes, sir, a carriage. Traveling fast it was, too. It was on us almost before we knew it. Jerry just had time to pull to one side. You mean a coach almost ran into your motor? Yes, sir. Oh, why? Wait a moment. What kind of a coach was it, Ellen? Well, I, I don't know, Mum. I didn't see it. Didn't see it? Uh, no, sir. But what was it being excited like? It, it passed us and went tearing down the road without... The coach it. almost ran into you, passed you, and you didn't see it? No, sir. All we heard was the sound. And that's the truth, sir. If you don't believe me, you can ask my cousin. But I, I've never lied to you in my life, and I'm not lying now. It's the truth, so help me. We know you're not lying, Ellen. But what you heard was probably the wind. There hasn't been a breath of air stirring since sundown. It wasn't the wind. It was something terrible. Terrible. Oh, now, Ellen, I'm sure it wasn't anything terrible. And anyway, it's all over now. There's nothing to cry about. You come along with me. Well, how do you explain that? I don't think Ellen was playing tennis in the sun this afternoon. Oh, a lot of nonsense. That's not an explanation. Well, uh, uh... No, there isn't any explanation, except that she imagined it. A coach. 
Nobody rides in coaches anymore. She'd have been just as reasonable if she said she'd encountered a knight in armor. And I suppose the fact that Mildred spoke of a coach when she fainted... What are you stopped. driving at? I'm going to bed, sitting around here talking a lot of nonsense. Hello, hello, thunder. <laughs> Told you it was going to storm. You can't go out and have a look at the weather. I say, Ronald, come out here. Yes? What is it? You know, I believe that is a coach. Who in the name of common sense would be driving a coach around the country at this time of night? Listen. Sounds as if it's coming this way, too. No question about it. It is coming this way. It must be at the turn in the road. By Jove, then it's coming here. There aren't any other houses this side of the turn. Must be driving without lights. I can't see a thing. I can. There. Oh, right. And they're turning in. Great Scott, they're running right over the lawn and through the garden. They'll ruin it. Here, here, here. I say, hold on there. Good Lord, they're headed directly for the creek. They'll never see it without lights. They'll go over the bank. Stop. Stop. There's a creek down there. It's a steep bank. They can't stop at that cliff. They'll go over the bank even if they do see it. Go in the house and get a lantern. Hurry. Clark, what is it? Carriage. Turn off the road and head for the creek. Slashed right across the lawn and the garden. Well, the horses must have run away. There's probably no one in the carriage. There were two men on the driver's seat. I saw that much. What happened? I thought uh, I heard... Nothing's happened. Go back to your room. Just a carriage that got off the road, dear. A carriage? Yes. They, they must have lost their way. And a very old carriage with a faded crest on it and, and two coachmen in livery. Eh? Hey, you saw it. No, but I knew it would come. Hey, here's the lantern. I had a time finding it. Now, be careful, Charles. You don't know what I'll be happened. careful. Take Mildred inside. Give me the lantern, Ron. Come along. Hello? Hello there. I say hello. There doesn't seem to be anyone about. Oh, here they are, over here. Huh? They pulled up and swung around just in time, too. Not the flossing, they'd have been over the edge of the bank and into the creek. Yes, yes, but where is the coachman? Hello. I don't see how these horses could have run that fast. Possibly skeletons. And the coach looks like something out of a museum. I wonder it didn't fall apart. I can't understand what became of the coachman. I say that. Dead. I think there's someone inside the coach. Sure. Oh, wait a moment. Stay here. Anyone in there? Sir? Why don't you open the door? Oh, beg your pardon, madam. I... Oh, Dad, here's the coachman. Oh, wait a moment, you fellows. What are you doing here? Us. Uh... Come down off that coach, I tell you. You're trespassing. We want to talk with you. I say we want to talk with you. You know. There, wait, wait a moment. They won't stop. I didn't see them till they were climbing up on the coach. I don't know where they could have come from. That's not the only curious thing. There's a woman in that coach. And she was dead. Again, the scene is the library, the time the following morning. The garden doors are open and sunlight streams into the room. In the garden, birds sing. The Major and Dr. Thornton are standing in the doorway. Sorry to bring you out here on a wild goose chase, Doctor. I didn't imagine there was anything really the matter with Mildred. Still, you Nothing know. to worry about at all. Mildred's in perfect health. If everyone in the village were as healthy as she is, <laughs> I'd have to give up my practice. Oh, what do you suppose made her faint? Oh, any number of things. The heat, perhaps. A little touch of indigestion. She's never been subject to fainting spells, has she? No. Some little temporary condition, that's all. I uh, I don't know whether she mentioned it to you or not, but for a moment after she came to, she talked rather incoherently. She seemed to have the impression that she'd seen a coach. A rather queer coach. Nothing especially unusual about that. Happens lots of times. Ever see a patient come out from under an anesthetic? Same thing. Simply a dream. Only uh, this one persisted. We had a bit of a time convincing her that she hadn't seen it. Well, the human mind's a peculiar mechanism. We don't know very much about it. I don't suppose there are any of us who can tell exactly where dreams leave off and reality begins. We all carry around a certain number of delusions. Yes, yes, I understand there's no one quite sane. <laughs> Not so sure about myself. But I wonder... 
Suppose a person's mind were a mechanism so finely tuned that it could record a happening long before the less sensitive mind recorded it. Mm -hmm. Or uh, haven't you ever heard of dreams coming true? Only in romantic novels. Well, I still have two more calls to make. Goodbye. Uh, goodbye, Doctor. So, uh, what about golf tomorrow? Oh, yes, right, right. <laughs> Come in. Oh, yes, Ellen? We have set you here again, sir. Oh, oh yes. Sir. And I've picked some fresh roses. They look much better today, sir. Yes, yes, don't they? I'll put them here in the bowl. I think they're as pretty as we've had this summer. Mm, they are pretty. Oh, oh, show the inspector in. Yes, sir. Oh, come in, inspector. Sit down, won't you? Thank you. I'd just like to be bothering you again. But since I talked to you last night, well, there are several little details that need clearing up. No bother at all. Now, in the first place, are you sure that woman in the carriage was dead? Sure she hadn't merely fainted? Inspector, I've served in the army for a long time. I see death too often not to recognize it. The woman was dead. And these two coachmen, uh, what did they look like? Well, as I told you, I got only a glimpse of them. Besides, it was quite dark. Oh, yes, one thing I did notice. They wore livery. Livery? Yes. Coach had a crest on it, a coat of arms. As my son said, it, it looked as if it might have come out of a museum. Your son saw all this too? Yes, and so did my wife and daughter. At least they saw the coach pass the house again as it returned from the creek and swung back onto the road. You know, Major, this case has some very extraordinary aspects. My first theory was that the two coachmen were taking a body somewhere with the idea of disposing of it and got onto the wrong road. Yes. However, an investigation of the vicinity shows no deaths nor disappearances reported. Hmm. And if these two men were attempting to dispose of a body, they'd scarcely want to attract attention to themselves by dressing in livery. What's more, such a coach as you describe would certainly have been noticed on the road. Thus far, we haven't discovered anyone who has seen it. It passed our maid on the road last evening. Oh, well, would you mind if I had a talk with her and get her description of it? She won't be able to give you a description. She didn't see it either. Didn't see it? If it passed her on the road, uh, I'm afraid I don't understand, Major. I don't think any of us understand. I don't think we'll ever understand. Why, what do you mean? When I say this, Inspector, I want you to know that I'm a sane, sensible, practical sort of a person. But in a universe as complex as ours, it is conceivable that there are other worlds, other planes of existence, events which occur in time and space, not our time and space. Perhaps that coach and its strange occupants wandered momentarily from out of another world. Well, I... Uh... You recall last night I told you the carriage had plunged off the road, crashed through the garden and cut across the lawn? Yes. Under those galloping hooves and careening carriage wheels, I naturally assumed the garden would be wrecked, the lawn pieces. Well, this morning when I looked out, there wasn't a single hoof print, a single rut of a carriage wheel, a single broken trellis in the garden. On the lawn, not the tiniest bit of turf had been disturbed. Inspector, there was not one sign that the carriage had ever been here. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I am turning the microphone over to Dr. Hirsch for his comments on the story you have just heard. Thank you. This dramatization is based upon an actual report given to the British Society for Psychical Research by Major Charles Gordon Beck. A mysterious coach carrying a dead woman, crashing across a lawn, yet leaving no marks, then disappearing into the night. And mind you, four sane people believe they saw it. What is the explanation? Now, from a scientific standpoint, we cannot begin our investigation with the assumption that the report is true. Neither can we take the opposite assumption, that it is false. In drawing our conclusions in this respect, there are several points to be considered. First, the character of the recipient, that is, the person who claims to have perceived or witnessed the phenomenon. We have to decide, by whatever ability we have in judging a man's character, whether he is truthful or not. Before we decide he is not telling the truth, we should find some inconsistencies in his story or at least some motive or reason for his telling a falsehood. But if we fail to find these, we do not yet have to assume that his story is true. The man might be telling an untruth and yet be perfectly honest. He may be an imaginative type, capable of conjuring up in his mind all manners of weird experiences and 
actually believing them. Or he might have had an uh, hallucination. Once again, we have to judge a man and decide whether he is an imaginative type, the kind of person who would dream dreams and see visions. If we decide that he is telling the truth, that he actually saw what he claims to have seen, there is still the possibility that he is a victim of a hoax, a practical joke. So, before we arrive at any conclusion at all, we should look for natural causes to explain the affair rather than supernatural. Now, I'm going to let you make your own decisions on all of these points. I'm bringing to the microphone for an interview the man who saw the coach and its occupant and who made the report to the British Society, Major Charles Gordon Beck. Major Gordon Beck, was the dramatization you heard just now an accurate representation of what happened? Yes, as far as the facts are concerned. Of course, the words which your characters used were not precisely our words. Of course. But the story we presented was just as it actually happened. Yes, yes. How long ago did this happen? Let me see. About ten, uh, no, about eleven years ago, last August. Mm Mm-hmm. Where did it happen? In Devonshire, England, where I was living. Did the house you lived in have the reputation of being, well, uh, haunted? No, not that I'd heard of. In your experience, had anything strange ever happened there before? No. Or after this curious affair? Never. You are an army officer, are you not? I was. uh, I'm retired now. In your own personal experience, not only in your home in Devonshire, but anywhere, anytime, has any other occurrence like this ever happened to you? Have you ever experienced hallucinations? No, no, nothing like that. Do you believe in supernatural phenomena? Well, no, I can't say that I do. I've always considered myself a, a practical man. Yes. Now, understand, Major, we're not trying to trip you up, but simply attempting to find some sort of logical explanation. How do you know you didn't imagine the whole thing? If I'd been the only one to have seen it, I think I would have doubted my own sanity. But my son accompanied me down to the creek, and my wife and daughter saw the coach pass the house. I don't think we all could have imagined it. Well, how do you know it wasn't a practical joke that someone was playing on you? Well, that wouldn't explain the absence of wheel marks on the lawn and in the garden. All right. Then let's take another assumption. Let's assume there's a family living in the country, getting a bit bored with life, and they make up the story just to amaze the neighbors. Remember, I'm not saying you did make up the story, of course. I'm asking if that isn't a logical explanation. Yes, uh, perhaps it is. But they'd have to be very silly people, and they'd probably gain a reputation of being unmitigated liars. And in such a case, uh, I don't think they'd take chances of running afoul of the law by leading the police on a wild goose chase. Of course, they they might try to amaze their neighbors. No, I don't think they'd try to amaze the police. Well, how long after this happened did you notify the police? Immediately, the same evening. Did you tell anyone else about it? Not at the time. You see, at first I was mainly concerned with the fact that the woman in the coach was dead. Yes. I didn't realize how unearthly the affair was until the next morning, until I saw there were no marks on the lawn. Then I decided I had better not say anything more about it. You see... Uh, People might think I'd gone out of my head. Mm -hmm. And you didn't say anything about it? No. No. You didn't use the affair to gain any notoriety? No. But you intimate that some time later you did mention the affair. Uh, How long afterwards and to whom? Well, I should say uh, about three months afterwards. I mentioned it to some friends in London. One of them suggested that I report it to the British Society for Psychical Research. And you did? Yes, yes. I made a report and it's included in the proceedings of the Society. Did the British Society for Psychical Research offer any explanation? No, but they did tell me a very unusual thing. They said that at four different times, four different people in four different parts of the world had reported a similar occurrence. What do you mean by a similar occurrence? I mean a coach with coachmen and carrying the corpse of a woman. And this strange equipage was never apprehended, never caught, never explained? No. Have you yourself any explanation to offer? No, I haven't. I've puzzled over it for years. And so has my wife and my son and daughter. As I told you several days ago, my only reason for coming to your wireless studio here would be for the purpose of putting the story before a great many people. Perhaps, uh, perhaps there's a very simple explanation that I've overlooked, that some of them might see. Thank you, Major Gordon Beck. Thank you very much. So there you are, ladies and gentlemen. That's as far as we've been able to go. 
Is there an explanation for Major Gordon Beck's unusual experience? We leave that to you. And now I am returning the microphone to your announcer. Ladies and gentlemen, we are genuinely interested in studying so-called supernatural phenomena. If anything of this nature has happened to you, we would greatly appreciate a letter about it, giving names, dates, and the facts as you remember them. If your report is adaptable to dramatization, we will reimburse you for the story. We say good night now and allow you to draw your own conclusions concerning the story you have heard. Winter has Louisville in its grip, and former FBI agent Dallas Powell has his hands full with car trouble, cat trouble, and trying to keep the Derby City branch of True Blood Investigations and Security, Inc. solvent. When a juicy insurance job comes his way, he jumps at it, but the discovery of a decades-old murder spawns a veritable blizzard of violence, and Dallas finds himself right in its path. Winter Wonderland a Dallas Powell Mystery by T. Lee Harris, narrated by Darren Marlar. You're a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. of finest wine is in a catacombs far under the river. Bones are there too, human bones, the burial grounds of an old family. And deep in that dark, dank tunnel, there is no one to hear a man begging for his life. Hello, creeps. This is Peter Lorre, opening the doors of the Mystery Playhouse. The words of Edgar Allan Poe usually start one's acquaintance with the literature of mystery. Then, as the years pass by, we are apt to forget that Poe is not only the father of the horror story, but truly the master of moral. And so tonight, we bring you one of the very first and very best. It's a story of revenge that communicates its terror to the listener so directly that hours afterward your spine will still feel cold. Here then is Edgar Allan Poe's The Cask of Amontillado. <laughs> thousand injuries of Fortunato, I bore as best I could. Neither by word nor deed did I ever give him cause to doubt my goodwill. That was long ago, but I remember it. If ever a man had reason to hate and right to vengeance, it was I, the last of the Montresors. Through a device which the devil himself must have conceived, Fortunato, the noble, high-born Fortunato, had robbed and swindled my aging and sorrowful father of all his vast fortunes. As the last of our gold was transferred to Fortunato's already brimming vaults, my father, broken, humiliated, and plagued with anguish, passed on. As he lay dying, his last words to me were, Revenge! 
Revenge, my son, the wrongs done to the Montresors by this fiendish Fortunato. <laughs> My father had been old and helpless before Fortunato's cruel and evil ways. Now that my father was dead, I would be avenged. I vowed neither by word nor deed would I ever give Fortunato cause to doubt my goodwill. I accepted the small sums of gold which he so graciously offered from time to time, only that I might live to bring upon the noble Fortunato the terrible doom he so richly deserved. Until revenge was mine, I would smile in Fortunato's face, and indeed, for many years, I was smilingly his friend. <laughs> Scarcely a night passed that Fortunato did not stop beneath my window. So much did he enjoy the opportunity for further injury. Surrounded by his boisterous and giddy friends, he would call drunkenly up to me. Yes, Fortunato? Come, come, cease your mourning. Lucchese here is opening a cask of sherry in honor of the spree. Put away your sorrows and join us. No, Fortunato, I cannot. Enjoy yourself without me. Fool. A fool like you deserves his sorrows. Come, gentlemen, we are fools for even asking him to join us in our fun. Come. The drink, drink, the wine of spring is here. Good night, Montresor. The melancholy Montresor hasn't even a courage to drink with his fellow townsmen. Good night, As his drunken prattle faded into the night, I would snuff out my candle and toss fitfully in the dark, feeling fresh each galling wound Fortunato had ever dealt me and waiting a moment of my revenge. None in the town ever witnessed my wounded pride. None except Amiato, the wine dealer, my one true friend. To him alone did I dare to mention the name of Fortunato. He must, on occasion, have read my troubled mind. For he showed me many kindnesses and much understanding, even at times to Fortunato's disadvantage. Ah, Signor Montresor. Good morning, Amiato. I have a splendid surprise for you today. Have you, Amiato? And what is that? A cask of Contigliano, Signor, the finest wine there is. Here, sample it, Signor. Oh, I can't afford anything so rare, Amiato. I only came to call, not to purchase. It will cost you no more than the kind you usually buy. Drink, Signor. Well. Thank you. That's enough. <sighs> you treat me too well, I know. Beautiful. I scarcely know how to thank you. Your expression of delight is more gratitude than I deserve. I was extremely fortunate in being able to purchase the last available cask for you. And there's none meant for Fortunato? You will arouse his anger. The wine dealer must follow his judgment and his heart. Fortunato prides himself too highly on his knowledge of good wines. <laughs> I believe you are more skillful, Signor. Thank you. He and the case, he opened a cask of sherry last night in honor of the spring. Then he will be in a bad mood today. Oh, yes. oh see, he approaches, Signor, and looks as dark as your own ancient vault. <laughs> ah, Fortunato, it's good to see you. It was just as well, perhaps, that you refused to come last night, Montresor. Lucchese is a fool about wines. Fact of which I am doubly sure after sharing his inferior vintages last night. Ah, I see you have Contigliano, Amiato. Signor Montresor has it now to a very wise purchase. Are you joking, Amiato? Where would Montresor find the funds to buy such a rare wine? That is not my affair, Signor. So that is what you do with all your money in your solitary evenings, Montresor. Spend them both on Amiato's rare finds. Well, I will wager you've not a drop left to show for it. On the contrary, Signor Montresor has one of the finest cellars in all the country. You're too kind, Amiato. But, Fortunato, why not see for yourself? My vaults are always open to you. Someday I shall. And as for you, Amiato, see that you take care, better care of my vaults in the future. Good day. Good day to you, Good day, Fortunato. Fortunato. <laughs> I shall send the Contigliano to your palazzo before evening, Signor Montresor. Now, 
how my mind was made up. That moment in the wine dealer's shop gave me the beginnings of a plan. A plan for which I had long been waiting. Fortunato must visit my wine cellar deep down in the catacombs beneath the home of the Montresors. From the depths of my old misery, I began to devise the details of the plan. Ahead of Fortunato, there lay only horror, agony, and damnation. It was about dusk that I finally sought Fortunato out, one evening during the height of his wedding festivities. He was to be married the next day, and gaily he sauntered through the crowd celebrating in his honor. He was dressed in a gay, many-colored costume, and on his head he wore a high, conical cap, topped with brilliant, small, jingling bells. Surrounded by light-hearted friends, musicians, and many curious bystanders, Fortunato was the very center of a magnificent spectacle. It was this scene, both beautiful and terrible, in which I found him. Dear Fortunato, how remarkably well you look tonight. And how lucky to find you. I've just purchased a cask of Amontillado wine. But, well, I'm afraid I've been cheated. How, uh, Montesong? Amontillado? A cask this time like this? This time of year, impossible. Well, this was a strange wine dealer, true. And, well, I was foolish enough to pay him the full Amontillado price without first consulting you in the matter. Amontillado. So he <laughs> told me. But uh, since your friends are waiting for you, I must find the Casey and ask him to test it for me. If anyone's a connoisseur of good wine, Lucchese is. He will tell you. Lucchese cannot tell Amontillado from water. Some people say that his taste is a match for your own. What? Where is this wine? In the vaults beneath my home. Come, let us go. Go where, Fortunato? Through your vaults. I will test it. Oh, my friend, no. I won't impose this way on your good nature. You must remain with your friend. <laughs> Casey is not in such great demand, especially tonight. My friends will not miss me for a few moments. <coughs> Come on. No, Fortunato, no, I won't permit you. I see you're afflicted with a terrible cold, and my vaults are so insufferably damp, they're encrusted with wine. Let us go, Montresor, nevertheless. Cold is nothing. Amontillado. You have been cheated. And as for Lucchese, he is no connoisseur of good wine. Only I am worthy to decide. <coughs> Let us be on our way. Dashing ahead, half running, half stumbling, shouting his drunken plans, Fortunato pulled me anxiously along the street. I pretended to hold back to be unwilling to have him leave his friends yet each moment. My eagerness to complete my plan grew greater and greater. Soon we reached my home. There were no attendants there. They'd gone off to help in the celebration. I took from their brackets two torches, and giving one to Fortunato, I led him through several suites of rooms and through the archway that led down into the vault. As we descended the long, winding stairway onto the damp ground of the catacombs, I listened and chanted to the delicate bell attached to the conical cap atop Fortunato's bobbing head. Against the somber shadows of the catacomb walls, Fortunato's gay red and yellow costume brought a touch of beauty and lent a moment of holiday to the tears of rare red and amber vintage. His steps were unsteady, and the bells upon his cap jingled even more as he stumbled down the damp stair. <coughs> the... The Amontillado, Montresor. It's farther on. <coughs> How long have you had that cough, Fortunato? <coughs> it is nothing. Come, Fortunato, we'll go back. Your health is too precious. This dampness is not good for your cough. No, no, no. Let us go on. The wine. But, but you'll be ill, and I don't want to be responsible. Besides, there is always the case. Here. Enough. The cough is a man. Nothing. It will not kill me. I shall not die of a cough. True. True. You will not die of a cough. 
And I had no intention of alarming you unnecessarily, but you should take care of yourself. Uh, here, a drink of this wine, this fine aged Medoc, will defend us from the chilling dampness. Hmm? Here, allow me to break the neck of the bottle for you. Drink. I drink to the buried that repose around us. And I drink to your long life. Ah. Good, good, excellent. This wine is excellent. Bring it along. But uh, what about the Amontillado wine? Oh, that's farther on, good Fortunato. <laughs> What's your footing there, my friend? The ground becomes damper and more slippery as we descend. <laughs> The expectation of making a fool of me through my purchase of the Amontillado sparkled in his eyes and the bells jingled. We passed through walls of piled bones with casks and broken bottles intermingling into the lowest depths of the cellar. I paused again and this time seized Fortunato by the elbow. The lime, Fortunato, seized, increases, hangs like moths upon the vault. We're below the river's bed now. Look how the drops of moisture trickle among the bones. <laughs> oh, come, Fortunato, we'll go back before it's too late. You're caught. It, it is nothing. No, let us go on. But first, another bottle of the Medoc. Oh, a oh, better. A bottle of this, the Bananos. Here, Fortunato. Here. You break the bottle this time. Very well. Your taste is truly that of a connoisseur, Montresor. I'm amazed. But come, let us go on. Yes, sir. And hold up your torch, Montresor. I, I, I don't care for this black business. <coughs> Be it so, Fortunato. <laughs> I offered him my arm. He leaned upon it heavily, for the wine I'd been giving him was beginning to have its desired effect. We continued our search for the Amontillado. We passed through a range of low arches. Descended. Passed on. And descending again, arrived at the deepest where my father had been laid to rest. The foulness of the air was stifling, the dampness, all but snuffed out our torches. Ah, uh, Montresor, what... What other secrets do you have hidden here beneath the world? Why do you ask, good fortune? This pile of bones here. Now, how does it happen that the bones from this wall are thrown down in this manner? Uh, why is it you have never replaced them, Huh? What secret treasures do you keep in this last small recess? Fortunato, uplifting his dull torch, tried to peer into the depths of the recess and to discover within its circumscribing walls of solid granite the rare and exciting treasure which he drunkenly fancied. But it was in vain. His light was too feeble for him even to see where the solid granite walls ended. Go in, Fortunato. Inside is the cask of wine you wish to taste. The Amontillado. Amontillado. Careful, Fortunato. Enter slowly. It's dark in that niche. And the floor is even more slippery. What's this, Montresor? The niche ends so abruptly. True, Fortunato, it does. But proceed. I'm coming in with you. No need to be so bewildered. What are you doing, Montessor? I cannot see. See, Fortunato, how secure these chains are embedded in the walls. How heavy the iron staples with which they're fastened to the granite. You see this heavy iron lock? 
The iron smiths of the last century knew their craft. Eh, Fortunato? See how snugly these chains fit about your waist. Oh. And this key. See, Fortunato, how smoothly it fits the lock. Now, Fortunato, pass your hand along the wall. You cannot help feeling the damp line that clings to it. Yes, the wall is very damp, but it will keep you from falling. Perhaps you've already had too much wine. The amortillado. True, the amortillado. Fortunato was still nodding in his drunken stupor, and not yet did he know that he was forever chained to the walls of that black hell. I stepped outside and busied myself among the pile of bones that lay at the foot of the wall. The bones which he'd been sure had hidden the treasure. Which, in truth, they did. Throwing them aside, I soon uncovered a quantity of building stone and mortar and a trowel which I'd hidden there. With these materials, I began vigorously to wall up the entrance of the niche. But for the regular sound of my trowel and an occasional jingle of tiny bells on Fortunato's cap, all was silent. I laid the first tier, and the second, and the third. I could scarce have begun the fourth tier of the masonry when I discovered that Fortunato's intoxication was wearing off. Fortunato was indeed awakened. With fiendish delight, I sat down upon the bones, and I listened to his furious attempts to escape. When at last the clanking subsided, I resumed my work with the trowel, and I finished without interruption the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh tiers. The wall was now nearly upon a level with my breast. I again paused, and holding the torch over the mason work, I threw a few feeble rays onto the dejected figure within. Help! Help! For the love of the Almighty, someone come and stop this bad man! This fool! This devilish thief! Help! Help! <laughs> <laughs> the love of God. No, no, Fortunato. No. You forget how far we are below no. the riverbed. No. Perhaps if I shout with you, Fortunato, no. someone will hear. Together, Fortunato. Louder. Stop. Help! Louder still, Fortunato. Oh. Help! For the love of the Almighty, someone come and release the noble Fortunato. Help! He needs help so desperately. And there are so many between him and the rest of the world. Help! Help! Suddenly my prisoner was still. It was now midnight, and my job was almost ended. I completed the eighth, the ninth, the tenth tiers. I was finishing the eleventh and the last. There was only a single stone to be fitted and plastered in. I struggled with its weight, and I placed it partially in its destined position. <laughs> a very good joke indeed, Monster Saw. An excellent jest. We will have many a rich laugh about it tomorrow at the wedding. <laughs> Over our wine. <laughs> Over the Amontillado. <laughs> yes. Over the Amontillado. It's getting late, Monster Saw. They will be waiting for us at the Palazzo. The future lady, Fortunato, and all my friends. Let it be gone, Monster Saw. The joke's over. <laughs> yes, Fortunato. Let it be gone. For the love of the almighty Monster <laughs> Yes, for the love of the almighty. Fortunato? Fortunato? No answer came. I thrust my torch through the remaining opening and let the light fall within. From inside the crypt there came the only answer Fortunato now could summon. I felt sick on account of the dampness of the catacombs. I hastened to finish my labors. I forced the last stone into its position. I plastered it up. Against the new masonry, I re-erected the old rampart of bones. For half a century, no one has disturbed them. The bones of my fathers rest in peace.
And so ends the first story of a man who killed to avenge his family's honor. Our next production concerns itself with an expert criminologist, a man who prided himself on his claim of never making a mistake. Follow me to the green room, and we'll eavesdrop at rehearsal. This way. Come. <laughs> come, come. Get back to Harrington. Well, the entire case, of course, was decidedly second rate. You probably know the details. No, as a matter of fact, I don't. That's why I came here. Oh? See, I was in Africa just last week and didn't even know Harrington had been arrested until just before I sailed. I see. Well, I won't bore you with most of it. Uh, suffice it to say that Ernest West had pushed Harrington in the stock market to a point where Harrington had to stop West or face absolute ruin. I see. So Harrington fought West out one night, sought him out at West's home on Long Island, and shot him with a twenty-five caliber revolver. Oh? We found it later in Harrington's safe. Well, there was nothing for the poor man to do but confess. Oh, and Harrington was convicted solely on your evidence, Dr. Trevor? Yes. Otherwise, he might have escaped. But your entire case was constructed around the revolver. Yes. And his prompt confession put an end to further investigation. Um, now, as I was uh, saying... Dr. Trevor, I'm interested in that revolver. A twenty-five, you say? Yes, rather uncommon caliber. Yes, with the handle chipped a bit on the right side. Yes. How do you know? <laughs> It belonged to West's wife, not to Harrington. What? Yes, yes. It got chipped when she dropped it on a rock while target shooting in Switzerland. You see, I was with her at the time. You mean Alice West gave that revolver to Harrington? Oh, I doubt that, much as she loved him. You're out of your mind, Greg. Not Nelson. at all. I'm afraid that little twenty-five caliber revolver probably resulted in the execution of the wrong man. That's impossible. The right man, you see, was a woman. Alice West. She and Harrington were in love, and West played dog in the manger and wouldn't divorce her. Alice West is the murderer, not Harrington. She killed him? Certainly. There was no reason for Harrington to borrow her revolver. He had quite a little arsenal of his own, as I remember. A forty-five caliber would have been his speed. But Alice West was in Europe at the time of the crime. Ah, before and after, yes. But I happen to know she was in Montreal the very month the murder was committed, and that isn't far from Long Island by plane. Go on, Gregory. Well, to clinch my case, Alice got tight one night in Monte Carlo and told me she was going to kill her husband. I left for North Africa the next day and didn't hear a thing for months. But when I saw the papers, I hadn't any doubts as to who had bumped off Ernest West. But Harrington's confession. Oh, Dr. Trevor, that's easy if you know people. The poor ox went to the chair for his lady love. It's been done before, you know. Gregory, what you say? It's impossible. Why? The man was convicted solely on my evidence. I could never make a mistake like that. Oh, come now. We all make mistakes. I don't. Well, it's a shame, but what's done is done. Obviously. You don't understand, Gregory. My reputation won't permit mistakes. Oh. I simply do not make them, that's all. Oh, don't worry, Trevor. Your reputation isn't going to suffer. Alice West will be dead of dope inside of two years, if I'm any judge. And no one else knows you've been wrong just this once. You do? Well, yes, but we can forget all about that. Yes, we must. We must. All right? So don't fret, Trevor. I'll keep my mouth shut. Yes. I know you will. Fine. Now, what about another brandy, eh? Oh, yes, over here on the table. Trevor. What are you doing? Trevor! Oh! Yes, Gregory. You will keep your mouth shut. You see, the doctor doesn't make mistakes. If he did, it might prove fatal. In our next broadcast, you'll learn how a man committed the perfect crime. Or was it? Now, this is Peter Lorre closing the doors of the Mystery Playhouse. Good night. Sleep tight. This 
is the Armed Forces Radio Service. I've often joked about how, instead of an energy drink, I need a motivation drink. They just don't exist, or so I thought. I was told recently about Magic Mind. They wanted me to consider promoting their product, but I never endorse anything, unless I've tried it and approve of it first. After taking Magic Mind with my morning routine every day, along with my vitamins and my coffee as always, in less than a week, I was feeling more focused, more alert, and surprisingly, more motivated. I'm spending more time on what's important and getting more accomplished when doing so. My mood is better, making each day less stressful. Magic Mind is doctors validated. It has over 200 scientific studies behind each of the ingredients, like cognizine cytosoline, it's the best nootropics on the market, the highest possible grade matcha, organically grown mushrooms from California, and more. Magic Mind uses nano-encapsulation technology. It helps your body to absorb the good stuff that much faster and more efficiently. So, I gave them my stamp of approval. I even signed up for a monthly subscription of 30 bottles before telling them I approved. And now Magic Mind is giving you, my weirdo family, a special deal. Up to 48% off your first subscription or 20% off a one-time purchase with the code DARKNESS at checkout. Go to magicmind.com slash darkness and then use the code DARKNESS at checkout. Murder Clinic, stories of the world's great detectives, Men Against Murder. Each week at this time, WOR Mutual turns the spotlight on one of the world's great detectives of fiction and invites you to listen to the story of his most exciting case. Tonight, Madame Rosica's story in The Scrap of Lace. Good evening, Madame Story. Your being at Murder Clinic is certainly a novelty. You're surprised to see a woman detective, Mr. Knight? That's right. And even more surprised to see a very beautiful detective. <laughs> <laughs> it's a queer business for a woman. <laughs> Most people think so, Mr. Knight. But you see, being a woman gives me one great advantage. My adversaries usually underestimate me. Yes, I suppose they would. <laughs> now, what's the tale you're going to tell us, Madam Story? It's called The Scrap of Lace. I chose it because it seems to me so unusual a crime. A strange story of jealousy and death. Of course you know the great family of Kruger who ruled New York society for generations. When Mrs. Peter John Kruger III died, her mantle descended as a matter of course to Mrs. Peter John Kruger IV. This beautiful and charming young woman, Mimi by name, inherited not only her mother-in-law's scepter, but also Teresa de Guion. Teresa de Guion was the first and certainly the greatest of social secretaries. The story begins one summer morning at Carris Woods, the enormous and rather monstrous Kruger estate in Upper Westchester. Mimi and Teresa de Guion were together in the breakfast room. Oh, Teresa, must we go to that dull dinner at the Bransoms tonight? I think I'll call it off. Mimi, you simply can't do that. Hmm? The dinner's being given for you. Oh. I was most insistent that I be consulted about the other guests. After all, my dear, you have certain responsibilities. 
Your mother-in-law, Mrs. Kruger the third. Yes, I know. She was a paragon of the social virtues. She didn't mind being bored to death. Oh, Mimi, you are so lax. What would you do without me? <laughs> uh, you worry too much, Teresa. You're living in the past. Your little assistant, Louise Mayfield, could possibly take over very well. Louise? Louise Mayfield? That, that child. My dear Teresa, she's 21 and very competent. After all, you trained her. Yes, and I am very fond of Louise. She's like a daughter to me. But take my place? Why, surely you're joking, my dear. Oh, yes, yes, of course. You know, Mimi, I'm a bit worried about Louise. She's been acting very odd lately. This party she's going to tonight, I have no idea where it is or who her hostess is to be. Well, wherever it is, she'll have a better time than I will. You know, Teresa, I shouldn't be surprised if Louise has been acting strangely because she's trying to keep away from my handsome cousin, Jack Rowcliffe. She doesn't seem very grateful to you, Teresa, for arranging to marry him off to Vera McPeak. Jack Rowcliffe and Vera McPeak are a splendid match. He has family, position. Vera is young. She can be molded. She can be taught. Oh, <laughs> oh certainly, yes. And her father has 100 millions. But I don't blame Jack for straying from the fold. Louise is very lovely. And I found Vera a very trying guest. In fact, I find it all very trying. Mr. Guillaume. Oh, there's Louise. Uh, Louise, we're in the breakfast room. Uh, come in here, my dear. Good morning, Mrs. Kruger. Mrs. De Guillaume, um, did you want me this morning? Uh, no, Louise, I did. Teresa insists we go to this dinner tonight. Uh, Jack and Vera are going with us. We'll be leaving around seven. Uh, tell Jack, won't you? Must I, Mrs. Kruger? Mrs. Kruger has asked you to deliver a message. Do so, my dear. <laughs> Jack, I came only to tell you about the dinner. Oh, Louise. Please, must we go through all this again? Why don't you leave me alone? Because I'm mad about you, Louise. Can't you understand? I'm in love with you. I want you to marry me. You? <laughs> marry and support a wife? Don't be silly, Jack. It does sound silly, doesn't it? But I'm changed, I tell you. You've changed me, Louise. I love you. There's, there's nothing I wouldn't do for you. And what about Vera McPeak? Oh. No, Jack. I'm afraid you've been bought, paid for, and delivered. Vera won't let you go so easily. I'll tell her tonight that I'm through, Louise. I'll meet her at the dinner and tell her, and then I'll come back here to you. Come back if you like, Jack. Good, I'll be back at about... But I won't be here. Where are you going, Louise? Well, why don't you tell me? It's not a man. I know it's not a man. Who is it? Who is this it? nonsense has gone far enough. What I do is my own business. Do you understand that, Jack? No, it's my business. You're mine, Louise. Do you hear? You're mine. I'll have you or no one else will. Jack, let go my wrist. Louise, tell me. You're hurting me. Please. Louise, I want to know. Let me go. Well, Jack, Vera. you're making passes at the servants, I see. Perhaps it's just as well you saw. Might as well have this out now. Shut up. I can handle this. It's pretty easy to see what Miss Mayfield's little game is. She thinks she'll marry into the great Kruger clan. Well, let me tell you, Miss Mayfield. Jack hasn't got a cent to his name and never will have. Vera, please. I understand perfectly, Miss McPeak. I assure you, I have no ambitions in Mr. Roker's direction. Quite the lady, aren't you, Miss Mayfield? Well, watch your step. Sure, I know what you all think of me. Vulgar. Common. <laughs> but let me tell you. We common claim at Peaks from Pittsburgh know how to get what we want. And we know how to keep it. Think that over, Miss Mayfield. Think that over. Yes, come in. Mademoiselle, Miss Louise. Madame Kruger has sent me to help you dress for your engagement. Oh, come in, look. How thoughtful of Mrs. Kruger to send you, Suzanne. Have they gone? But we, oui, the car she left long ago. Oh, mon Dieu, they were not happy. Monsieur Jacques? He say nothing. And Mademoiselle, his fiancée, the ugly one, she... <laughs> oh, you say, she's very angry. Even Madame, she want not to go. Well, let's not think of them, Suzanne. I'm happy, and I'm going to have a wonderful time. Now, Mademoiselle is très charmant. Very lovely. It is a thrift you go to, n'est-ce pas? It is for your young man that your eyes shine so. Hmm? <laughs> Maybe. 
You're too smart, Suzanne. But how do you think my young man will like me? How do I look? Oh, rubbish, mademoiselle. You'll eat you up. You're so lovely. Suzanne, you are a darling. Yes, yes. Who is it? A letter from Miss Mayfield. Oh, thanks. It is a letter for you, mademoiselle. For me? That's a thick one, isn't it? Oh, how lovely. What an exquisite handkerchief. Why, who could have sent it to me? Madame Cruve must have sent it. It is one of the six she bought in Paris. It is perfect, mademoiselle, for your costume, n'est-ce pas? Oh, it's lovely. What a darling Mrs. Cougar is. Oui, she is most generous. You are carry this, no? Of course. Shall I put the scent, the perfume, on it, mademoiselle? No, thank you. I'll do it myself, Suzanne. Oh, just put that bottle of gardenia perfume on my dressing table, please. Oui, mademoiselle. Now you can go, Suzanne. I won't need you anymore. Merci, mademoiselle. Bon voyage, mademoiselle. Good night, Suzanne, and thank you. Hmm. Oh, it's so lovely. One more drop. <sighs> Suzanne, Suzanne, help! Suzanne, help! John, John. my years of experience, Mimi, I have never had to cope with anything so, so sordid. Teresa, how, how can you think of appearances with Louise, that beautiful child, lying I... in there dead? But I must think of them. After all, Dr. Plummer refuses to sign a death certificate. <laughs> that old fopper with his hints of foul play. Well, maybe he's right, Vera. Maybe what do you mean, a... Jack? What do you know of Louise Mayfield's death? Well, I... Stop wrangling, you two. Dr. Plummer was kind enough to give us 36 hours. He's risking a great deal going as far as that. Oh, why doesn't Madam Story get here? Are you sure you acted wisely in calling her in, Mimi? Well, it was either she or the police. You said she had a reputation for discretion. Come in. Yes? Madam Rosica Story and Miss Bella Brickley. Thank heaven you're here, Madam Story. This is a terrible situation, terrible. Oh, but let me introduce you. I am Teresa de Guillon. This is Mrs. Peter John Kruger III. How do you, How do, you do? do? Miss McPeak. Hello. Miss McPeak. Mr. Rokeless. How do you How do, do, do? Rokeless? It was good of you to come so quickly, Madam Story. This unfortunate accident is likely to create a dress dressing scandal for Mrs. Kruger. Accident, Mr. Guillaume? From what you told me over the phone, I gathered Louise Mayfield had been murdered. Nonsense. We don't know that, Madam Story. Nobody does. We only know Louise is dead. Poor child. We found her when we returned last night from our dinner party. It is nonsense, Teresa, and you know it. Madame Story is perfectly right. It would be very foolish to ask her help and not, not give her all the facts. What facts, Mimi? Just because that old fossil of a Dr. Plummer won't give a death certificate. If you ask me, it's a nice little scheme to get you to hire this Story woman and split whatever she can manage to get out of you. Vera. That's an interesting idea, Miss McPeak, though I must confess that so simple and clever a scheme would never have occurred to me. But surely Dr. Plummer offered some other reason for refusing a death certificate? Yes. He says... Oh, well, it's impossible, but... He says Louise was asphyxiated. No, fool, there isn't a gas outlet in the house. How helpful of you to know that, Miss McPeak. You won't mind, will you, if I check for myself? Mm, I don't mind what you do. Oh, what's the use of all this? We've nothing to tell. All of us were at a dinner party 20 miles from here together. When we got home after 11, we found Louise, well, that is, Miss Mayfield, dead. I see. Mr. Guion, when you phoned me, you said something about some missing object. Yes. Suzanne, the maid, insists a lace handkerchief came in the mail for Louise as she was dressing to leave. When we found her, the handkerchief had disappeared. Very interesting. Suppose I start, then, by questioning this maid, Suzanne. Maybe she can tell me more about this missing handkerchief. Good 
Good morning, Bella. Good morning, Madam Story. Typing last night's notes, I see. Yes. Say, you look worried. What is it? Oh, how can one look out at that peaceful garden and realize that in this house there's someone carrying the mark of Cain on their soul? Then you believe Louise Mayfield's death was not a natural one? That she was murdered? No doubt of it. Bella, that girl was asphyxiated. Oh, how horrible. So young, so full of life. Yes, isn't it? And it's our job to find out who killed her. Have you finished typing those notes you took at our interminable interviews last night? Not quite. I'm almost finished. Well, then I think I'll step out in the terrace. Maybe the fresh air will help me think. Something is bothering you. Yes, Bella. What happened to that lace handkerchief Louise Mayfield received in the mail? I'm sure that was the thing that killed her. I must find it. Will you call, you call me when you're through with those notes, please? <laughs> Madam Story, you come out and shame the flowers and dim the sunlight. Do you always make such pretty speeches, even so early in the morning, Mr. Rokeley? Oh, beautiful lady, you remember my name. Yours would be a difficult name to forget, Mr. Rokeley. Hmm? Thanks to the Rotical View and the Picture Magazine. Oh, that. You know, I had no hope of ever meeting you. I can't aspire to your circle. Much too clever. Hmm, it all depends. I should say that you were quite clever enough. For your own purposes, Mr. Rokeley. <laughs> I'm just a lightweight. <laughs> I wonder. I see you're standing out under her window. That is Miss Mayfield's room up there, isn't it? Yes. Well, that was her room. Ivy-clad walls, old English ivy. Sturdy and strong, too. I wonder why the vines are so torn and broken. Oh, are they? I, I hadn't noticed. You loved Louise Mayfield very much, didn't you? Yes, I loved him more than anything in life. And she? Oh, why should she care for me? What am I? Nothing but a wastrel. She was in love with someone else. I know it. I could tell. But if I'd known who it was, I... Why didn't you tell me, Mr. Rowcliffe? You'd left your dinner party and came back here last night. How did you know that I did? I didn't. You've just told me. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> well, there, you see, I... I told you you're too clever for me. What time was it when you got here? Well, I don't know. It was about 9.30, I think. I see. You came around back here in the garden. You saw a light in her window, called her, got no answer. And you climbed that ivy up to her window, didn't you? Well, I... who saw me? Nobody, as far as I know. That broken ivy tells its own story, but not all of it. Tell me, what did you do when you got up there? I suppose you're thinking that I killed her. I wouldn't blame you if you did. I don't care much if you do. I've got nothing more... Please, please, Mr. Rooker. I'm sorry. Well, I... I went in and... found her lying there on the floor, dead. Then, like the coward I am, I got scared. How could I explain my being there? So I climbed down again the way I went up and drove back to Quaker Ridge. I suppose you don't believe me. Suppose I say I reserve judgment. Now, will you give me the handkerchief that you took from Louise Mayfield's hand? And you're a wizard. How did you know that? It's obvious. I suppose that you took it as a remembrance of her. Yes, I, I did. It was the last thing she'd touched. Here it is. Madam Thank Story, you. Madam Story, could you come into the office a moment? Certainly, Bella. We'll continue this talk later, Mr. Rowcliffe. Will you excuse me now, please? So this letter was pushed under the door. Did you open it, Bella? No. I saw it was addressed to Louise Mayfield, so I called you. I see. Hmm, it's postmark Briarcliff. Here's a notation on the envelope in pencil. <laughs> Not a very literate correspondent, Bella. <laughs> If you want to buy any more info about this letter, we can make a deal. I'll drop around at 11. Well, we have long to wait. Now, let's read the letter. Darling, I can hardly wait till Tuesday night when I'll see you again. I'm moving heaven and earth to arrange things so we'll be together for always. All my love, dear. It's signed J. J? That must be Jack Rowcliffe. In the light of what we know of their relationship, does it sound like Jack Rowcliffe? No, that's stupid of me. 
but the initial. It could be the J stands for John, Peter... Peter John Kruger. Uh -huh. This must be our mysterious correspondent now. Come in. Well, ladies, there I am. Johnny on the spot, like I says. You know your business? You're the Kruger chauffeur, aren't you, Mr. Rowe? Uh... Gargan's the name. Chauffeur and bodyguard. I'm sure you're efficient in both departments, Mr. Gargan. But uh, why the bodyguard? Well, it's like this. The Krugers are important people, see? Mm -hmm. They're likely to be bothered by cranks and other undesirable citizens, get it? They need protection. And I'm the guy that can protect them. Yes, I can see that, Gargan. But now, um, about this letter. Yeah, that's right. Well, do I sing or don't I? That depends on your song, Gargan. First, tell me. How did you manage to get hold of this letter? Well, it's like this. I always get the mail, see? And I always deliver it. But yesterday, Mrs. Kruger and the old dame are with me. I go in and get the mail, and I look through it to see if there's something for me. And I seize this letter. Well, when I come out to the car, Mrs. Kruger says, give me the mail. I hand it to her. And when I get it back, this letter ain't with the others. Well, I don't think much about it till last night when this Mayfield dame has bumped off. Then I begin to smell a rat. And this morning, I did a little mooching around. And here it is. Very graphic, Gargan. How's that? Oh, skip it. Now, um, what further information have you to give us, Gargan? I can tell you who sent that letter to the Mayfield Dame. So? How much? Half a G. Five hundred dollars? That's an expensive song, Gargan. Ah, nuts. You can put it on the expense account. You're right. Nuts it is. The five hundred dollars are yours. Thanks. Here you are. Now... Who sent this letter to Louise Mayfield? Well, it was the one... Oh, Gargan. Madam Story, is he dead? Yes. The shot came through that window. But why? To keep him from telling us who sent that letter to Louise. Help me put him in that closet over there. Frizik, I won't let you. You can't. You've got to report it. If I report it now, the police would interfere with all my plans. I need 24 hours. You're risking your reputation. We've taken risks before. But this is concealing a murder. Why do you need 24 hours? To learn the secret of this, Bella. Why... Well, that's one of Mrs. Kruger's handkerchiefs. No, Bella. It's the handkerchief. The one Rokecliffe found on Louise Mayfield's body. I'm staking my reputation on this little scrap of lace. Madam Story, Potter is back. Oh, that's good, Bella. Did he bring back the handkerchief from the laboratory report? Yes, here they are. Hmm. Just as I thought. Oh, what a horrible use for such a lovely thing. This handkerchief was the murder weapon, Bella. But how could it have been? Because our murderer knew that Louise Mayfield used gardenia toilet water. But can we find out who sent it? I rather think we can. Bella, get those four lace handkerchiefs that Suzanne got for me for Mrs. Kruger. What are you going to do now? Now, my dear Bella, I'm going out to present a noose to a murderer. <laughs> Mr. Rowcliffe, I wanted to return this handkerchief to you for safekeeping. I'll want it back tomorrow morning. I don't know how at present. But I feel this handkerchief will be the means of proving who killed Louise Mayfield. So, guard it carefully. Well, I'll do that. You can depend on me, Madam Story. Thank you, Mr. Rowcliffe. Miss McPeak, the greatest proof that I'm not against you is that I'm going to ask you to keep this handkerchief for me. The most important piece of evidence I have. I have no assurance the murderer would not kill me to get it back. But it would never be supposed that I'd given it to you to guard. Will you keep it for me until tomorrow morning? No, don't worry. I'll keep it safe. Thank you, Miss McPeak. <laughs> Mrs. Kruger, what I came to see you... What? No, it's not. It's the handkerchief. It's the one that was sent to Louise Mayfield. Where'd you get it? Well, I can't tell you that now, but I'm afraid it was the cause of her death. Oh, how horrible. What I'm going to ask you to do is to hold it for me just until tomorrow morning. <laughs> Mr. 
dig on. You can help. What is the real situation, Madam Story? Oh, I wish I knew. I suspect, but I have no proof. I can go no further without the assistance from the chemists. Whom do you suspect? Oh, you know. I'm afraid I do. Well, what I want you to do is to keep this dreadful handkerchief for me until tomorrow morning. <laughs> Mrs. Kruger, I've asked you, Miss de Guion, Miss McPeak, and Mr. Rowcliffe to meet me here this morning in order that we may determine who murdered Louise Mayfield. Why, what do you mean? You, you know, Madam Story? You, you know who killed her? I believe I do, Mrs. Kruger, but I hope to prove it. I know that lace handkerchief was sent to her through the mail was the murder weapon. Perhaps that can tell us something. May I have the handkerchief, please? Why, certainly. Sure, oh, my Oh, here you are. Why, I thought... I it... don't understand. Oh, I say, what is this? So, a trick. That's right, Miss McPeak, a trick. But one only a guilty person need fear. Guilty? But oh, really, I'm Madam Story, I don't understand. Yes, yes, Madam Story. Please take the handkerchiefs one at a time. Mark each in pencil with the initials of the person from whom you receive it. May I have the handkerchiefs, please? Yes, yes, one at a time. Well, yes. all right. Now, Bella... Spread them out on your desk with the initials turned face down. As you probably surmise, none of you had the original handkerchief. That has never left my possession. Here it is. But I don't understand. This handkerchief in my hand is impregnated with a deadly poison. When moistened with alcohol, it releases a lethal gas which is instantly fatal. May I remind you that perfume is 90% alcohol. And a young girl about to go out on a romantic tryst would inevitably moisten it with perfume. How horrible. Yes, Mr. Guion, I agree with but, you. But surely you don't suspect any of us. Why not, Miss McPeak? I found that a murderer is usually actuated by fear. Fear of what the victim might do to them. All of you face that fear as far as Louise Mayfield was concerned. But one of you feared so deeply that you dared risk murder to protect what you had. You feared loss of position, prestige, supplanting by a younger, more attractive girl, loss of all that had made life worth living. That one person alone knew what the fatal handkerchief contained. I gave each one of you what you thought was that handkerchief. I was curious to see what disposition you would make of the evidence. Bella. Yes? Please examine those four handkerchiefs carefully. And when you've done that, tell me if any of them are changed since they left our hands last evening. Yes. This one has been washed. Washed? Well, I don't understand. Read the initials on it. T. D. E. G. Teresa. Teresa! Keep away from that. Keep away from me, I say. Keep away from me. I'll shoot. Why? Ah! Karen. She shot herself. Oh. It's all my fault. Poor Teresa. Poor thing. She, she was all she... She couldn't stand it. She, she just couldn't stand it. No, Mrs. Kruger. It wasn't your fault. It was better so. The end of a passing world. Exit an era. You have been listening to Murder Clinic. Clinic, the WOR Mutual Series, which brings you each week one exciting case, one member from the select band of the world's great detectives. Next week, Murder Clinic will bring you Sir Henry Merivale, known to his host of admirers as H.M., in Death in the Dressing Room. This famous detective 
finds a brilliantly clever pickpocket and discovers an even more clever murderer. Tonight's detective was Madame Rosica's story, played by Elizabeth Morgan. Original music was composed by Ralph Barnhart and conducted by Bob Stanley. This program was an international exchange feature over the coast-to-coast -coast network of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Tales told on Murder Clinic are adaptations by authors Lee Wright and John A. Bassett. Murder Clinic is produced under the direction of Alvin Flanagan. Frank Knight speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Sometimes you feel a bit nutty, especially if you're a weirdo. If that feeling transfers to your taste buds as well, I've got some great news for you. Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy Coffee. Wrap your taste buds around this medium dark roast blend with shrouds of almond, honey, and chocolate. Each bag of Nutty Mummy is exclusive to Weird Darkness and is roasted to order, then bandaged, I mean bagged, specifically for you to ensure maximum freshness for you, your mummy, and anyone else you share it with. Entomb your old coffee and bring your taste buds back from the dead with Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. No, don't make me... I say yes. It's got to be. And now and here, she's got to die. Betty. I say yes. Here. I'll hold her arm. All right, Betty, but... No, 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 don't! I don't want to die! Midnight. The witching hour when the night is darkest. Our fears the strongest. And our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight, when the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in Nightmare. <laughs> Midnight, Tales of Mystery and Terror by Radio's Masters of the Macabre. Our story by Joseph Ruskall is one of the most terrifying and fantastic nightmares we've ever heard. Its title, Nightmare. What do you suppose? It's almost 12 o'clock. Mm. I, I wish you'd let me get some sleep. Mm. Oh, thank heaven. Oh, it was... must have been just a dream. Oh, thank the Lord. Oh, 
Ernie, it was so real. I dreamed somebody was leaning over me just now with a pillow. Oh, it was horrible. They were trying to smother me to death. And, and Ernie... Yeah? It was you. What? Oh, 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 that's a beaut. Now, where's the light? Oh, my goodness, you bad boy. What are you poor, foolish little... Come here, Butch. I'll kiss you back. No, no, don't touch me. Keep away. Huh? What is this? That pillow in your hand. Oh, for crying out, Bells. Can't I even straighten it out? Oh, sorry, dear. Gee, don't mind me, but that, that horrible nightmare, it seems so real. Oh, darling, wasn't that crazy? You, the sweetest, gentlest husband in the world. Well, then why... Oh, Ernie, now please, don't look so hurt. Now I can't even look hurt. I just murdered my wife in her sleep, didn't I? No, you were just about to. I need... I... Oh, no, what the... Everything's happening tonight. <laughs> Hello. What? Who? Wrong number. And what's more, this is a heck of a time to be ringing. Why, what a nerve. <laughs> On a night. Thought maybe that was the police you phoned in your dream. Uh, now will you go to sleep? Ernie Kraft, I'm sure I didn't mean to insinuate anything. I was just telling you my dream. You asked, didn't you? Oh, you're a character. I guess I'll have to put you in that book I never wrote, too. <gasps> well, now what? That was in it, too. Huh? That book you never wrote. You nagged about it so much, no wonder. Oh, and that look when you bent over me like a madman. Oh. Ernie, what on earth do you suppose made me have a nightmare? That's easy. You would insist on eating hamburgers after the show tonight. Yes, I did, didn't I, when we got out of the movies. Hamburgers, of course. Ernie, they were part of my dream, too. Hamburgers. Oh. Ernie, stop punching on that pillow, please. All right, all right. Go ahead, then. Better tell me your dream, all of it. Neither of us will sleep until you do. I'll just light this butt. There. There. Now, let's have it. Some gruesome details. Well, I don't know if I can remember now. It was all so hazy and terrifying. Well, what happened before I smothered you with a pillow? A crazy quilt. Something about your job, and I was a millstone around your neck, and hamburgers, and you hated me, and July 15th. July 15th? Yes, I can't imagine what that meant. Look, look, start at the start. Why did I decide to murder you? Because of that other woman, your secret love. Huh? You promised her you'd kill me tonight when I was asleep. My secret love? Yes, she had you in her spell. Oh, that's kind of bad casting, isn't it, Butch? I'm the dishes and dustpan type, remember? In the five years we've been married, have I ever looked I at know, another... I know, I know. I told you it was a crazy dream. Maybe you want me to eliminate my one night a week out, too. My Saturday gin rummy with the boys. Oh, no. Uh, who was my secret love? Did she uh, have a face? <laughs> well, this is the silliest part of it, Ernie. It's absolutely ridiculous. It was that girl, Betty Daniels. Betty Daniels? Yeah. Who's she? You remember that tall, dark-haired artist I introduced you to at Cape Cod last summer? Cape Cod? At the exhibition. No, I don't... Oh, wait a minute. Trousers, <laughs> long cigarette holder, yeah. very intense. Yes, very intense. But what the devil... What was she doing in your dream? We said hello to her, we walked off, and that was that. Uh, casual. Yes, I know. I hardly remember myself. I can't imagine why I dreamt of her. Why? No, 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 don't touch me. Don't. No. Oh, that dream, that awful dream. So crazy. And yet it seemed to be telling me something, warning me. Strange and weird. You know how dreams are. First thing I remember is Provincetown and us looking at the art exhibition just the way we did last summer. Only now the picture was about ten feet tall and hanging crooked. And then she came along. Betty Daniels. Just the way she did then. Hello, Helen. And I introduced you the same as I did then. Only not exactly the same. 
Like in a dream. You know, silly. Betty Daniels, this is my husband, Ernest. He is very faithful to me. How do you do? How do you do? We've never met. That's a marvelous Gloria painting, Helen, don't you think? Or do you prefer hamburgers? Well, I... My wife prefers hamburgers, Miss Daniels. Oh. Oh, I didn't know. Only after a movie, though. Anyway, I'm sure I can't tell one painting from another. My husband's the art lover in the family, I guess. And I just tag along for the fish. Only I don't like fish. I like hamburgers. I know. You don't wear trousers like I do. You're... fluffy. Betty and I met on the beach here, and she's a painter. Our rowboats got tangled. That's how we met. Yes, it was all very casual. I hardly remember. Well, well. Ernie and I are going back to New York today. Isn't that a shame? I wish you two wouldn't stare at each other so. Well, we better run along, Helen. Lots of packing to do. Ernie has got to get back to his silly old job. He's a reporter. A reporter? Shouldn't he write a book he never wrote? Well, imagine. That's what he always says. Well, goodbye. I'm wondering why I'm thinking of you now. Goodbye. 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 The scenes sort of dissolve into each other Like a kind of dream movie And I'm trembling with fright Because I have a feeling I know how the plot's going to end The next thing I remember, Ernie I'm in a penthouse apartment on Park Avenue Everything zigzag, even the butler And I'm the maid, Helen, there And what I'm doing is turning pages for Betty Daniels While she plays the piano For you, Ernie Isn't that crazy? Neither of you hardly notice me at all And I keep trying to open my mouth uh, uh, Like that but it's stuck, and I'm absolutely frozen at what I overhear. Darling. Yes, Butch. Love our love mess. Out of this world. Ah, this is heaven. Ernie, do you ever call your wife Butch? Never. What gave you that idea? I hate the very sight of her. She's really a little ignoramus. You're telling me she prefers hamburgers. Ernie, do you think she suspects yet? Of course not. She thinks I'm at a gin rummy game. Darling, you're blind, but she's not. She knows. She knows? How... How'd she find out? You may go, Helen. Helen, do you hear me? Why don't you go? Answer me. Have you lost her tongue? Oh, well, there's murder in the air. How'd she find out, Betty? Tell me. Darling, do you suppose she doesn't know what happened last summer in Provincetown? After we all said goodbye, you came to look for your cigarette lighter. She knew you hadn't lost your lighter, that you'd come back to ask me for my New York telephone number. Uh, 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 she knew? Of course, intuition. She knows we've been having a secret affair ever since. Uh, 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 I can't go on like this. I'm tired of being just a gin rummy excuse. Ernie, if you love me, you... You'll do what I promised. But I pity her so. Don't be a fool. Isn't it her fault you never wrote that book you never wrote? It's true. She wouldn't let me give up my job. She's a millstone around my uh, neck. Uh, and get rid of her, Ernie. Get rid of her and I'll bring your genius to the world. I've plenty of money and you can, you can give up reporting and write that book. Fulfill your destiny. Fulfill my destiny. Oh, Betty, you'll help me. Yes. But only forget July 15th. You'll forget about July 15th. It won't mean a thing to you from now on. Not a thing. I promise. And you'll do away with her. The way I told you. Yes. Like you told me. The pillow. The pillow. Uh, 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 Don't let her hear. Just look at her standing there at the piano. You've been spying on us, Helen, haven't you? Haven't you? Answer. Have you lost your tongue? Oh, don't try to fool us. We know you're the real Helen and, and not the maid. She's heard everything we've said, Ernie. So we'll have to kill her now. Unless, unless she gives me a divorce. Will you give him a divorce? Answer or we'll finish you right now. Hey, well. Here's the pillow, honey. Right now. I'll hold her on. Answer, Helen. Don't make me do it. Answer, Helen. I pity you, but I hate you. Let her cry. Look at her. Trick and dumb. Her mouth moving, but she's not saying anything. What are you trying to say? Helen, please don't make me do it. Will you give me a divorce? Tell me. Tell me. Ernie! Ernie, stop! Fools we are. Do you want her body found here? My hand, boy. She's got to die. She's got to No, no, not here. Not like this. There must be some other way. 
Later tonight, Ernie, after the movies. Hamburgers. She'll get hungry for hamburgers. She's bound to. The waiter will ask her how she wants them. That'll give you the clue. And then, when she's asleep... <laughs> and they'll find her in her bed. <laughs> the perfect crime. Don't you see, Ernie? Hamburgers. A frightened girl reliving a dream that was more terrible than any reality. A dream that could even become more terrible. As the clock on the mantle takes on, and the hands draw closer to 12 o'clock and... Murder! At midnight! <laughs> Back to Murder at Midnight and Nightmare. Well, let's hear the rest of this dream of yours, Helen. What happened after that? Well, it was after that that it really got bad. It was so crazy, but so real. I don't know what stopped you, Ernie. Kept you from killing me then, but you didn't. And still, I knew you were going to. You dragged me out into the street and then into a movie and then out again. And I looked at you, and you were crying because you'd made up your mind to finish me off when we got home. You should have let me write that book, Helen. You should have. And I kept crying, I love you, Ernie. Don't kill me, please. Don't kill me tonight. But I've got to. I've got to. I pity you, but I've got to. And you pulled me along through the streets again. I was terrified. And then I saw a policeman, and I cried to him, Officer! Yes? What is it, lady? Please save me. My husband here wants to kill me. Oh, who wants to kill you? Eh? <laughs> Why, that's a crime. <laughs> a felony. Oh, why are you joking? Don't joke about it. Do something, please. I'm frightened to death. Don't pay any attention to her, officer. She's dreaming. I'm not. Don't believe him. He wants to wait till I go to sleep tonight. And then as soon as I fall asleep... Oh, I'm come gonna... now, lady. He wouldn't do it to you in your sleep. Why, you're cute. Not in her sleep now, would you, mister? Of course not, officer. Not in her sleep. As a matter of fact, we're stopping off first for a hamburger. She's hungry. No, 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 I'm not. I mean, I am, but I don't dare. I'm starving, but I don't dare. He's just waiting for me to order one, officer, to see what I'll say. And then he'll take me home and kill me. Oh, 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 oh. lady, stop. Sure, and you're breaking me hard. <laughs> Come along, dear. No, no, officer, please protect me. Don't let him take me. Please. Come along, I say, darling. And then we were in the little lunchroom in our neighborhood, around the corner from our house, sitting on stools. The counter man came over to us. He winked at you, Ernie, and you winked back at him, and he said... Evening, folks. What do you have? You looked at me, but I shook my head. I shook my head and the tears were streaming down my face. I tell you what, Joe. Make it two hamburgers. <laughs> right. Rare, medium, or well? Medium, Joe. Make mine medium. Right. And the little lady? How do you have yours, Helen? How do you like yours? <laughs> Make hers medium, too. Joe. Two hamburgers. Medium. Two medium. Come on out. And what do you have on them, folks? Relish or onion? Relish. Make mine with relish, Joe. Right. And the little lady? The man's talking to you, Helen. How will you have yours? Answer him, I say. Answer him. This is it. How will you have yours? No, I won't tell him. If I do, you'll know. You'll know how to do it. So I won't tell him. I won't. The next thing I dreamt, we were home again. Sitting in the parlor, everything exactly the same, Ernie, just like tonight before we went to bed. But in my dream, I was sitting paralyzed, in a cold sweat, waiting for the word. The word from you that meant my death. Oh, well, Butcher, I guess we better hit the hay. What do you say? What do you say, darling? No, uh... Wait, I, uh... Ernie... Did I tell that counterman how I wanted my hamburgers, sir? Did of course, I... dear. What did I say? 
I can't seem to remember. Oh, I forget to come along to bed. No, no, I don't want to go to bed yet. Please don't make me go to bed. I'm scared. Helen. <laughs> come to bed, darling. Like a good little girl. Hmm? We went to bed. And then you said... And now, lights out, eh? I tried to think of everything I knew to keep awake. I wondered whether I ought to count to a hundred, or whether counting would put me to sleep. I tried not to count, but I felt myself getting sleepier and sleepier. Asleep, honey? I heard, but I pretended not to. I fought to keep my eyes open. I knew I would die if I closed them. Asleep, Butch? I didn't answer. I couldn't if I wanted to. I was so scared. And then pretty soon I heard you stirring ever so quietly. And in a moment you were leaning over me. Oh, Ernie, I know it was just a dream, but it was so real. And there was hatred in your eyes, and there was a pillow in your hand, and I knew you were going to do it right then, and I... Oh, 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 that's a beautiful that's a honey. Oh, my aching back. Darling, when you have a nightmare, you sure do it up golden brown and crazy. <laughs> Wasn't it crazy? <laughs> Oh, darling, wasn't it, Matt? Oh, 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 wait till I tell it around the office tomorrow. Oh, 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 oh this is too good, Jim. But, Ernie, how does a person have a horrible dream like that? What does it mean? Oh, it's a cinch. I'll interpret it for you. And without a dream book, you too. You will? Well, go on, then, Ernie. Tell me. Okay, then, here it is. First of all, a dream always means the opposite, right? Did you ever hear that? Yes, I have. That's right, it does. Which means I must love you simply awful. Granted? <laughs> <laughs> Granted, silly. But goodness, what about the rest of it? Easiest thing in the world. Darling, where'd we go tonight? To a movie. What kind of a movie? It was a, a murder story. Gee, that's right. Do you think that was... Now, don't interrupt, Butch. Who was starring in the movie? Betty Davis. Repeat the first name. Betty. And the villainous in the dream, my secret love, the girl we met last summer, was also Betty. Betty... Daniel. Oh! Well, that gave you Betty on the brain when you went to sleep tonight and movies and murder and those hamburgers you did stop to eat after the show wrapped up the whole sequence. And no wonder, they're still lying on my stomach, too. <laughs> well, what was the pillow doing in it? Sweetness and life, what were you talking about early this evening? That chore you intend to get after someday? Oh, yes, I've got to stuff the pillows. They're caved in the way the feathers have come up. Right, that's your pillow you had on the brain, which uh, which brings me back to the hamburgers. Yes, I was going to ask you, I mean, that nonsense of how did I want my hamburgers, what did all that mean, for heaven's sake? Precious, how did you order your hamburgers done tonight? Remember? No, I can't recall. Oh, of course you can. Think now. How do you almost always order your hamburgers? Well, smothered in onions. Oh, Ernie, of course. Smothered in onions. Smother, pillow, smother with a pillow. <laughs> Jack. Oh, my heaven's sakes alive. Oh, my gosh. So that was it. <laughs> oh, if that doesn't be... Ernie, that was wonderful. Really. The way you did that, figured that all out. I think you'd make a terrific detective. Yeah, so I'm a police reporter. Close enough. <laughs> Darling, it's made me think so. But maybe I have been a little bit selfish. What do you mean? Well, that book you always wanted to write. Maybe I ought to, to let you give up your job and try. Oh, and have us both starve? Nuts. Anyway, in my sane moments, Helen, I've always known the truth. I'm no writer. If I had it in me, it would have come out of me. Job or no job. I could go back to work again, you know. I could take up nursing again. It was pretty hard, no, but no, I... No, no, nonsense. It won't happen. I won't say any more about it, and that's fine. You're a swell guy, though, Butch. Go off or two. Oh, there was one thing more, Ernie. Hmm? Yeah? What do you suppose that was... That was all that about July 15th, about you're forgetting July 15th. What did that mean, you know? Yes. Don't you? No, I can't. It does seem familiar, but I can't seem to... Where are you going? Get something out of my wallet. Wait a minute. 
What's the date of our anniversary, Helen? Hmm? Oh, uh, July 15th, of course. Tomorrow. What was that? Right. You've had that on the brain, too. Oh. Here. Little present for you, darling. Oh, what on earth? Tickets. Two railroad tickets to Montreal. Right again. We're taking an anniversary trip. I wanted to surprise you when you woke up, but... Well, anyway, happy anniversary, baby. Oh, Ernie. Oh, you great big precious darling. How can I ever... You didn't forget. You always did before, but this time you didn't. Yes, yes. First that dream and then finding out that it did me just the opposite. No, 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 Helen, don't. It's don't. so sweet of you. I'm so thrilled. Montreal, where we had our honeymoon and you haven't forgotten. Oh, Ernie, I, I do hope I've been a good wife to you. And if there's anything I ever... I mean, if you want me to, I can always change. Oh, darling, I wouldn't want you any different for the world. I want you to stay just the same sweet little girl I married. And now, let's get some shut-eye, huh? Lights out? All right. And I'm going to put the tickets right here under the pillow. And have a happy dream for a change. <sighs> Good night, Butch. You haven't kissed me? Mm-hmm. Good night, dear. <laughs> Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader.
Remember staying up late at night while growing up, watching your local TV station's horror host presenting a terrible B-horror movie or So Bad It's Good sci-fi flick from the 1950s? That's what the Monster Channel at WeirdDarkness.tv has to offer – all day, every day. You can visit WeirdDarkness.tv and immediately be entertained by a horror host and horrible movie. You can even invite your friends to watch with you and use the chat feature to talk about what you're watching. And our monthly Weirdo Watch Party takes place there as well. Get your frights and funnies 24-7, 365 at WeirdDarkness.tv. Orson Welles, speaking from London. The Black Museum. Here in the grim stone structure on the Thames which houses Scotland Yard is a warehouse of homicide, where everyday object – a magazine, a cigarette lighter, a student's lamp, a paperweight – all are touched by murder. <laughs> Here's a letter. It's a familiar object, handwritten on a good bond paper, no imprint on the top, merely a date, a simple single initial for the signature. Do you notice the same thing about this letter that I do, sir? Rather a well-formed handwriting? More than that. This letter was written by an educated person, a very well-educated person. But for what a purpose? Now, today, that letter can be seen in the Black Museum. From the annals of the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Police, we bring you the dramatic stories of the crimes recorded by the objects in Scotland Yard's Gallery of Death, the Black Museum. <laughs> Museum. Scotland Yard's Museum of Murder. Yes, interred in this place are countless memories represented by the objects on these shelves and these cabinets. Memories of terror, horror, and the night of the ultimate cruelty between man and man, the killing of one human being by another. Yes, here lies death. In serried, endless ranks, pitiful instruments. Not only guns and knives and poisons and the cords of the garroters, but the simple things, spoons and cups and even, yes, here, for instance, is a baby's pacifier, complete with the ivory ring. It's horrible, isn't it? Because dropped in a bedroom, it led to a woman who was a nurse. Dropped in a bedroom, took that woman up to the 13 steps to a hangman's noose. Here's the letter. The letter I told you about. The letter of today's story. This one begins innocently enough in a bank. As a man steps to a teller's window. Can you cash this for me, please? Do we not, sir? I have an account here. You can check the signature. Uh, yes, sir. That'll take just a moment. So normal, so much in the ordinary course of daily business. The cashier goes to the files, compares the signature and the check with that on file, returns to his wicket. Everything seems to be in order, sir. How do you wish the money? Two fives, the rest in one pound notes. Very well. Uh, there you are, sir. If you'll count. The customer counts the bills nods that they come to the proper amount and walks away out of the bank. A week or so later, in the office of the manager of that bank... Of course, we understand how you feel, Mr. Holt. Mm. The cashier in question will be here in just a moment. One would expect a bank to protect a depositor with more care. Three forged checks, each one successively larger. Apparently, the forger felt himself safer each time. Apparently. If I hadn't requested my statement and the voucher ahead of time this month... This might have gone on almost indefinitely. Mr. Holt drums his fingers angrily on the manager's desk. Both men sit silently, awaiting the arrival of the cashier. You sent for me, sir? Uh, yes, Hollingsworth. Uh, your initials are on these three vouchers. Do you remember the man who cashed these? Yes, sir. Uh, quiet thought. Very dark. It seemed on the tallish side. Nothing at all like the gentleman sitting here. Oh, not at all. Ah, I see. Well, this gentleman is Mr. Holt. <clears throat> but... But I compared the signatures, sir. Our usual routine. 
Is this a case for the police? Huh? It certainly is. And I intend to see to it that the police find the perpetrator of this forgery. Forgery. Apparently quite a clever job of it. After all, the cashier did compare the signatures, and the cashier was honest. No question about that. What then did Scotland Yard have to say about it? May I ask, Mr. Holt, if you've written any letters recently to anyone you don't know? I'm a solicitor, Inspector. I have a great deal of correspondence. Of course. Let me ask you something else. Have you made any debt collections within, say, the past six weeks? Well, now, let me think. Yes, there was that Mr. Arthur. He'd had a bit of a difficulty with Mr. Harris. Asked me to write a letter. Uh, a lawyer's letter, you understand, Inspector. Yes, of course. Go on, sir. I wrote the letter. Mr. Harris paid his debt at once. About 50 pounds it was. I deducted the usual fee and remitted the balance to Mr. Arthur, that was all. But you signed the letter yourself? Of course. It's not a new trick, but it's been used quite often lately. I read it and follow, Inspector. That's how the forger obtained your signature to trace or copy. What? But that's... Quite simple? Yes. And the chances are that neither your Mr. Arthur, whom you saw, nor Mr. Harris, whom you did not see, neither one of them was a forger, as we've come to call him. Then you had similar cases? Many of them. And no trace of the culprit? Never a trace, nor any link. He knows what he's doing, this fellow. Clever, in a diabolical sort of way. Clever, in a diabolical sort of way. Well, you can fight this sort of cleverness with only two weapons. Patience and vigilance. Sergeant Berkey of the yard was both patient and vigilant. Stationed in a bank as one of the searches for the forger. The sergeant heard... Will you cash this, please? The name is Forsyth. Beg pardon? Aren't you James Olsey? My name is Forsyth. Sorry, I saw you identified in the Mason case. Your name is Olsey. I'll have to ask you to come with me. I could the enter. sergeant took Mr. Halsey to the yard. There, Inspector Dodson proceeded to the questioning. You knew that check was a forgery, didn't you, Halsey? No, sir, I didn't. I see. You were just doing a busy man a favor, running to the bank to cash a check for him. That's it. Exactly right, Inspector. He promised me half a quid. He did for me trouble. I can hardly believe that. You, with your record, trusted like that? Some folks trust me. No doubt. Any questions, Sergeant? Yes, sir. Look here, Halsey. Where were you supposed to deliver the money? Carter and Company Limited, Queensbury Building, to Mr. Forsyth. Same name as was on that check. That's all I know. Except I'm out half a quid and in trouble besides. No use, Sergeant. There'll be no Forsyth of Carter and Company. Let this fellow go. He's telling the truth for once. The man we want is the porter. Another blank. No link to the man whose mind was planning all this cleverness. Of course, they did learn one more fact about his operation. <laughs> Just before we close the file, I think we might check up and see if we can learn anything from the real Mr. Forsyth. Yes? Yeah? Oh, uh, I'm a police officer. My credentials, ma'am. Oh, I expect you want to be my husband. Well, if you please, ma'am, we're making a few inquiries. Yes, come in. Thank you. We've had nothing but visits from the police ever since this forgery business. As if it wasn't bad enough already with the burglary last month and all that. What was that? The burglary, did you say, ma'am? That's right. Here's a policeman to see you, dear. Oh, good evening. What can I do to help you? Oh, I think your wife has already supplied the answer to the question I was going to ask you, Mr. Forsyth. I understand you had a burglary last month. That's right, but there was nothing much stolen, just a few trinkets, nothing valuable. Oh, anything else? Why, yes. Don't remember, dear. They took your checkbook. Oh, yes, yes. Rather silly thing to do. No, sir. Not so silly as you'd think. Now, here are the particulars, sir. Thank you. Have you compared them with the information we have already on the forgery case? Yes, sir. The check that Halsey tried to cash came from the stolen book. Who was this forger? This mind which covered all trails to itself? Somewhere, somehow... The correct thread, which would lead to the center of his web, must be picked up somewhere. I believe some money has been placed to my credit here from my bank in London. 
The name is Harrison. Charles Harrison. I'll see Mr. Harrison. Just a moment, please. You know how this is done, of course. You deposit money in one bank in, say, London. Notice the draft is sent at the depositor's request to a branch of the same bank in another city. You arrive in that city, identify yourself, and receive your money. Usually it's a fair amount. Too large to travel with. How much is this draft in your sir? Two hundred and fifty pounds. The amount's correct. It was deposited in our London office by Mr. Harris Thompson. That's right. With instructions to pay to him in person. I'm here. You wish identification? I have it. But you're Mr. Harrison. Charles Harrison. You said so a moment ago. I'm Harris Thompson. I see. Perhaps the London branch made a mistake. I'll get in touch with them and come back tomorrow. Sorry to have bothered you. I caught your signal, Bartley. There's something wrong. That fellow there, sir. Just going out the door. Gave me two different names while he was trying to collect on this car. Some kind of swindle. I can't say, sir. The order came down from London in perfectly good order. There are 250 pounds up there. It, uh, well, it, it's a bit strange. And he behaved oddly. Gave his name as Harrison. It was quite simple. Quite simple, really. Money had been deposited in London. A man who was to draw it in Yarmouth would thereby acquire the appearance and reputation of wealth and honesty. When he returned with a new forged draft, it would be honored. A neat scheme. But the fellow mixed up the names. The Yarmouth Bank reported to the yard. Inspector Dodson came calling. We'll get out a pickup order. It might be well worth our while to talk with this Harrison Thompson, whatever his name is. Yes? Does Mr. Harris Thompson live here? What name? Harris Thompson. No, just live here. Oh, that's a pity. I had something for him. Oh, what was that? Something important. Could you leave it? Well, no, I've got to give it to him in person. Uh, confidential, you see. Oh, well, wait a minute. Yes? What do you want? Are you Mr. Harris Thompson? Who are you? Never mind who I am, Mr. Harris Thompson. I have a warrant for your arrest. My name isn't Harris Thompson. That's something we know already, Mr. Rafe. All right, Rafe. You tripped yourself. You know that now. My name is Harris Thompson. Stop it, Rafe. Your fingerprints are in file and criminal records. We know your name. My name is Harris Thompson. It'll go a lot easier with you if you admit the truth. My name is Harris Thompson. And that's all you'll say? My name is... All right. We've heard it before. Lock him up, Sergeant. The charge will be attempted fraud and last. Come along, Rafe. With Rafe Harrison Thompson safely away in the Yarmouth jail, Inspector Dodson, in company with several Yarmouth policemen and the manager of the bank, visited the man's lodging. I must say, Inspector, when you search a place, you are quite thorough. Just routine, sir. Does this make any sense to you? Dear friend, there is no doubt your error at the bank, while understandable, was quite grave. However, I expect to rectify it shortly. The bank has requested that Mr. Thompson come there personally to sign a new bit of paper, giving Mr. Harrison permission to withdraw the money in Yarmouth. I will explain later exactly what I want you to do. In the meanwhile, do not come up to London. Caution has always been and always will be my watchword. Trust me, sincerely your J. While this fellow is describing our regular procedure where identification is in doubt. I see. Do you notice the same thing about this letter that I do, sir? Rather a well-formed handwriting. More than that, this letter was written by an educated person. A very well-educated person. But for what a purpose? Yes, the phrasing is simple, but the words he uses, it's, it's a little difficult to understand, isn't it? Why someone with education would involve himself in something like this? Well, when we find Jay, we may have an answer to that. In the meantime, I think we may have our first direct link to the forger. Well, today, as I told you, that self-same letter can be seen in its place in the Black Museum. in the letter, signed simply J, told nothing new. The manner and style of its writing told many things. This J, possibly the long-sought forger, was a man of education and intelligence. A shadow figure using many other men to further his own designs. 
seemed a kind of devil. But within a very few days, they learned he was at least a man. So my cousin Rafe is in trouble again. Yes, Mrs. Webster, and we would like to know the occasion of his visiting. I haven't seen him in ten years. My own aunt's son, and not in ten years. Most of which he spent commuting back and forth in and out of prison. Why do you suppose he turned up now? He wanted something. First I thought he turned a new leaf, but he wanted something. A convenience. Taken a room in Yarmouth. Would I, he says, receive his mail for him? And you did? Yes, Inspector, I did. May I see whatever you have left of it? I haven't anything. Rafe's friend came and asked for all his mail. His friend? Yes, sir. And how a man like that came to be friends with Rafe, I'll never understand. Well-dressed, nice-looking, and with a real refined manner. Could you describe this man, Mrs. Webster? I had a good look at him. Even talked to him. Fair as she was. Brown hair, nice blue eyes. About, well, my husband's size, and he's five foot eight. Weighs about 170 pounds. A nice mouth. And I'll wager his hands never held a pick or shovel. The second link, a description. Apparently a man of some means. Not particularly individualized, of course, but still, he was someone who could identify this Jay when he'd been found. As for Rafe, his fate was settled quickly. Rafe Martin... You have been convicted of fraud, attempted fraud, and conspiracy to commit fraud. Have you anything to say before sentence is pronounced? What for, your lordship? Your mind's made up. Nothing I will say can change it. Very well. As you seem to be the dupe of someone with a great deal more intelligence than yourself, I've been tempted to lighten your punishment. However, your intransigent attitude toward the law enforcement officers in this case, your attitude in court... And your past record removed all such temptations. You are about to be committed to prison for the maximum time the law allows. Twenty years hard labor. That is all. An underling, a dupe, went to prison. Shortly after his arrival there, Dodmer... Rafe had a visitor in his cell. Surprised, Rafe? Only if you were to be my cellmate. Hardly that. But I may have the key which will unlock that door before you expect. I make no deals with coppers. Twenty years is a long time. You'll be an old man when you get out. What of it? In fact, twenty years may be a life sentence for you. Nothing I can do about it, isn't there? I think you know exactly what you can do about it. I don't talk. Your friend Jay didn't help you much in court, did he? Why should he? I don't think you owe him anything. Chances are he had the lion's share of all your little dealings, and now he's free to go right on while you are in here. Think about it, Rafe. If you change your mind, the water... Rafe thought about it. Honor among thieves. Uh, up to a point, perhaps. But the cold, bleak winter of Dartmoor was beyond that point. At least for Rafe. All right, Inspector. But what's in it for me? I think your sentence will be considerably reduced. You were convicted in three counts, Rafe. The time for each might be made to run concurrently instead of consecutively, without too much difficulty. Is it a deal? Well, I can't promise. You know how such things are, Rafe. All right, I'll chance it. <laughs> you never get him otherwise. He's too smart. He's a lawyer. What? That's right. Knows all the ins and outs, he does. Laughs all the time when another fellow's been fooled. <laughs> He's laughing at me right now. You've seen him, then? I've seen him. What's his name? Or don't you know? Oh, I know all right. But he doesn't know I found it out. Followed him home one night. Had his name on his doorbell. I can be bright at times myself. Yes? Mrs. Seaforth? Mrs. Joseph Seaforth? I'm Mrs. Seaforth. Is your husband at home? I'm sorry, no. Would you care to leave your name? We're from Scotland Yard, madam. We have a warrant for your husband's arrest. Arrest? Joe, what can he have done? Well, that's a long story, ma'am. It's taken us quite some time to track him this far. When do you expect him back? That's it, sir. I don't know. He went out of town on business a week ago. I haven't heard from him since. He's never done anything like this before, never. Gone. Joseph Seaforth, the forger, disappeared. But there are certain rules of thumb the police follow in situations like this. 
They know what happens when the wanted notices appear in the post offices all over the country. Now, remember, I want every lead that comes in followed through. We're dealing with a very tricky customer, and every piece of information, however small, may be helpful. Yes, I knew him all right. He used to come into the bar for a drink often enough. He was a real gentleman. Distinguished looking. Oh, have you seen him recently? No, haven't seen him for months. That's his face, all right. Recognize it anywhere. Took a room at our house for a couple of months. Not that we saw much of him. Oh, when did he leave? About six months ago. And you haven't seen him since? No. I know so far we've drawn a blank. But all the same, I'm confident that somewhere, sometime, somebody who's seen that wanted notice is going to meet up with Seaforth again. Hello there, Mr. Seaforth. But uh, my name's not Seaforth. It's Sanders. It's Seaforth, all right. And mine's Alsey. Jack Alsey. One of the fellows you pretty near got into trouble, like you got Rafe Martin into trouble. I'll appreciate it if Don't you... Don't waste your breath. Your picture's up, see? And a right good likeness it is, too. Oh. All right. I am Joseph Seaforth. And now that you know, how do you like to make some money with me? Money? How? Oh, I have a check. Uh, it's a good one. Uh, will you cash it for me? What kind of knock do you think I am? Once burnt, twice shy. That's me every time. <laughs> We've reason to believe, Horsey, that you've seen Seaforth. What if I have, Inspector? We want to know where. Why should I tell you? I would if I were you. We have enough on you to make you rather uncomfortable for a fair amount of time. All right, I saw him in a pub in Whitechapel. He hangs about down there a lot, I hear. Pass the word, Sergeant. We know Seaforth's in Whitechapel somewhere. Circulate his description to all stations. And, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Put the pigeons onto it, Sergeant. They'll know a lot more about him a lot faster than we will. Seaforth seems to frequent two places more than others, Inspector. The Dancing Bear and the Monument. Well, he's getting a trifle careless, isn't he? With all his cleverness, he ought to have known better than that. The search had narrowed now. Two pubs in Whitechapel. The Inspector and Sergeant Berkey dropped in at the Dancing Bear for a quiet pint. Do that again, will you, Landlord? Very well, sir. We seem to be drawing a blank here, Inspector. So far, yes. We'll wait a bit. There you are. Well, there you are. Thank you, sir. By the way, we happen to be waiting for a fellow, perhaps you know him, name of Seaforth. Never heard of him. We don't ask names in here. One man's money is as good as another, as long as you don't cause trouble. That's the only way to stay in business. The inspector and the sergeant finished their ale. They lingered briefly, and then... All right, sergeant. We'll go now. They left. Outside the door, the inspector turned back. Watch the landlord, sergeant, through the window. I see him, sir. He's heading for the back room. Come along, Sergeant, before our man gets out of the back door. The far door, sir. Mm. On the right-hand side. Good enough. Uh, and thanks. I'll be on my way. How are you, Mr. Seaforth? Huh? You're barking up the wrong tree, couple. This man's name is Saunders. Stay out of this, landlord. If you want to stay in business. My name is Saunders. And if you are the police, it's hardly necessary for you to molest decent citizens. It's no good, Seaforth. I think you know that. We have a warrant. And your fingerprints from your own apartment. All right, Seaforth. It's finished now. Perhaps one day you'll tell us why you did it. The law can be very dull. When you know it and turn it on itself, there's excitement of a sort. Perhaps one day you'll tell me how you picked up the proper thread. It doesn't matter very much at the moment. And the silent witness to that whole story is today in the Black Museum. Orson Welles will be back with you in just a moment. The trial of Joseph Seaforth was swift. One somewhat strange incident did occur, strange in the light of the man's background, previous experience. Throughout the trial, he made no effort to defend himself. He seemed quite ready to accept whatever punishment was determined for him. And then, as the judge was about to pronounce sentence, Seaforth requested the record of his case. He wished, he said, to enter objections to what he felt was inadmissible evidence. The judge denied the request on the grounds that the objection should have been made before the verdict was announced. So Joseph Seaforth went to prison for 20 years. And it was never determined why the lawyer in him awoke only when it was too late. And now until next time, till we meet in the same place and I tell you another story about the Black Museum. 
remain as always obediently yours. Do you keep a journal or a diary? If not, maybe you should consider it. It's been shown that journaling can help you reduce stress, help relieve depression, builds self-confidence, it boosts your emotional intelligence, helps with achieving goals, inspires creativity, and more. In fact, my friend S. Ann Lanise has created a Weird Darkness-themed journal just for you, full of blank pages for you to use as a diary, make notes for class or office meetings, jot down ideas for that novel you want to write, use it for keeping a mileage log if you travel for business, whatever you want. In fact, she has numerous styles of journals to choose from. Along with the Weird Darkness journal, there's one for dealing with grief, for teachers' notes, for medical residencies, keeping track of your meds or health routine, and several others. Journals make a great gift for others, but it's also a great gift for yourself and your own mental health. No matter what you might want a journal for, my friend Anne has it, and you can see all of her journals, including the one for Weird Darkness, on the Sponsors and Friends page at WeirdDarkness.com. Inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, and it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable, if you can. Where are we going? Are we going to join Charles Foster as he takes an excursion into crime? I call the story... The Case of Charles Foster. Late one evening several years ago, when I was practicing medicine in a large eastern city, I visited Charles Foster, a friend and patient of mine. I took with me Flush, a cocker spaniel he had entrusted to me. Hello, Doctor. I'm glad you were able to come. I see you brought Flush. Hello, Flush, old boy. He's missed you, Charles. I've missed him too, Doctor. Been quite lonesome without him these past few months. Ah, down, boy. It's a good dog. How do you feel, Charles? Oh, I'm all right, Doctor. You needn't worry about me. I'm glad to hear that. I suppose you've been quite puzzled about everything that's happened these past months. Frankly, Charles, I have. Even now, I find it difficult to believe that you could... Doctor, I'm going to tell you something that I've never told anyone. I thought I'd go to the grave with my secret, but... You know, you've always been friends, and I'd like you to know the truth. As you wish, Charles. It's strange how little people know of one another. For ten years, Agatha and I were married, and to the outside world, we were a happily married couple. But in the privacy of our home, I found life with Agatha a nightmare. I never would have guessed that. For ten years, I stood her sharp tongue and constant nagging. I might have gone on taking it the rest of my life. Fate hadn't decreed otherwise. It was three years ago on a beautiful spring evening that fate stepped in to change the entire course of my life. Is that you, Charles? Yes, Agatha. Did you remember to buy me some more of my cough medicine? Yes, here it is. Supper ready? Some men would be more interested in their wives' health than their own suppers. I'm sorry, Agatha, but you really don't look sick to me. That's because you don't care. I'm not well, and you know it. 
I work myself to death day in and day out keeping this house clean. And little thanks do I get for I've it. I told you before, Agatha, if the house is too much for you, hire a maid. And how exactly can we afford a maid on your miserable bookkeeper's salary? Well, if you can't manage it out of my salary, there's always the $50,000 your father left you. That money is mine. And I'm not spending a single cent of it. It's up to you to provide a maid. All right, Agatha. Please, let's not quarrel. Oh, hello, Flush. How are you, old boy? Oh, you care more about that dog than you do me. You know that isn't true. It is. Sometimes I think the only reason you come home is because of that dirty old dog. Quiet, Get away from me. All he does is eat and put his filthy paws on my furniture. I want you to get rid of that dog, Charles. Get rid of him? Yes. Buy some poison at the drugstore and dispose of him. You can't stand to see me have anything that makes me happy, can you? Well, I'm not getting rid of him. Charles, this is my house, not yours. And I don't want him here. Come on, Flush. <laughs> oh, don't think that by walking away that ends the matter, Charles Foster. You'd better get rid of that dog, do you hear? <sighs> Glad to get out of the house, eh, old boy? Uh, so am I. Uh, it's evening, isn't it? Come on, boy, we're going to take a long walk. Want to turn around and go home now, Flush? <coughs> no, neither do I. Pardon me, but aren't you Charles? Julia! Julia Sanders! Charles, I thought it was you. Oh, let me look at you. Oh, Julia, you haven't changed a bit. You're as lovely as... How long has it been since we last saw each other? Ten years, almost eleven. Has it really been that long? Julia... Have you ever forgiven me for what happened? Of course, Charles. I was so insanely in love with you, Julia, that I couldn't bear to have other men look at you. You you know that I didn't I mean... I know, to... Charles. I've thought of that night constantly. It's been like a nightmare ever since. Please, Charles, it's all past and forgotten now. You were perfectly justified in breaking our engagement. After what I'd done, there was nothing else you could do. I understand you married Agatha Winthrop a year after I'd gone abroad. Yes, Julia. After you left for Europe, people kept telling me well, what a wonderful wife Agatha would make me. I allowed myself to be convinced and married her. Well, I'm sure everything turned out for the best. Oh, but it didn't, Julia. Almost from the beginning, our marriage was a failure. For these past five years, Agatha and I have merely been living together under the same roof. Well, I'm sorry, Charles, that it didn't turn out well. Nothing turned out well, Julia, after I lost you... I hope things have been better with you these past 11 years. Oh, I can't complain. I spent a number of years in Paris studying art and working at dress designing. Oh. I only came back a few months ago. You've uh, never married? No. I'm working now for Morgan's department store as their art director. Oh, really? Well, my, my office is only a few blocks from there. Look, Junior, why don't we have lunch together tomorrow? There are so many things I'd like to know... Well, I'd like to, Charles, but I think it would be much better that we don't. Oh, now, surely, Julia, there's no harm in two old friends having lunch together, is there? No, I suppose not. I won't take no for an answer. Do you know where Drake's restaurant is? Yes. Will one o'clock tomorrow be all right? Yes, that's my usual lunch hour. Good, then it's a date. Strange, isn't it, Doctor? the way after 11 years Julia and I bumped into each other. If we hadn't, what followed would never have happened. It's such small things as an accidental meeting that often change the course of one's life. Yes, I know that now, but I didn't then. I met Julia for lunch the next day, and soon we were having lunch together every day. Mm. And for the first time in years, life began to mean something. Merely seeing Julia for one hour a day made life worth living. I understand, sir. We'd have lunch together, and then we'd go for a walk in the park. I sensed at the time that Julia, too, was lonely and in the need of friendship. The summer passed swiftly and happily. I should have realized that things couldn't go on that way, but I didn't. You mean you fell in love with Julia? Fell in love with her? I don't think I'd ever really stopped loving her. I became aware of how much I really cared for her. One warm, oh, happily. I should have realized that. Julia. 
Yes, Charles? What about going to the theater with me tonight? Oh, I wish you hadn't asked me, Charles. Why? Because it means we can't go on seeing each other anymore. But why shouldn't we go on seeing each other? Because you aren't satisfied any longer just to see me at lunch. and It isn't right for us to go out together at night. But surely there's no harm in our going to the theater together. You're married, Charles. That's reason enough. All right, Julia. Forget I ever asked you. But at least we can go on having lunch together, can't we? No, Charles. Oh, but... Can't you see? Things can never be the way they were. We've become dependent upon each other, and we have no right to be. We can't go on seeing each other any longer. It isn't fair to Agatha. But you know that Agatha and I mean nothing to each other. We haven't for years. Nevertheless, she's your wife. Julia, you, you know I love you. I've always loved you, and I can't do without you. Charles, you're just making it difficult for both of us. Julia, you do love me, don't you? Yes. But can't you see? It's no use. I remember Agatha only too well. She'd never give you a divorce. I know she won't. I've asked her a dozen times in the past five years, but she said she'll never give me one. I want to part now, Charles. Right here. Must we? Yes. Goodbye, Charles. My life seemed to end that day, Doctor With our parting I went through the motions of living But nothing seemed to matter any longer I can well understand that uh, Months went by Every day after work I stayed in town Unable to face an evening at home with Agatha When I did arrive home late at night She'd be waiting for me is that you, Charles? Yes, Agatha. Sorry if I woke you. A lot you care. Coming in night after night at all hours. Leaving me alone in this big house. Oh, don't think I don't know what you're up to. I know you're kind, Charles Foster. You better go to sleep, Agatha. A fine chance I have to sleep with you putting on the bathroom light. You know I can't sleep when that light's on. Take me a minute to brush my teeth, then I'll turn off the light. Agatha. Well, what is it now? What's this bottle of prussic acid doing in the medicine chest? It's a deadly poison. I know that. I got it from Mrs. Smedley, the druggist's wife. She used it to get rid of an old cat they had. When I told her about flush, she said it What's was a thing... What's that about flush? I said Mrs. Smedley gave me that bottle of prussic acid so I could get rid of flush. I'm going to put him out of his misery tomorrow. You'll do no such thing, do you hear? If you so much as lay a hand on flush, I'll kill you. I'll kill you, do you understand? Yes. Yes, Charles. You get rid of that poison tomorrow. Let's have no more talk of putting flush out of his misery. I lay awake for hours, Doctor, unable to fall asleep. Julia's breaking off with me and my wife's refusal to give me a divorce. And the prussic acid she meant to poison flush with had left me all worked up. Then Agatha began coughing. That cough she cultivated for years to give people the impression that she was an invalid. Well, after she'd coughed her usual five minutes or so, she got out of bed and started for the bathroom where she kept her cough medicine. Oh! Why don't you turn on the light so you can see where you're going? I can see perfectly well where I'm going. Besides, on your salary, we can't afford to waste electricity. I knew there wasn't any use in saying anything more. For years, Agatha had gotten up every night and groped her way to the medicine chest where her cough medicine was. Nothing could make her change her habits. I lay in bed listening as she opened the medicine chest and fumbled in the corner where she always kept the bottle. As I heard her groping for her medicine, I... I suddenly thought of the bottle that was standing next to it. The bottle of prussic acid. Without thinking, it came to mind. If only she'd take the prussic acid instead of the cough medicine. If she did, I would be free. Free of her constant nagging and whining. Free to see Julia. Then I knew it was useless to hope for such a mistake to happen. Agatha's cough medicine always stood in the same corner of the medicine chest. Even in the dark, she'd never take the bottle of prussic acid. And then... And it came to me. What if the bottles were to be switched? What if the following night the prussic acid were placed in the customary spot of the cough medicine? Suddenly it was all very clear to me what I was going to do. Agatha? <laughs> well? Agatha, I've been thinking over what you said about flush. What? I suppose you're right. Flush should be disposed of. He certainly should. He's old and he's smelly. 
It'll be a blessing for him to be put out of his misery. Yes, of course. I, I'm sorry I shouted at you before, Agatha, but, well, I see now that you're right. Hmm. When are you going to do it? Oh, we'll wait until Saturday. And none too soon, either. Uh, you're sure the prussic acid won't make him suffer? Nonsense, of course it won't. Mrs. Smedley said nothing worked faster than prussic acid. Oh, you told her what it was for. Uh, that's fine. Very well, I guess I just leave everything to me. The next night, Doctor... After Agatha was in bed, I quietly stole into the bathroom and opened the medicine chest. I compared the bottle of cough medicine with that of the prussic acid. They were both small bottles, almost identical in size. I removed the cough medicine from where it stood in the corner of the chest and replaced it with the poison. Then I went to bed and waited impatiently for Agatha to start coughing. <laughs> Can I get you a glass of water or something, Agatha? <coughs> water won't do any good. What I need is my cough medicine. <coughs> oh, that's that hair. Why don't you turn on the light? <laughs> because I can see perfectly in the dark. Besides, someone's got to economize on the electricity in this house. I lay there in the dark, listening to her grumble as she opened the door of the medicine chest. The blood pounded in my ears as I heard her fumbling for the bottle. Would she feel a slight difference in the bottle when she picked it up? Scarcely able to breathe, I waited. Listen. And she fell to the floor. I quickly got out of bed, turned on the lights, and went into the bathroom. She was lying on the floor, quite dead. There was an agonized look on her face. I returned the bottle of cough medicine to its proper place, and then I phoned the police. <laughs> Now, you say, Mr. Foster, that your wife was in the habit of going every night to the medicine chest for a few drops of her cough medicine. Yes, that's right. And she never turned on the lights when she went to the medicine chest. Oh, no, sir. Wasn't that a bit unusual? Well, I always used to tell her to turn on the lights, but she said it was a waste of electricity. I see. And you say your wife... It was her who placed the bottle of prussic acid in the medicine chest next to her cough medicine, eh? Yes, sir. I'd never touched the bottle of prussic acid. You see, it was my wife who procured it, and she... Yes, yes, Mr. Smedley, the druggist, has testified that his wife gave it to your wife. Mr. Foster, are you familiar with the contents of your wife's will dated ten years ago? I, uh, yes, I am. Then you know, of course, that your wife left her entire estate to the home for the aged. Home for the aged? Oh, yes, yes. I fought to keep my face expressionless to prevent him from learning that I hadn't known all the years we'd been married, Agatha had given me to understand that all her money would go to me. Now I knew that she'd been lying. Her will had been made out in favor of the home for the aged for years. I began to feel angry at the way she'd cheated me. But a moment later, I was grateful that she had. Frankly, Mr. Foster, your wife's death occurred under very suspicious circumstances, to say the least. For years, she'd gone to the medicine chest every night without mishap. And yet, on the second night that there was a bottle of prussic acid in the chest... She met her death. Were it not for the fact that your wife had left her entire estate to the home for the aged, I might be inclined to go further with this investigation. As it is, I'll instruct the coroner's jury to bring in a verdict of death through accident. That's all, Mr. Foster. I walked out of the district attorney's office a free man. A few days later, I moved out of the house which had been Agatha's and took up quarters elsewhere. Six long and uneventful months passed. I made no effort to contact Julia for fear that the police might still have their suspicions. And then I could stand it no longer. I, I called on her. Charles, when I was told you were waiting to see me, I could hardly believe it. I'm so glad to see you again. Thank you, Julia. It's good to see you again, too. Charles, you don't look well at all. Well, these past few months have been something of a strain, Julia, but I'm all right now. I was tempted so many times to get in touch with you. Then I thought perhaps you didn't want to see anyone. Well, I did want to see you, Julia, but I was afraid it wouldn't look right. I understand, Charles. Now, let's not say anything more of the past. Only the present and the future. Julia, do you think we might try to pick up where we left off last autumn? 
We can try, Charles. Julia and I, Doctor, began to see each other night after night. Life for me became exciting and wonderful the way it had been 11 years ago before Julia and I had broken our engagement. Didn't you ever stop to think of what you'd done? You mean Agatha? Yes. No, Doctor. They say that a murderer is ever haunted by his crime. But that isn't true. Hmm. Uh, At least it wasn't in my case. To me, Agatha was part of another life in the dim past. I rarely thought of the past, only the present and the future. Now, if I had any fears at all, it was the fear that something would spoil the happiness that Julia and I had found together. But nothing did. And a few months later, we were married with you as my best man. Yes, I remember. And my second marriage was everything that my first hadn't been. For the first time in my life, I knew what true happiness meant. Julia and I were poor, but that didn't matter, for we had each other. The months swiftly passed. And as our first anniversary approached, it was hard to believe that we'd been married almost a year. Charles, before you leave for work, will you sign a check for me? Oh, who's it for, dear? Never you mind, Mr. Foster. You just leave a signed check. I'll fill in the amount in the party it's meant for. Mrs. Foster, you're acting very mysterious. Well, a wife has a right to act mysterious once a year. (laughs) Darling, I suspect you're going to use this check to buy me an anniversary present. Well, whatever you get me, please don't make it neckties. Well, I'll have you know I have very good taste in neckties. I know you do, dear, but I have to wear them. You're an ungrateful (laughs) wretch. Very well, I won't get you time. Good, then I'll sign the check for you. And please bear in mind that you can't make this check out for more than $312.50. That's all we have in the bank. Oh, I'll leave you at least a 50 cents. You'd better leave a good deal more. Oh, we won't be going up to Lake Ellis. Charles, are we going up to Lake Ellis? Oh, see, it slipped out. And I meant it as an anniversary surprise. Oh, Charles, that's wonderful. When are we going? This Friday afternoon. I've rented a cabin and a small motorboat on Lake Ellis for the weekend. Oh, darling, what an exciting surprise. Charles, you're sure it won't be too expensive? Why, nothing can be too expensive for our first anniversary. Oh, <laughs> darling, I've never been so happy. <laughs> Uh, This looks like a nice place to fish. Uh, Let's see, where'd I put that bait? Here it is, dear. Thanks, darling. Uh Ah, here's a nice, fat, dimpled worm. (laughs) Well, if you can't stand to see me bait him, just turn the other way. That's it. It'll only take me a minute. Charles, look. Let's wait till I get this. There's smoke coming out of the engine hatch. What's that? Yes, you're right. It's on fire. There are flames shooting out. Fire extinguishers at the other end of the boat. Charles, you'd never make it. You'd be burned. Yes, you're right. Besides, even the extinguisher wouldn't do much good now. The fire's too big. What are we going to do? Oh, the heat is becoming unbearable. There's only one thing we can do, Julia. Let's go over the side. We're almost in the center of the lake. I can't swim. But I can, dear. I'll manage to keep us above water somehow. Well, all right, darling. I'll do whatever you say. We'll come through this, Julia. Now, don't be afraid. Now, I'll slip over the side of the boat first, and you follow. All right. Now, hurry, Julia. Let yourself down into the water. I'll keep you afloat. Yes, Charles. And that's it. Now, now, let go of the side of the boat. I have you. Yes, Charles. Now, don't be afraid, darling. You see? It's no trouble keeping you above water. Now, now just relax, dear, while I swim with you a bit. We've got to get a good distance from the boat. It may explode. Yes, Charles. Do you see any boats, Ralph? No, but someone's bound to see the fire and come to our rescue. Until they do... We must have courage. You're tired, aren't you, child? No. No, don't worry, dear. I can keep us afloat for a long time yet. Why doesn't someone come to our rescue? They will. Someone must surely have seen that boat burning. Charles, we've been in the water so long. Oh, it just seems long, darling. It can't be more than ten minutes. Ten minutes? It feels more like... Charles! I've got you, Julia. I just for a moment, you, you slipped away from me. 
Out, get him before he goes under. Yeah. Uh, I got him. Yeah, help me get him aboard, Skipper. All right, all right. Any sign of his wife? Uh, she's gone, Skipper. Yeah, too bad. Well, if it's the last thing I do, I aim to see justice done to this fella. She never had a chance. Did you see him shovel under? It was murder, that's what it was. Mr. Foster, both of the men who rescued you claim that as they approached you and your late wife in their boat, they saw you struggling with her. You admit this? Yes. Yes, but I tell you I was trying to save her, not drown her. Oh, you were trying to save her. But both the witnesses testified they saw you push her head under. But they're wrong. I wasn't pushing her under. I was trying to bring her to the surface. You must believe me. Oh, Mr. Foster... You maintain that you were rescuing your wife, not drowning her. Yes. Is it true, Mr. Foster, that you were engaged to your wife 11 years ago and that she broke the engagement? Yes, that's true. Would you mind telling the jury why she broke the engagement? We we had a misunderstanding. A misunderstanding. Do you call shooting the woman you're engaged to just a misunderstanding? No, no. You must let me explain it's true that 11 years ago I did shoot Julia, but I've been drinking. I didn't know what Mr. I was doing. Mr. Foster, you do admit shooting and wounding her. Yes, yes. Have you ever seen this before? Why, yes. That's the insurance policy I took out for Julia and myself. Exactly. And when was this policy taken out? Well, about a month ago. June 15th, to be exact. And what's the value of this policy, Mr. Foster? Well, if either my wife or myself died... Provided $10,000 for the survivor. Yes, Mr. Foster. If either you or your wife died a natural death, it provided $10,000 to the survivor. But there's also a double indemnity clause in this policy, isn't there? Yes, but I... One that provides you with $20,000 if your wife died an accidental death, such as drowning. That's true, but I swear I didn't drown my wife. I tell you, I was trying to save her. Save her, not drown her. You must believe me. You must... That, Doctor, is exactly the way everything happened. Strange, isn't it? The way justice works itself out. I committed murder and escaped punishment. Now I'm paying with my life for the death of the one person I really loved. It's time to go, Foster. All right, Warden. Goodbye, Doctor. And take good care of Flush, will you? Of course, Charles. Goodbye. All right, Warden. I'm ready. Let's go. This is the mysterious traveler again. Did you enjoy our little trip? Too bad about Charles Foster, wasn't it? As he was strapped into the electric chair, there was an ironic smile on his lips. For he was being executed for something he had not done. But as Charles himself said, justice has a strange way of working itself out. 
I knew another man once who thought it would be a simple thing to dispose of his wife. Uh, unfortunately, he... Uh... Oh, you're getting off here? I'm sorry. But perhaps we'll meet again soon. I take this same train every week at this time. You have just heard Chapter 64 of The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and the terrifying. In tonight's story, the case of Charles Foster, Humphrey Davis played Charles Foster, Nancy Sheridan played Julia, and Joan Che played Agatha. The Mysterious Traveler is written by Bob Arthur and David Cogan, and original music is played by Henry Silverne. The entire production is under the direction of Jock McGregor. <laughs> Listen next week to a tale titled Blood Money. Another tale of the mysterious traveler. The Mysterious Traveler is presented by WOR Mutual from the WOR Studios in New York. This is Mutual. <laughs> The Chilling True Terror of the Black-Eyed Kids, a monster compilation by G. Michael Vasey. The Black-Eyed Kids are an urban legend of vast proportions. The stories of small children turning up on people's doorsteps all across the world, spreading fear and terror, have only increased over time. This compilation of G. Michael Vasey's books on this scary phenomena include new material and new true stories, as well as the complete texts of The Black-Eyed Demons Are Coming and The Black-Eyed Kids. Supernatural expert G. Michael Vasey carefully investigates this truly terrifying phenomenon using real-life encounters with these scary supernatural beings. The result is an unsettling and sometimes terrifying book that'll have you fearfully anticipating that knock at your door, late at night. Who and what are these mysterious visitors to the doorstep? Are they demons? Aliens? What do they want? Why do they need to enter your home? And what happens if they do? Small kids that ask to use your phone or for a ride, and yet those who encounter them are scared to death even before they notice their black eyes. The Chilling True Terror of the Black-Eyed Kids, a monster compilation by G. Michael Vasey. Narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. strange publishing firm owned by Dan and Barbara Glenn, where each new novel is acted out by the Mystery House staff before it is accepted for publication. Mystery House. I understand I'm going to be doing a very sinister character in tonight's Mystery House story, Barbie. You can say that again. Gives me the creep. Mm, complete with quartet, huh? That's the title. What does it mean? Why, haven't you ever seen advertisements for funeral homes in which the copy listed a price for funeral services, complete with quartet? Oh. Uh, speaking of advertisements... Ah, uh, which is precisely what you're always doing, Tom. Right, Mr. Glenn. And here's a message from our sponsor. Okay, places, everybody. Set the scene, Tom. 
complete with quartet. The scene opens in the reception room of the Renfron Funeral Home. Mr. Renfron, a polished, suave gentleman, has just come in and is greeting the night man, Harry Canby, who doesn't look too wide awake. Well, did I wake you up, perhaps, Harry? Huh? Oh, uh, no, 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 boys. I've been awake all the time. You know, some night I will stay on the night shift just to see whether it's possible for you to look any more wide awake in the small hours of blackness than you do in the morning. Any, uh, business, Harry? Uh, Joe Graven brought in one of his boys, got hit with an automobile. Hit with an automobile? Yeah. <laughs> no doubt. Any, uh, bullet wounds we must take care of on the corpse? No, this guy was really hit by a car. Straight goods, he says. Straight goods. That would be a refreshing novelty. I suppose, uh, Joe wanted the special funeral? Uh, the works, he says. Even including the quartet. Hmm. An excellent customer, Mr. Graben. I wish we had a few more like him buying in, uh, in quantity. The body is in the receiving room? Sure. You told me never to monkey with any of Graben's steps. Yes, I know. They sometimes require the delicate craftsmanship of a master. Well, let's take a look at this one. It's all right for me to go back with you? Uh, Betty ain't here to take over the switchboard yet. Hmm. She is a little too late too often. Oh, well, I doubt that Joe Graben's working this early in the morning. There will be no calls. Come along. In the receiving room, you said? Yes? Yeah. This uh, mangled one over against the wall? I, uh, uh, yeah, 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 that's the one, uh, but... But, uh, the other one. You said nothing about... There wasn't any other one, boss. Honest, just the one. This man on the table in the middle of the room. Who is he? Oh, i never seen him before in my life, boss. Honest, I... Shut up. Stand back. Hmm. He's been shot through the heart. Murdered, huh? No, no, no. He was probably playing with a cap pistol and it went off accidentally. You blundering idiot. Who brought this body in here? Nobody, boss. Well, from the extremely dead look of the gentleman, it's rather obvious that he did not walk in here alone. Somebody brought that body in here last night. You and I, we have to own the keys. I don't know a thing about it. Nah, I should have known better than to have a stupid blundering idiot like you on night duty here. What am I going to do with this body? Maybe somebody will come in and claim it. You maybe don't I'll... tax my patience, Harry. Are people in the habit of claiming the bodies of murder victims? Would anyone admit bringing it in? No, maybe not at that. Harry, I think we're going to have a very private funeral. Huh? Somebody has entrusted this body to us for burial. Somebody who appreciates our skill and tact. Fortunately, we have another body. Oh, I'll get you, boss. A grave will have to be prepared for the other body. The funeral for Joe Graven's boy will not be until tomorrow. Tonight, we bury the stranger beneath the grave that Joe Graben's late friend will occupy tomorrow. Well, what good will that do? You mean saving the price of a cemetery lot? You moron. I mean that nobody would ever think of looking for a murdered man's body in the graveyard, particularly if the body is beneath another coffin. When they find one coffin in the grave, they look no further. You see, it's very simple. Yeah. Meanwhile, I have a little work to do, Harry. You mean fixing up Joe Graben's boy? No, that is a routine matter. Even you could handle it. No, no. I have a much bigger job. What? Determining who gets the bill for the most profitable funeral that we have ever conducted. Huh? Somebody who knows about the work I do for Joe Graben has selected me for the disposal of a body. I have been chosen as a goat. And somebody's going to pay very dearly for that choice, Harry. I'm going to play... Detective. I told the boy at the desk to tell you I wouldn't see you. I don't know you. Carl Renfron is the name. Perhaps you've heard of the Renfron Funeral Home, one of the finest in this part of the country. Beautiful chapel, pipe organ, and... A special quartet for the deluxe service. What is this, a gag? If it is, it isn't very funny. My business is never very funny, Miss Dear. What do you want of me? You sing in one of Joe Graven's nightclubs, yes? Sure, what of it? 
I suppose you read in the papers this morning about the disappearance of a handsome young detective. I don't read the papers. Get out of here. His name was Peter Harley, and he was working on a shake-up of the local underworld. How should I know anything about him? You had a date with him last night, after your last show. How do you know? That is neither here nor there. You were the last person to see him alive, as far as the police know. The cops? They know I had a date with him? Not yet. They won't know until I tell them. But you said you didn't want to cooperate with me. And so I'll have to tell them, of course. What do you want? Did you kill Peter Harley, Miss Dear? Did I? Hey, what is this anyway? He ain't dead. Huh. I would make a substantial wager on that. But you don't think I killed him? I had a date with the guy. If you will pardon my saying so, that hardly eliminates you as a murder suspect. Don't tell me you were madly in love with him. Your kind doesn't fall in love with anything except cash. I... I don't know whether I ought to tell you what it was all about or not. Then perhaps I'd better go to the police. No, no, I... I I'll tell you. That's better. He, uh... He wanted to get some dope on Joe Graben. Said he'd give me a hundred bucks for what I could tell him. I didn't plan on really telling him anything. You were interested in the hundred dollars. Sure, that's all. Why did you kill him, Miss Dare? I didn't kill him. If anybody killed him... Yes? Nothing. You make it very difficult for me, Miss Dare. The police... Okay. If anybody killed him, it was that new piano player at the club. You seem quite positive. Well, Harley didn't give me the hundred bucks. Said I was holding out on him. That if I wasn't careful, he'd have me thrown in the clink, the louse. He said, if there's any tip-off on me, you get it, Marie. Yes? That doesn't seem to prove anything about the piano. Well, no, he's been sauntering over to the piano and talking to her all evening. And he had a date with me. She's new in the joint. What's her name? Where can I find her? Her name's Betty Lanning. What? Repeat it, please. Betty Lanning. Why? You want her address? No. I think I can find her without too much trouble. But what makes you think this Betty Lanning had something to do with his death? He left me here at my hotel. I was scared of what he said about the police and me giving a tip off to Joe Graben. I headed back to the elevator and then ducked out the side door and followed him. I was afraid he was going to tell the cops something about me. Where did he go? Well, he walked up a couple of blocks to a little all-night lunchroom and Betty Lanning was there waiting for him. Thank you, my dear. You've been of great help to me. Perhaps I will give you the hundred dollars that Peter Harley refused to pay you. Oh, yeah, I just bet. You will come with me. There's a matter of establishing identity of the corpse beyond reasonable doubt. I ain't going anywhere with you. I don't even know you. You will, my dear. Of course, if you prefer to have an introduction to the police. Okay, okay, I'm coming. <laughs> Got a real fancy place here. Yes, yes, the classic beauty of Grecian architecture soothes the nerves of the bereaved. Right this way, my dear. Mr. Graben's been calling you about the body he... Oh, surprised to see a fellow employee from the nightclub, Betty? Hey, wait a minute. You're the new piano player in the club. How come you're over... You must be mistaken. I work here. Oh, no, I ain't mistaken. You play the piano. I'm afraid and... bluffing won't do you much good, Betty. And uh, I want to apologize to you. Apologize? For what? Well, I thought you were rather lazy and shiftless the way you've been coming in late in the mornings, and here I discover you're holding down both a day and a night job. Rather admirable. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, don't deny it, my dear. I would be rather proud if, if I were you. Won't you show me... Miss Dare, back to the receiving room, Betty. Uh, Miss Dare? But why? She wants to identify a, a friend. I, I... All right, but I don't have any key. I... I have. And I'm going with you. This way, Miss Dare. I'm surprised you didn't tell me about your other job, Betty. Just a minute. Show the body, Betty. It's this one over here that she's interested in. All right. All right. Oh, Pete. What have you done to him? You, you murdered him. Ah, 
Bones, so you need a man, too. You and Miss Dare Bones. You killed him. You'll never get away with this. I did not kill the man, but I really can't let you run around screaming that I did. You've been working for me and working for Joe Graben. <laughs> I wonder who else you're working for. I... What do you mean? I wonder if perhaps you might not be a spy. I wonder if you might not have put this man's body in here. You're insane. A man should know his employees better, Miss Lanning. I really think it's time for us to have a heart-to-heart talk. I've nothing to say to you. I have an idea you'll change your mind about that. Hello. Actually, I just assume you didn't. You'd make such a beautiful corpse. Well, you, you wouldn't dare kill me. You, hey, you. this is where I leave. I'm sorry, Miss Dare. I'll have to insist that you stay. Hey, so Harry left yet, Miss Lanning. But, no, he... He was cleaning the, the chapel. Oh, fine. I was afraid he might have gone. And he does so want some experience. In embalming. Is Carl Renfrum actually going to kill Benny Lanning? And who killed Peter Harley, the detective? Why was his body left in the Renfrum funeral home? We'll find out in the second act of tonight's story. Meanwhile, here's news from the sponsor. And now, act two of Complete with Quartet. The scene is the receiving room of the Renfrum funeral home, and Harry Canby, Renfrum's assistant, is arranging the embalming equipment. You haven't got the nerve. You wouldn't dare. If it was me, I wouldn't bet on that, sister. If I was you, I'd start talking. The start of the embalming process is very important, Harry. If you will uh, give me the needle, please. Well, you can't embalm a live person. You... Oh, a common misconception, Betty. On the contrary... Get away from me! Don't you dare touch me! Perhaps you're ready to talk now. I... What do you want? You're working with the police, I suppose. Working with this Peter Harley. Are you kidding? When I joke, you always see a smile on my lips. And my sense of humor is weak. I seldom joke. I was working for Lou Dana. Lou Dana? Why, he's Joe Graben's worst enemy. Sure. Some of Lou Dana's spies, his undercover boys, began having accidents. And the accidents always turned up here. So Lou hired me to get a job here and tell him what was going on. Mr. Dana must be a smart man. He's smarter than you, Renfron. And smarter than Graben. I was giving him the dope every time a body came into this place from Graben. Yes, but this job of yours as a piano player. Graben never saw me here. His bodies always came in the back way. I was doing so well here, Lou got the idea of having me work at Graben's place, too. We were finding out everything Graben was doing. Hmm. A much smarter girl than I gave you credit for being, Miss Lane. And you better be careful how you treat me, too. Because Lou Dana's got enough on you to hang you. If I were in your place, Miss Lanning, I should worry about my own neck. The police are going to be quite angry about Peter Harley. I didn't kill him. I was giving him all the dope on Graben's mob. The dope about Graben and you. Hmm, I suppose so. You know, Miss Lanning, I find such disloyalty rather distressing. Miss Dare, what would you do if you were I? Under such circumstances. You leave me out of this. I ain't playing. I should hate to think that Joe Graben would double-cross me in view of all that I've done for him. I bet Graben bumped off this Harley guy for us. Well, of course he did. Probably had someone following Peter Harley and me. And when Graben finds out how Betty spilled everything she knew, he has this Harley fella erased. Hmm. Perhaps uh, you could contribute something to the conversation about now, Miss Dare. I, uh... I, I don't think Joe would do a thing like that. Oh, come now, Miss Dare. You told me you followed Harley and saw him meet Miss Lanning. You were angry because he hadn't given you the hundred dollars he had promised. Now, it isn't logical that you would let such an opportunity for revenge pass. So it was you who tipped off Graben, huh? Why, you dirty little... I ain't a stole pigeon or a double-crossing rat like you. Sure, I called Joe. Why wouldn't oh, I? Oh, you... Oh, please, please, ladies, please. This is hardly the place for such talk. We're in the presence of the dead. You know, Harry, 
This rather hurts me. Huh? Joe Graven, he's, he's been such a fine customer. And to think he tried to take advantage of me. Huh. I think we'll have to call him over here and uh, sever business relations. <laughs> What's the matter, Renfron? Cops making a fuss about the guy I brung in last night? Which one, Mr. Graven? What do you mean, which one? Oh, really, Mr. Graven, you hurt me deeply. I've always endeavored to give you the finest service. Funerals worthy of uh, much finer people than those that you have brought me. Everything has always been conducted on the highest plane. With the finest music, the most excellent caskets, beautiful flowers... Okay, okay, quit selling me. I ain't kicking... I paid you plenty, too. I never beefed on the prices. What's wrong with you? If you wanted the free funeral for one of your victims, why didn't you ask me? I don't like deceit and trickery, Mr. Graben. You're off your nut. I don't know what you're talking about. This uh, extra corpse you slipped in here last night, Mr. Graben. Are you crazy? I brought in one. Harry's seen me. I told him all about it. Wasn't even a hot job. Ah, but the one you brought with him, Mr. Graben, the one you neglected to report. You lie! Please, Mr. Graben. Perhaps uh, you'd like to see him. This way, please. I don't know nothing about it. One stiff I brought in. One. And if you think you're going to shake me down to pay for somebody else's corpse, you got another thing coming. One moment, please. In here. Hello, Joe. Hey, what's it? Marie Dare and Betty. Say, what's going on here anyhow? One thing that's going on, Joe. We found out what a rat your new piano player is. Lou Dana, she was working for, spying on oh, you. Oh, quiet, please, Miss Dare, quiet. Teacher will know what a good girl you've been without you being so immodest. I'll tell him all about it. This is one of your nightclub's late patrons, Mr. Graven. Him? Yeah, I've seen him around. Been murdered, ain't he? I bet you don't know how or where either, do you? Me? How should I know? Your little pal, Marie Deer, told us how she called you and told you this detective was meeting me. She's put you right on the spot. Huh? I wasn't putting you on any spot, Joe. She was giving this detective all the dope on you. She was a spy. Taking pay from you and giving Lou Dane all the dope on everything that was going on around your place. And you told him you phoned me and told me about it? Why'd you say a thing like that, Marie? Because I did. Well, it must have been a couple of other people. You never talked to me. Oh, your protests of innocence are touching, Mr. Graven. But they're necessary. Nobody's gonna hand me a rap for killing a dick. That is not the point. It is, as far as I'm concerned. Our friend Betty, who seems to have been working for both of us, isn't going to give you the benefit of any doubt if this should come into court. Peter Harley was on your trail trying to get something on you. Yeah? Well... I didn't know about it. Betty, a member of a rival gang, was telling him anything that she could that would get you into trouble with the police. Marie Dare tipped you off as to what was going on. She never did. She did. She says she did. She has no apparent motive for lying. Peter Harley's been murdered. Do you think you would want the case to go to court, Mr. Graven? I suppose it's got to. No, not necessarily. Not if uh, you arrange for the right kind of a funeral. You mean... You can cover this thing up? Such things have been arranged in the past, but uh, this is going to be an expensive lesson for you, Mr. Graven. Yeah? What do you mean? Somebody has tried to victimize me into putting out a free funeral. Mm. This man died trying to uphold the law. A noble hero shot down in the prime of his life. He deserves last rites of genuine elegance. Okay. How much do you want? I should say about um, $50,000 should cover it very nicely. Fifty thousand? Well, that's blackmail. Oh, but it will be a superb funeral. Flowers, spatial carpet at the cemetery, the red one, even the quartet. You'll guarantee I don't take the rep if I pay you the dough? When the Renfron Funeral Home takes charge of a funeral, I assume every responsibility. I guarantee you that you'll never be charged with Peter Harley's murder. Of course, Mr. Graven, you, uh, 
you will make the payment in cash in advance. <laughs> Okay, you got your dough. I guess I can go now. Have uh, you finished counting the money, Harry? Yeah, yeah, 50 grand. It's okay. I ain't gonna forget the way you shook me down, Mr. Renfan. No, I don't suppose you will. Give me the money, Harry. Uh, here you are, boss. Thank you, Harry. Oh, by the way, uh, I'm afraid I'll have to dispense with your services. Huh? I mean, you're fired. But I ain't done anything, boss. I ain't... I could hardly have a murderer working for me, Harry. Particularly such a stupid murderer. What do you mean? Listen, I ain't murdered anybody. Hey, what gives? What's this all about anyway? Peter Harley came here last night and asked to see the body that was in the receiving room. He showed his police credentials, I imagine, and demanded to see it. No, he wasn't here. You took him back to the receiving room. You were panic-stricken because you thought you would be in trouble. That you would be implicated in the work we've been doing for Joe Graben. Ah, you're making this up. You've been receiving most of Mr. Graben's... Mr. Graben's cases at night. You thought you'd be in it up to your neck. So, you shot the detective. You killed him yourself. You... Hardly. Peter Harley and I were working together. You and Harley? Why, you dirty wretch. When you brought your first case to me, Mr. Graben, I was scared to death. So I went to the police. And you got the nerve to admit it? They told me to play along with you, to tip them off. They've been building up a chain of evidence that will send you to the electric chair. Thanks to me. And you've been collecting from Joe Graben all the time? <laughs> Naturally, my dear. Even the gangster dead must have burial. I didn't kill Harley, I tell you. You did it yourself. You have a key, too. Yes? Try telling that to the police, Harry. I'm afraid you'll uh, irritate them. You see, Harry, they tipped me off a long time ago that you were one of Graben's boys. That you came to work for me because Graben had decided... I was to be his undertaker. Then, then I'll confess that Graven told me to shoot Harley. Yeah. Why, you louse. Try to ring me in on your mistake, will you? You told me to do it. I'll stick to that. Unless you get me out of here. I can do that, all right. This gun will do the trick. Joe, you ain't going to shoot us. I ought to shoot Rinfron, taking my dough and then tipping off the cops, shaking me down for 50 grand. Come on, we got to get out of here, Joe. You sap. Okay, come on. I got a key, Joe. We'll leave Renfron and the dames locked in here. Let them try to explain Peter Holly's body. Yeah. Oh, a fine spot you got us in now. When the cop comes... My dear, I don't believe you realize how lucky you are that Joe Graben didn't shoot you. Really, I don't. If I weren't a law-abiding citizen, I would be tempted to do it myself. You played unfair with me, too, you know. Hey, what's that? The police. I had the place literally honeycombed with them. Oh, my, I hope the bullets didn't hit any of my precious objects, the art. Ah, looks like most of them hit Harry and Joe Graben. Yes, the wages of sin. But I suppose I really owe them free funerals. Yeah, complete with quartet. <laughs>
Nothing goes better with chocolate than vanilla, and nothing goes better with the darkness than vampires. So we've combined all of them into a new blend of weird dark roast coffee called Very Vampilla. This bloody good blend combines a medium dark roast coffee with hints of chocolate, vanilla, and just a tad bit of dried cherry, too. So good, you'll want to sink your fangs into the fresh roasted bag itself. Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla, the only thing at stake – sorry, not sorry, bad pun – is your dissatisfaction with your old coffee. Sip it while the sun is down if you're one of the undead, or when the sun is up if you just feel dead and need a bit of a boost. Get your Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Randy Stone. I cover the night beat for the Chicago Star. My stories start in many different ways. This one began in the shattering turmoil of a manhunt and ended in the quietness of the morgue. Night Beat, starring Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. People are always telling me how lucky I am to have a job where all I've got to do is walk around Chicago at night looking for a story. It's a dandy little job, sure. All you need is a pneumonia jacket, an extra set of art supports, and a goodly supply of penicillin, and you're all set. <laughs> the city at night, fascinating. That old nose for news, frozen stiff and ready to fall off. Those eagle eyes so watery and bloodshot from the wind, they wouldn't serve a self-respecting canary. Yes, sir, it's lovely work if you can get it. And brothers and sisters, have I got it. <laughs> oh, I guess I was just bitter. I'd walked from the loop to the near north side, waiting for a story to tap me gently on the shoulder, and so far it was no hits, no runs, and no errors. The streets were empty. Everybody was home hugging a radiator. And then, far away, I heard that lonely blues-in-the-night sound. A police siren. And then another. And another. And then it seemed like there was a whole chorus of sirens singing about what a cruel, cruel world it all was. And then one siren separated itself from the rest and came closer. A prowl car coming down the street, stopping just a few yards away from me. And a police officer jumping out of it and hurrying to a call box. The officer passed under the street lamp, and I saw the excited look on his face, and I thought, all right, Stone, you lucky dog, let's go to work. This is Malachek. Yeah, okay, we're on our way over there right now. Right. Uh, officer, just a second. What do you want, mister? What's up? Sounds like every squad car in the city's on the loose. Look, I got no time, mister. Read it in the papers tomorrow. Oh, I never touch the stuff. Look, the name is Stone, Chicago Star. Oh, reporter? Well, mildly, that's a general call, isn't it? I got no time to stand here, Gavin. I'll give it to you fast. Gig Sanvers busted loose. Sanvers? Great. When and how? Read it in your paper, Stone. All right, cross and let's move. They got him trapped. <laughs> Gig Sanders, two-time loser, a killer, loose in a city of four million people and everyone his enemy. I hurried to a phone, checked with the police, and then drove over to that part of Chicago called the Badlands. That strange area belonging to every city, surrounded by business section, yet itself run down, deteriorated, filled with tenements and abandoned factories. It was there the police had thrown a cordon around a boarded-up building. My pass got me through and up to the front line, and police captain Arlen. Hello, Stone. Oh, the hunt's on, huh? I don't know. We'll see in a minute. Sanders in that building? Got a tip he would be. Wait a second. All right. All right, Billings. Turn the searchlight on the building. Keep two of them on the roof. Run the others back and forth. Right. Sticking around, Stone? Yeah, I guess so. You sure Sanders is in there? No, but we couldn't afford to pass up the tip. The tip? Where'd he come from? No, no, no. It's just a phone call. But Sanders knew this neighborhood like the back of his hand, likely to be here. Captain Ireland, ready with the speaker now. Okay, bring it here. I'll check. It's quite a crowd gathered for the kill. Yeah, making it tough for us. Sanders is armed like an artillery corps, and if he's in there... Yeah, I see what you mean. How'd he get away? 
I haven't got the full details yet, but he was being taken to the death house. Killed a cop. He's a nice boy. Here you are, Captain. Okay. All right. Here it goes. Sanders? Sanders! Listen to me! There's no way out of that building that isn't covered. Come out with your hands in the air. We'll give you 20 seconds. Hear that, Sanders? 20 seconds. We'll count them off for you. Now, what if he doesn't show? Tear gas first, then we'll go in after him. Uh huh. If he comes out with his hands up, he goes to the death house. And if he doesn't... He'll come out. Rats always believe there's a chance to beat the chair. <laughs> well, there's life, there's hope. No sign of him. Malachek, come here! Yes, sir. Take the microphone. When I give the signal, start counting off 20 seconds. Yes, sir. You've given him more than 20 seconds. Not him, the crowd. They won't push in so close when the counting starts. Oh. Oh, look at them. Look at those faces. Perfectly normal human beings for 23 and a half hours of the day. Give them something like this for 30 minutes and they become a mob. Waiting, watching, hoping for the kill. People, Randy, want to change them? Uh, yeah, sure. We'll retool and put out a nice new eight-cylinder model with a convertible soul. Get ready, Manichek. Yes, sir. Captain, there's my story. Sandberg? Oh, no, no, that's for the front page, boys. That mob, that's my story. Look at that young couple right over there. Look at those two. They're hoping Sanders will come out shooting. Otherwise, they'll want their money back, huh? I suppose so. I'll see you later. Where are you going? I want to stand by that couple and listen to them. All right. Malachek, start counting. But warn him first. Once more. Sanders. Sanders. We're going to start counting right now. Come out with your hands in the air or we'll cut you in half when we come in after you. One... Two, three, four. I edged my way behind the young couple. They looked so nice and so human. But here they were, the same as all the rest. Nine. Go back just a little over a thousand years, put on a toga, and take a seat in the Colosseum at Rome. Have a great day watching the gladiators butcher each other. Cheer for the lions, or if you prefer people, cheer for the slave to kill the lion. Makes no difference. It's all the same holiday. Somebody gets killed. And then it started. Let him have it! It was all over in a few moments. The tear gas, the police rushing in with their masks on, the crowd straining forward to get a glimpse of Sanders. But there was no Sanders, and the police came up. Nobody in there, Captain Ireland. He must have been. No, sir, not a soul. We've covered every inch. I watched the crowd, and strangely enough, there was relief on their faces, and even a little shame that they'd hoped for the kill. The young couple in front of him. He wasn't there, Ken. He wasn't there. I know. Come on. Let's get out of here quick. Ken, Ken, I'm sick. Evie, hold on to me. Let us through, please. Let us through. Yeah, here, this way. Come on. Will you clear the way, please? She's sick, mister. Maybe it's a natural reaction to disappointment. Huh? Nothing, nothing. Come on. We'll get through this way. Will you let us through, please? Excuse me, will you? Please. Thank you. She's got to sit down, mister. She's got to... Okay. Here, here's my car. Let her get in here. Kenny. Kenny wasn't there. He's... He's loose. Never mind. Come on, baby. I'll get you home. You better let me drive him. No. We'll be all right. Ken, I... I'm sick. I... Just a little while, Evie. We'll be home. Look, fella, it's easy to see what's the matter. She can't walk home in her condition. It ain't far. A block would be too far. I'll get a cab. No. I don't want anybody around us. Don't want anybody around you? That's a laugh. You bring her out here to this. Why didn't you take her on a nice tour through the packing oh, house? Shut up. What right you got to talk like that? The founding fathers gave it to me. You don't know nothing about it. You don't know. Ken, take me home. Look, my car is still here. You're in no spot to refuse help no matter what your reason. Now, come on. Let him let him take his Kenny, please. I... Come on. They lived very close. It didn't take over three minutes to get to their tenement building. I wanted to take her to a hospital, but she refused. She refused in a way that made me look at her hard. And there was another thing. The way she reacted when the police found out Gig Sanders wasn't in the oil factory. Terror. That's what it was. Sheer Terror. And I helped her husband carry her up the stairs and into their meager little flat. On the couch, mister. Yes. Okay. There. Now, have you got a phone? What for? Call a doctor. We ain't got a phone. But 
There, there's a drugstore. No, on Ken. But, baby. We gotta get out. We ain't got time for a doctor now. Just let me rest. You're in no gotta condition get out. to refuse a doctor. I'm all right now. Yeah, yeah, sure. It ain't gonna be for three weeks. That's what the doctor three said. Three weeks, to... and you drag her out to that great exhibition? Why didn't you. Shut up! I told you before you didn't know nothing about her. Mind your own business and leave us alone. What are you you're looking like that for? What's the matter with you, with both of you? Nothing. Oh, yes, there is. You're scared stiff. Of what? Please go, like Kenny says. Leave us alone. Well, let me phone for a doctor from the drugstore. I, I, I won't come back. Just the doctor. Maybe. No, we ain't got time, Kenny. Don't you know that? We ain't got time. He's loose, Ken. He's loose. Baby, baby, don't. <laughs> You're talking about Gig Sanders, aren't you? Why? Why are you afraid of him? Do you know him? Come on, what about a talk? No. Not to nobody. You're scared of Sanders. Why? Look, mister, you helped us, all right? Thanks. Now get out of here. We gotta tell somebody. I said nobody. You know what'll happen. We gotta tell. Mister, who are you? My name is Stone, Chicago Star. Newspaper. Newspaper. That frighten you? Maybe he can help. Maybe he can. Nobody can. You know that. I'll tell him. Evie, shut up. It was Kenny who took the cops. Evie. I had to tell somebody. Maybe he can help. That's the truth, Kenny. Yeah. It was me tipped the cops. That Sanders was in the factory? I thought he might be, but he wasn't. All right, all right. Now tell me something else. How do you know so much about it? Come on, if you want me to help, I gotta know you're on the level, so tell me. Tell him. How do I know that he won't go straight to the police? How do I know that? We gotta trust somebody. We gotta. Can we trust anybody? Well, try it and see. I... Him and me, in the same gang once... I did time, but I got out before he did. I went straight because... Because... Go ahead. It was for me. Oh. All right, now, how about the tip to the police? There'll be a reward, you know. Sanders is big time. I didn't do it for no reward. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. Mr. Stone, help us. How? How can I help? By getting out now and keeping your trap shut up. And that'll help? No, you'll be back where you started. Your wife knows that, as she wouldn't have asked me to help. Gig will come after us. How would he know that you gave the information to the police? He'll guess. We used that factory plenty of times for a hideout. Nobody else knew how to get in. There's a cell away. All right. Let me ask you another question, Kenny. What? Why did you tip the police? Gig. Gig hates me. Why? Kenny married me while... while Gig was still in the pen. Oh, you were his girl? No, I never was. I never was his girl at all. I was like everything else Gig liked. Everything was... His, no matter who it belonged to. To him, a, a girl was like anything else. His gun, his clothes. Anytime Gig Sanvers wanted something, it was his. I never loved him. I, I told him, but I just laughed. Like, what I felt didn't mean nothing. I see. And now? Now he's loose. He hates me because of Evie, and he's going to know I tipped the coppers. Mr. Stone, if it's the last thing he does, he's going to get us, Evie and me. You are listening to Nightbeat, starring Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. Those kids were scared, plenty scared. I asked them the only question that made sense, and I got my answer. Go to the police? <laughs> sure. A guy who serves time goes to the cops. He tells them he gave him a bump steer. They got every copper in Chicago around that factory while Gig gets away someplace else. Yeah, yeah, sure. They'd believe me, wouldn't they? Well, try it. I'll go with you. Listen, you don't know. I changed my name. I moved all over the state looking for a job. This is the only place I could get one. I had to come back here. So what does that prove? It'll be in the papers. He'll lose his job, Mr. Stone. I can't do that. Not with Evie. Now, what do you want me to do? Look, maybe if I give you a, a, a list of the places the coppers might find you, maybe you could tip him. So what if he doesn't show up? There ain't many places he can go. Look, maybe by this time he's out, maybe even out of the state. He's killed an officer. He won't dare to stay here. Gig, as long as he knows Evie and me are still alive, he'll stay. He hates me so much, he'll take that chance. Does he know you live here? No. I ain't even seen any of the old bunch at all. I moved around. Always moving. Keep away. Mr. Stone, go to the police. But don't tell him nothing about me. Will you get it through your head that they'll protect you? Even so, Gig's got friends. If they find out it was me... All right, yeah. So you gotta go to the police. All right. 
Where's the drugstore? Right at the corner. You'll see it. All right, stay right here. Keep your door locked until I get back. It was a short two minutes to the corner drugstore. I put in my call and started back to the flat. The street was quiet, deserted. The dirty tenements, a solid block of ugliness against the night. I reached the tenement entrance, and I was just about to start up the steps. Hey, pal. Huh? Don't turn around. What? Stand nice and quiet. That's it. What is this, a holdup? Sure, a holdup. Now listen to me. Take out a cigarette. What? Take out a cigarette. That's it. Now light it. Act natural. Good boy. Now? Where are you? In your car at the curb, smart boy. What? Don't turn around, I said. Take a look up and down the street. I am. Coppers? No. Okay. Now come here to the car. You're going to do like I tell you, understand? What do you want? Who? You know who I am, Stone. Yeah, I guess I do. Listen, I'm going up to that flat you come to. Don't do it, Sanders. Sure, I'm going to do it. This gun says I can do it. Leave the two kids alone. Yeah. All alone. You're wasting time, Sam. There's time you could use to better advantage. Sure. Now step back a couple of feet. I'm getting out. Just stay in there. Keep smoking a cigarette. Walk ahead of me. Straight in that house. Move. Stop here. Sanders, you're not going to do this and still have time to get away. Real concerned about me, ain't you? Don't worry, I'm a big boy. All right, give him a break. Sure, like they was going to give me. Now listen, you're going back up to that flat. You're going to knock on the door and you're going to tell them to let you in. That clear? What if I don't? So be a hero. I'll get in anyway. It's just easier this way. Okay? I, uh... All right. So let's go. The slow walk up the stairs was a nightmare. I walked down the hall toward the flat. The flat where those two kids waited behind the door that they thought would keep the terror and death away from them. And then, knock. Who is it? Answer. Sandless, please don't do it. You can answer him. Who is it? Answer. <laughs> It's Stone, Kenny, but I... You was a long time inside. Ah! Ah! Shut her up or I will. Ah! Easy, 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 Stone. You, Stone, lock that off. All right, Kenny boy, over on the couch. Kick, kick, don't hurt Evie. She's gonna have... I see, yeah, congratulations. Listen to me. Shut up, Stone. What? Get over to the couch. On your way, turn out the light. Stay in line with the window so I can see you against the street lamp. Now sit down. We'll talk. You gonna listen to me, Kate? Sure, I'm a wonderful listener. Only make it good and funny, huh? Even me fell in love, Geek. You ain't gonna blame us for that. <laughs> Evie and you fell in love. You think I worried about that? You think I cared what she did? Nah. It's what you done tonight. He was afraid, Sanders. Afraid that you'd come after him because of Evie. I thought about it, mister. Yeah, plenty. But I figured let it go. It ain't worth it. But this tonight is something different. Turning stooly. You'll never get out of Chicago, Sanders. Every cop in the city will be looking for you. That's nothing new to me. Now you, Kenny boy. You did tip the coppers, didn't you? Kick. Listen. We're... We're nothing. You haven't got a chance, Sanders. <laughs> no chance? I always got a chance. My luck's good. You know why I wasn't in that factory, Kenny boy? Because my luck held. I had to get some dough first. <laughs> and you know where I was? In that crowd, just standing there watching. You were in the crowd? Yeah, like watching my own funeral, only the coffin was empty. And I saw you and Evie, Kenny. That's how I knew where the tip come from. All right, you're smart, Sanders. Now be smarter. You got us where you want us. We can't make a move. But if you kill us, you'll kill the time you need to get away. I got ways. Like I come here. I followed you in that cab, then hid in your park car. Now, ain't that smart? Evie, you ain't said nothing. Big, you, you gonna kill us? Yeah, I'm gonna kill you. Sanders, you said your luck held. It can't hold forever. 
What you do when I was giving the police minute after minute to catch up with you, and they will sooner or later. You killed an officer, Sanders. You know what that means. Him or me, it had to be that way. Doesn't have to be this way. This way? What Kenny done was to save Evie's life and the baby's right or wrong. That's why he did it. What would you have done to save your own life? I killed a cop to save my life. That answer you? Yes, I guess it does. So it makes sense. That's a radio there by you, ain't it? Yeah. Send it on. We're all going to sit here and wait for the news. I'm going to see how I'm making out. We sat in the semi-darkness of the room. The only light came from the window that faced the street. Then the 11 o'clock news broadcast came on. The meeting tomorrow will tell us more. Tonight in Chicago, the city's manhunt goes on for Gig Sanders, convicted and sentenced killer. Acting on an anonymous tip, the police surrounded the old Phillips factory, but Sanders had not been there or had escaped before the cordon could be drawn tightly. Meanwhile, rewards totaling $2,800 have been offered. Shut up! And... $2,800. A real nice nest egg, huh, Kenny boy? There wasn't any reward. There is not... now. Sanders. What do you want, Storm? You said you were smart. So? What are you getting at? Maybe you forgot one thing. Yeah? You came here in a cab. So? The driver get a look at your face? <laughs> Don't give me that. The cops would be here long before now. Oh, no, Sanders. Only about a half hour has gone by since they tried for you in the factory. Figure it out. By the time the cab driver reports, by the time the police check... Shut up. You're wasting time. You got half a chance if you take it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I guess you talked me into it. Okay, I'll get going. Gig. No. Please. No. Gig, gig, gig. Not, the, not Evie. Not the baby. The baby? Evie? I could have been rotten in that factory by now. What boy. satisfaction will you get from this, Sanders? Satisfaction? Everything in the world. You were friends. Yeah, friends. Did you tell them how good friends we were, Kenny? Did you tell them how we played in the same dirty, stinking streets? How we ate the same slop in the orphan asylum? Did you tell them all that? Gig. Yeah, gig. Evie. Did you tell them how I was always the one to get Kenny out of jams when we were kids? They tell you that, Stone? No, but you're thinking of it. Remember it. I am. Oh, I am. All Kenny wanted was a decent life. Even if it cost mine, huh? He wanted to live for his wife and their baby. And I want to live. For what? You shouldn't have said that, Stone. I didn't have nothing against you till you said that. I was going to that death house when I busted loose. I figured a million ways to get away, and I took the chance. When it come, I killed a cop, a cop. And I know what happens to a cop, killer. I know. Nah, they're coming. I guess you were right about that cabbie. The minute the cops will all be set up and ready to get me. Yeah, but I killed a cop. That's how bad I wanted to live. But nobody wants me to. Nobody, you hear? Nobody. Listen, Sanford. You listen. A couple of weeks ago, there was a leopard loose. You know what the people said, you know, Stone? Yes, I know. They felt sorry for the leopard. That's right. Everybody wanted that leopard taken alive. Nobody wanted it killed but me. Me, I'm a human being, and they want to see me cut to pieces. Maybe because that's all the difference in the world between you and that animal. Is there? Is there? You're going to tell me the leopard would know better if he killed to get away. Well, I don't. No, because that's the way I learned to live. Because you didn't want any other way, Sanders. Because it was the easiest way. You grew up in a gutter. You never wanted to get out of it. Other men did. I ain't other men. I'm Gig Sanders. Gig Sanders. Gig, they're all around. You ain't got a chance. Yeah, and that's dandy for you. Just what you want. No, Gig. No, I swear it ain't. You swear. Now, you listen. I'm going out. Yeah, but not with my hands up. And I ain't gonna die alone. Sanders, don't. Do one last decent thing. Let these kids alone. Gig, listen. I'll go with you. Kenny, no. Gig, Gig, I'll, I'll go with you. It'll be you and me again, like it always was. I'll help you get away. We can do it together, Gig. We always used to, me and you, remember? You're crazy, Kenny. If they think you're going out with him, you won't have a chance. I'll cut you down with him. You Kenny, won't... stay here. I gotta do it, Evie. You gotta see that. I have to do it. Gig, you wanna kill me, all right. I'll be dead if that's what you want, but I'm going out with you. I got a gun. I got a gun. Kenny, put it down. Don't. So you got a gun. You got a gun. All right, shoot me. Why don't you shoot me? I could have. Any time we were sitting here. But you didn't. You was always soft, Kenny boy. You see, Stone, that's the difference between him and me. Then shoot me. Go ahead, kill me now. But even if you don't, I'm going out with you, Gig. Kenny, you're not talking sense. Sanders! Sanders! 
We know you're in there. Sanders, this is Captain Ireland. Listen to me. Sanders. I'm listening, copper. Sanders, there are innocent people in that building. We'll give them time to clear. If you've got any human decency left in you, wait before you do anything. But I warn you, Sanders, come out with your hands in the air. What are you going to do? You know what I'm going to do? Coppers! Coppers, I'm coming out! Right out the front door! Tell everybody else to stay in! Tell them! All right, Sanders. But with your hands up! Now listen, people. Stay in your rooms, lie down on the floor, and stay away from windows and doors. I'm coming, coppers! I'll kill you, kid. Sanders, go out with your hands in the air. Oh, sure, sure. Now, Evie... Kenny? Gig. Sanders. Do it, then, Gig. Do it and get it over with. Kenny, Kenny, boy, get where I can see your face. Think what you're doing, Sanders. Shut up, And the light by the window, Kenny. Now, let me look at you. You, you said you'd go out with me. Yeah. Kenny... Don't lie to me now. Don't lie now. I'll go with you, Kate. Swear it's the truth, Kenny. Swear it's the truth. I don't have to swear it, Kate. You're looking at me. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. I'm going out along. Now, what about Kenny, Evie? That can rot in this stinking world. That can rot. Not me. I'm going out. I'm going out and meet all the coppers in Chicago. Gig, stay where you are. He's gone. He's gone. Sanders, come out with your hands up. Hello, coppers! Well, there's there's $2,800 lying down there, Kenny. Better go down and pick it up. I don't want it. You had all the chance in the world. Why didn't you kill him? I couldn't. Gig Sanders was my brother. Now it's almost dawn again, and I've written another story. It's a story that began a long time ago when a man looked up and answered a question with another question. Am I my brother's keeper? There's an answer to that, and our society has made it. Yes, you are your brother's keeper, but the kept must be worthy of the keeping. Copy, boy. Night Beat, a new dramatic series, stars Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. Tonight's story was written by Russell Hughes. Night Beat is edited by Larry Marcus and directed by Warren Lewis. Music by Frank Worth. Others in tonight's cast were Ted DeCorsia, Georgia Ellis, Shepard Menken, Louis Haight, Herb Ellis, and Alan Slate. Frank Lovejoy will next be seen in Milton Sperling's production, Rock Bottom, released by Warner Brothers. Throughout the week, NBC brings you the very best adventure mystery dramas on the air. You'll hear action-packed, fast-moving plots to hold your interest right up to the smashing climax on NBC's thrilling mystery shows. During these stellar programs, you'll hear mystery and intrigue, adventure and high-tension drama. Match your powers of observation against the best in detective fiction in solving crimes and unraveling intrigue. There's fast-moving action to lift you from beside your radio into the romantic land of mystery and adventure. These exciting dramas are as interesting as tomorrow's race results today. And you'll hear them every night over most of these NBC stations. Remember, if it's mystery and adventure dramas you're tuned for, tune for the best on NBC. (laughs) 
Listen next week at this same time and every week as Randy Stone searches through the city for the strange stories waiting for him in the darkness. The stories that come out of the shadows to find their way into Night Beat. Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. Falling, lost in the listening distance, as dark locks in. <laughs> Nightfall. Good evening. The handling of volatile chemicals has always struck me as an occupation that I would prefer others to undertake. Tonight's play, featuring a less-than-fragile performance by Colin Fox, is called Hands Off. There. That'll hold them for a while. They can't get in. But I can't get out. <laughs> it's a cage! All my life I've kept animals in cages. Now I've put myself in one. Here, by my own hand. My hand. Oh, God, my hand. <laughs> One touch of nature makes the whole world kin. How can we know what we're touching? It was just an ordinary experiment. How could I know? How could I have known? Go ahead, Sylvia. Touch the cat. She isn't dangerous. Yet. Why are you so nervous? Touch her. I'm sorry, Dr. Stryker. I'm not concentrating. Lab assistants should not get engaged. I always wanted to get married in May, but Jim says it'll interfere with his bar exam. It's so fresh in the spring. Delightful. No doubt Jim will welcome the break. He works too hard, if you ask me. Well, nothing wrong with work. Speaking of which, is the observation sheet ready? All set. Control experiment 361. Fine. Now, if this solution has the desired effect on that cat's relationship with its kitten... It should also succeed in the operative environment. I'm still not sure I understand. It's quite simple. This solution should function as a negative bait. Negative? A bait which arouses the desire to kill. Oh. 
If we now observe that our test solution produces a high level of hostility between so intimate a pair as this mother cat and her own kitten, then think of the effect it will have on the primordial savagery of a shark. But why sharks? As a control factor, to distract them from human prey. A diver, for example, could launch a decoy saturated with this compound, and every shark for miles around would ignore him and attack the decoy. Now... Just a few drops in that kitten's ear, if you please. What a lovely fragrance. I'm thinking of calling it rose water. A trade name, perhaps. Uh, but be careful. It takes effect through the sense of smell. Keep your mask on. I think you'll be surprised by its potency. How's that? Should do it. Now, let's pass Junior over to his mum and see how they get along. Good primary response. She's highly disturbed. Excellent. My God, she's going to... Better than I'd hoped for. Doctor, she's mauling the kitten. Terminate, Sylvia. Huh? Ow! Oh! Oh, my God. God. Sylvia, what have you done? The solution is all over the floor. I'm sorry, Dr. Stryker. I was grabbing the For kitten. For God's I... sake, be more careful. This is a dangerous substance. Quick, let's clean it up. We cleaned it up, and I told Sylvia to go home for the rest of the day. Even then, I should have known it wouldn't be that easy. At the front gate, George, the guard, always had a smile for me when I signed out. But not today. I suppose I was too proud of myself to notice. But humans are more devious than cats. When I got home, my wife Doris was there, of course. Her continued support has always made the long hours worthwhile. But today... I'm home. Oh, what kept you? Oh, it was all I could do to keep from phoning. Doris, I've done it. I had to write it up immediately while it was still fresh. The project's a success. Oh, good for you, dear. Hey, dinner's in the oven. Hey, give me a kiss. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that was the best part of a very exciting day. Was it? <sighs> I wish I could say the same. What's the matter? What isn't the matter? That's more to the point, isn't oh, it? Oh, well, perhaps we should go out tonight. No. No, I... I think perhaps we should let sleeping dogs lie. Sleeping dogs lie? You're not making yourself very clear. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not making myself clear. Dr. Stryker likes everything clear. How's this for clear? I am tired of sitting around like a lonely slob watching Mary Tyler Moore while you play God in your lap. Doris, this isn't like you. Oh, don't tell me what's like me. I can smell that cheap perfume from here. What's she like, Andrew? She must be a real prize. Cheap perfume? Oh. oh, it's my hand. You're lying. Calm down, Doris. Look, we had an accident at the lab Can't today. Can't you ever and... stop talking about your stinking lab? Well, just hold on a minute. I'm going to wash my hand. We're talking about being clear. And you go off to wash your hands. You don't understand. Oh, I understand, all right. Look, if this is all our marriage means to you, that's fine with me. Doris, our marriage means a great deal to me. Uh... Now, believe me, you're merely suffering a biochemical aberration. Oh, I am not. Now, let me explain. This is just... No! Let me explain. You know what this is? This is sick and tired of lying in bed at night while you describe how many rats died. Doris, please control yourself. You'll regret this later on. That's where you're wrong, Andrew. I'm tired of always regretting everything. <laughs> Goodbye. Where are you going? Oh, wait. Doris. <laughs> Hands off me. Oh, okay, okay. I'll let you go. I'm not betting on it. Get 
out of my way. I'm not stopping you. Not that I could have stopped her. I've never seen anyone like that, let alone Doris. By the time she left, she was white as a sheet, pumping enough adrenaline for a small army. If I'd stood behind the car, she'd have gladly run me down. Well, after all, that's what the drug was supposed to do. But to human beings... I washed my hand with carbolic soap several times, but the rose water odor wouldn't go away. I burned myself with lye, scrubbed the hand raw, but nothing seemed to work. The chemical crawled into my pores, and the more I worked at it, the more I sweated, and the more I sweated, the more it stank. A sick, sweet smell that apparently intensified. Worry does that to you sometimes. It distorts your perceptions as much as it sharpens them. A temporary solution finally occurred to me. Simple. Just put on a rubber glove to cover the contact area until the effects wear off. I put on Doris's kitchen gloves and congratulated myself. Then it hit me. If chemical residue on organic tissue could have this effect, what about the traces back in the lab? The night cleaner, the watchman, anybody who happened through that room could be in for it. I had to get back there. I was halfway out the door when... I grabbed the receiver. Doris? Dr. Stryker, it's Sylvia. I'm sorry to bother you, but I had to call someone. Sylvia, what is it? Oh, I don't know. First, the cab driver was rude, and then the doorman and the people on the street. When I met Jim, it was horrible. He was so cruel. Uh, I had to get away. And he followed me. Oh, he was like a madman, calling me names and pounding the door. I wouldn't let him in, and he said... He, he said... What? That he was coming back with a gun. Listen to me, Sylvia. You did the right thing calling me. Now, I want you to smell your hands. My hands? Yes. Is there anything unusual about them? They smell a bit perfumey, like... Like this afternoon. The rose water. Exactly. We were probably contaminated when we cleaned up the lab spill. Oh. Now, listen carefully. A lot could depend on it. There's nothing to worry about if you do exactly as I say. I'm listening. Have you any rubber gloves? Um, no. No lab gloves. But I've got the ones I use for the dishes. Good. Put them on. Tie them tightly around your wrists. They'll contain the effects until we can get to the lab. We'll run some test solvents. I'll pick you up immediately. But don't let anyone in until I get there. Okay? Okay. But hurry, please. Sylvia! Sylvia! Jim, you don't understand. Put it down, please! Sylvia! Uh-huh. What's going on in there? Don't hit me. I can't stand this. No. No more. Oh, my God. Open up. Sylvia! Are you all right? What happened? My God. Jim. He he wouldn't go away. I had to let him in. He's dead, you know. He wouldn't even talk to me. He just kept attacking me. What shall I do? Nothing. Dr. Stryker, you told me these gloves would contain the effects. Give me the gun, Sylvia. No. No, I don't think I will. Why not? Because I don't feel like it. Give me the gun. Stay where you are. You really wrecked my life, haven't you? It's only the rose water making you feel this way. Try to be reasonable, Sylvia. Try to... Reasonable? You expect me to be reasonable after this? Sylvia, if we're going to get out of this... We've got to cooperate. 
Give me the gun. Oh, nice try. The neighbors have probably reported the shots already. And when the police find you, reeking of shark bait with two bodies in your room... Look, don't be stupid. Now come back to the lab with me, and we'll get this under control. If you kill me, you're killing your only hope. Now give me that gun. If I give it to you, how do I know you won't use it? On me. Then just throw it out the window. We've worked together for more than three years, Sylvia, and I've always valued your common sense. Be reasonable. I'll open the window. Now. Well? All right. There. And that's... that. Oh, let's get out of here. No, Sylvia. I've changed my mind... Things are going to be risky enough tonight without you. No! With no! you! was a chance, just a chance, that no one had seen me. Certainly there was no one in the corridor or in the lobby. But I could still see her face all the way to the street. I had to get to the lab before anybody blundered into the contaminated area. The responsibility was mine alone. When I got to the compound gate, George was on duty. Good old George. George? George? Who's that? What's going on there? It's me, George. Stryker. I've got to get in. Oh, Dr. Stryker. What are you doing here at this hour? Something very important's come up. It's got to be taken care of right away. I'm sorry, sir. I'm afraid you'll have to wait. You know that between 2400 and 0600 hours, absolutely no one's allowed in the compound. For Christ's sake, George, I wouldn't be here unless it was vital. I've got to get in. This isn't a playground. You should know better than anyone why we have these safeguards. There's highly toxic materials in there. Damn it, George, let me in. Look, I'll give it to you straight. There was an accident in the lab this afternoon, and unless I can get in and do something about it, the whole place is in trouble. You expect me to buy that? I always thought you were an arrogant son of a bitch. But you must really think I'm stupid. Please, George, believe me, it's my last hope. Get out of here before I call the police. the rose water got to George, it would get to anyone. I stumbled around for more than an hour, avoiding anything that moved. I kept circling the fence, looking for a way in, but the place was locked tight. I had to have help. Some way away, under a streetlight, I saw a payphone. If I called Bob Ladowski from Chemical Warfare, he'd know what to do if anyone did. Then the dogs picked up my scent. They cut me off and chased me here. Here. To a tool shed. Fifty yards from my lab. What? What's that? Sounds like... Rats! Coming through the floor! Jesus. Must be a dozen of them. Gnawing through. I need a weapon. Something. Where? Where did I? Yes. Yes. An axe. God. Who's that? 
Run for it, the dogs will get their turn. Damn stuff won't wash off. Can't even cover it up. Only thing left is. God, no. No. There has to be something. No, it, it's got to be. I, I. I can't cut it off. Oh, my God! A lab. There's a light in my lab. Someone's gotten in. To the rose water. Listen to them. I haven't got much time. And the police. The neighbors. I, 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 can't, I can't take them all on at once. How can I... Distract them... How can I ever escape myself? Well, it's a good play. Get up and throw it out the window. Look, Look at it. Smell it. Hot. Hot. Right there, ma'am. Well, 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 what's the matter? What's happened? It looks like somebody, well, suffocated, I guess. Suffocated? In that shed? How? I'd rather not talk about it. Officer, what is going on? Some poor guy chopped off his hand. His own hand? Yeah, I'm afraid oh, but so. You, you said suffocated. What did he do? Tried to eat his own hand? Look, lady, back off, will you? You're getting on my nerves. Get that. There. The research lab. What's the light doing on over there? You have just heard Hands Off by John Graham. Featured tonight were Colin Fox as Stryker, with Jennifer Brown as Sylvia and Marion Waldman as Doris. Also in the cast were Murray Westgate as George, Ruth Springford as the neighbor, and Ken James as the policeman. Our recording engineer is John Jessup, with sound effects by Bill Robinson. The senior script editor is John Douglas, and our production assistant is Nina Callahan. Nightfall is produced and directed for CBC Radio by Bill Howell. And now, here is a final word from your host. 
Hello again. Before listening to next week's Nightfall, listeners are advised to eat well and make sure they know the difference between well-fed and fed up. Golden Age, what do you think of him? Oh, oh, him, a very fine young man, Massa. Got lovely appetite developed. <laughs> him live much longer time than last other young man. <laughs> How much do you think he be tonight? We will try him with a late luncheon first, Golden Ash, and then pronounce on his <laughs> performance. <laughs> young men do not always come up to their <laughs> profession. What time? Her mother died himself. <laughs> I don't know. Perhaps not till nine o'clock. Perhaps not then. Many spoon and eggs and some. The appetite of Mr. Lucraft, based on the Victorian short story by James Rice and Sir Walter Bessant, starring Douglas Campbell, Graham Haley, and Abbott Anderson. Radio for heavy listeners. That's next week on Nightfall. Until then, careful of the edge. <laughs> Funds for the distribution of this NPR Playhouse presentation were provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. This is NPR. National Public Radio. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves old-time radio or the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. You can find other podcasts that I host. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Retro Radio